from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning and wel welcome to the Library of Congress for the first time for sev several of you. And welcome back to those of you who were able to join us last night. Uh, I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress. Uh, an organization was created by Dr. Daniel Borston back in 1977 to reach out on behalf of the Library of Congress to promote books and reading and to promote st the study and encourage the study of books and reading. To that menu, since 1977, we've added literacy, which was not discussed much in 1977, another major topic that, where there's difference, but a sim similarity was the threat in 1977 of technology. Everyone was worried, but the technology we were worried about was television. And Dr. Borston created the center in part, I learned, after accepting his offer to become the founding director, uh, he had an idea, and that was to start using commercial television to promote books and reading. And we were able to do that through for 10 years through a project with CBS television called Read More About It. And we put those reading messages at the ends of major CBS programs the star of the program said, if you enjoyed the program, the Library of Congress suggests these books. And we had books that came across the screen, but the message was, go to your local library or bookstore, not the Library of Congress. Go to your local library or bookstore, and they will be happy to help you read more about it. And from that grew one of our reading promotion networks with not only television and technology involved, but booksellers and librarians. And gradually, um, we are, some Center for the Book will have its 40th anniversary next year in 2017. But the project that brings us together is a special project that came to the Center for the Book uh, through David Rubenstein, the philanthropist who's doing so many wonderful things for our country, but in Washington, D.C., in terms of uh, helping support government institutions that have a relationship to American history, largely, and that appeal to Mr. Rubenstein in terms of his interests. And we did not know when Mr. Rubenstein uh, first started giving help to the National Book Festival, which is another major center for the book endeavor, now in its 16th year. Uh, that Mr. Rubenstein had this interest in literacy. And that came a little later, and he is the one who initiated this project and is funding it. And I'm so pleased to have you here and to ex be able to explain a little bit about the framework that's brought us here. We have a board, the Literacy Advisory Board, to help us during the five-year pilot grant from Mr. Rubenstein and he has encouraged us to think about the future uh, in the hopes uh, that this will be extended and maybe developed in a permanent way that might be endowed, but that the first five years would be uh, almost a period of experimentation in trying to raise awareness of the problem of literacy and by doing award work, but also by symposia and by other uh, means that are kind of generic to the Center for the Book. We also have affiliates in every state, so every one of your states has a partner with us to promote books, reading, literacy, and libraries in the state. So this is the second symposium uh, held by the uh, literacy advisory, our literacy program, and we're so proud to have Nemours as a partner in this. The first symposium was literacy and poetry. And we learned about a number of organizations in poetry that have common interests with us and have been able to bring several of them into our network of reading and literacy promotion partners. 
and uh, Laura Bailet from Nemours is on our board, and she was someone who, when we had our first board meeting, was talking about what we're talking about today, how important literacy is to health. And in many ways, and this was news to other members of the board, and we immediately put this on the agenda for a future symposium, and we're here today, and I thank you for your participation, and I will, I'm afraid, tell you a little bit more about the overall endeavor as we move ahead, but now I am going to move ahead uh, and follow um, our program. Uh, we, I would like to uh, introduce, however, a special guest, uh, Dr. Lewis Sullivan, who has joined us today. He was unable to join us yesterday. Uh, I met Dr. Sullivan for the first time just a few weeks ago when we had him as a speaker about his new book at the Library of Congress, his memoir. And he pointed out, and I sat up straight when he said so, that the Georgia Center for the Book uh, has, was featuring his book uh, on its website as part of their program of putting up on the website books every Georgian should read. And this is a rotating list, of course, but nonetheless, uh, it still is headlined uh, by doctors, Dr. Sullivan's memoir. Uh, he was the Secretary of Health and Human Services during the administration of George H.W. Bush and is the chairman of the board of the National Health Museum in Atlanta. And what he talked about a lot was being the first president of the Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, he also is the uh, head of the D Washington, D.C.-based Sullivan Alliance to Transform America's Health Professionals. And he's going to be with us all day. I'd like him just to stand and be acknowledged, please. Uh, last night, we had a wonderful um, keynote address uh, by Dr. David Bailey. And I know that a number of you were not he he able to join us, but uh, we are l very fortunate that he is today going to be the introducer of the keynote today. But I just wanted to thank him publicly for getting us off to such a good start, because his talk, no surprise, uh, really was a wonderful keynote that focused on how and why reading proficiency and literacy are such strong indicators of actually of overall health through adulthood. And that is what we're trying to bring together as we do in these symposia, our fields, and learn about other fields from the perspective of literacy to see how we not only can form new alliances, but perhaps uh, look ahead together for new ways of solving some of the problems that we were faced with. And, uh, and uh, last night, Dr. Bailey uh, nicely lined up the alignments of various worlds that we occupy in literacy and in education and in health and pointed to this as an opportunity for us to uh, think about coming together uh, in ways that would affect policy and to try to keep the broadest possible perspective on this uh, on behalf of our society rather than what we all tend to do. And, we're all guilty of this, is spending so much time on our specialties uh, and trying to prove ourselves and prove our organizations that uh, we often forget the broader picture. So uh, this is a, an attempt to uh, talk about and learn about and do something about the broader picture. Uh, Dr. Bailey is the president of uh, Nemours Foundation, which he became president in 2006. Um, he is a leading light in the, we, uh, the whole world of health with many honors. And for those from, I know a few of my friends are here today who don't know about Nemours is an integrated children's health system with two hospitals in the Delaware Valley in Florida. And it serves children from across the United States and internationally. Uh, Nemours also operates 45 primary specialty and urgent care clinics in four states and is responsible for the website Kids Health, which we have all learned about through Laura uh, in our work on the Literacy Advisory Board. And I am very pleased to uh, present Dr. David Bailey, who is the distinguished introducer of a, our distinguished keynoter for the morning.
David Bailey. Well, good morning. I'm Dave Bailey, and I would just like to add my welcome to uh, Dr. Coles to this summit on literacy, health, and new perspectives. You know, the um, uh, Library of Congress staff, Dr. Cole, have been extraordinarily uh, kind and accommodating. They arranged the great weather. The only thing they forgot was to get the cherry blossoms blooming. <laughs> the trains. The tra <laughs> yeah, the trains were another thing. <laughs> you know, we're delighted that you've all uh, joined us for this, uh, I think, very important symposium on the connections between literacy and health. Uh, and this morning, I really have the distinct honor and uh, personal pleasure uh, to introduce our first speaker, keynote speaker, Dr. Sandra Hassink. Dr. Hassink is a pediatrician's pediatrician. She is a consummate uh, physician, and she's what we know as a triple threat, a superb clinician, a uh, esteemed researcher, and an admired educator. Uh, and it's been my great fortune uh, to be able to be associated with Sandy over uh, several years uh, at the Nemours Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children. Dr. Hassink is the immediate past president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, an organization composed of 64,000 pediatricians and an organization that has uh, a, an aggressive child health policy agenda, both nationally and internationally. Sandy has testified before Congress on childhood obesity, food security, and hunger, uh, focusing on supporting the uh, foundations of child health. She has dedicated her entire professional career to caring and advocating for children with obesity and is the director of the American Academy of Pediatrics Institute for Healthy Childhood Weight. Under her direction, the institute is focused on translating research into practice for pediatric health care providers, families, and children. Dr. Hassing founded the Weight Management Clinic at the Nemours Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children in 1988. She has lectured widely uh, on this topic and has published many books, among them A Parent's Guide to Childhood Obesity, Pediatric Obesity, Prevention, Intervention, and Treatment Strategies for Primary Care, and The Clinical Guide to Pediatric Weight Management. And if all of this weren't enough, Dr. Hassing has served on the Institute of Medicine's Committee on Accelerating Progress on Obesity Prevention and was an author on the expert recommendations for obesity. And probably the reason she's been able to get through all of this and maintain such a calm exterior is that she holds a master's of science in pastoral care and counseling. Please help me welcome Dr. Hassink. David, thank you. I wasn't sure exactly who you were speaking about for a moment, but uh, thank you very much. So as, as uh, Dr. Bailey said, I've spent these last several years as, as uh, president-elect, president, now past president of the Academy, uh, speaking widely around the country and, and internationally, and um, speaking about the foundations of child health. And I love this quote by Louis Pasteur that I think typifies how we as pediatricians and how we really feel, all of us, about children. When I approach a child, he inspires in me two sentiments, tenderness for what he is and respect for what he may become. And I think that holds uh, the hopes of all of us, that in the moment we can respond to the needs of the child in that very moment, that we all are encountering the child and their family, but we hold the hopes for the future of that child. And we know without a doubt that what we do in this moment is significant for that moment, but significant for the child's future. And I hope to illustrate that as, as we move through this talk. So I always start my talks by asking, how are the children? 
How are the children doing? And you can um, look at this for, through many lenses. And I've picked out a few things to look at just nationally how we're doing. And you know this varies widely state to state, but our diet quality, only 50% of children are now meeting federal standards, diet quality standards. 18% of our children have obesity, 30% nationally have overweight and obesity, and 9% of our children have activity limitations from some other chronic condition. When we look at emotional and behavioral health, we see that parents are reporting significant serious emotional and behavioral problems in 5% of their children. And our adolescents, 8% um, of them, 12 to 17, have had a major depressive episode in the last year. I think we need to just pause a moment on that one. 10% of our children have asthma, and 52% um, of our children, ages three to four, are not enrolled in quality um, or any preschool. And I think you'll see today how literacy interweaves itself among all these childhood problems. And almost half of our children zero to six, live 200% or below of the poverty level, with 11% of our children living under 50% of the poverty level. So when we think about the foundations of child health, I've been using a, a framework from the Harvard Center for the Developing Child because I want to be able to have a conversation about every child in this country and what every child in this country needs. Because I think, as Dr. Bailey uh, so rightly pointed out, that we often live in our silos and, and live and look at the world through our own particular lenses. And I think we need to broaden this conversation and now think about what every child needs. Every child needs sound and appropriate nutrition. That means that if we combine food insecurity, hunger, obesity, and overweight, 50% of our children are suffering from a nutritional hardship. Every child needs stable, responsive, nurturing relationships at home, early child care and education, at school, and in their community. And every child needs safe, supported, physical, chemical, and built environments. And you'll see how literacy weaves itself through these foundational elements of child health. And so at this conversation in this country right now should be about what every child needs and how we all together can build those foundations. So the Academy of Pediatrics has its strategic plan. And about 10 years ago, we renamed our strategic plan the Agenda for Children. And you'll see in the circle some of our guiding principles, medical, home, health equity, our own profession of pediatrics. You'll see pillars, access, quality, and finance, which really mean the ability of children to access health and health care. But those uh, elements in the middle really are a pivot for us. So 10 years ago, you might have seen oral health, immunizations, um, tobacco, very important child health topics on this list. But what you see now are epigenetics, early brain and child development, poverty and child health, and we just released our poverty statement this month. Um, we are now looking carefully at the foundational elements that build health for children. And I think it's a very important pivot for us to have taken. And it's out of our anxiety that children are not receiving these foundational elements that build good health. So our agenda now speaks to the socio-ecologic framework of children because you build health everywhere for children. You build it in the home with your families. You build it in the community. You build it uh, with infrastructure. You build it with literacy. You build it all together um, for children. And so you can see this socio-ecological model, just some elements that are important to child uh, health. And they, they really run the gamut from school nutrition, which I've been speaking about extensively this year, to um, injury prevention, uh, the, uh, taking care of the mother-infant dyad, taking care of the intrauterine environment. You can see them there and how it calls us to work in a cross-sectoral um, fashion. So why are we speaking today about health and literacy? Well, we know as physicians, low health literacy, low literacy is associated with low health literacy. And so more than 90 million U.S. adults, at least in 2003, lacked the literacy needed to effectively negotiate the health care system. So those of you who have high literacy know how difficult it is to negotiate the health care system. Um, it can be uh, sort of a labyrinthine um, process of paperwork and phone calls and appointments. And if you have basic or only basic literacy, you are significantly at risk for not being able to uh, get the health care you need. And you can see that if you look at below basic and basic literacy, um, basic literacy is um, searching a short, simple text to find out what you as a patient might be allowed to drink before a medical test, signing a form, um, adding the amounts on a bank deposit slip, finding a pamphlet for 
for jurors, using a tele TV guide to find out what's on the program, um, comparing ticket prices. So if you don't have the, these uh, skills above uh, basic skills, you, you simply can't negotiate the healthcare system with any efficacy. And then we write a lot of things in, in the healthcare profession for patients. We write a lot of patient education. But um, you can see here the percentage of the population of each state that has below a fifth grade level of literacy. The darkest uh, red is 30% or greater. The orange is 20% to 30, 15 to 20 in the green, and 10 to 15 in the blue. And you know that many patients can't literally read the um, information that we're putting out. So I was in one of our clinics in North Wilmington and we were handing out uh, an obesity pa uh, paper that said 5210, fruits and vegetables, exercise, uh, juice, and TV had inf very simple information. And what was happening is that um, we were finding those pamphlets in the trash can in the waiting room. People simply couldn't process that. And we had tried to be very careful about the language we used. So we decided then um, we had to model the behavior we wanted, but this is a huge handicap for our adults. And our adults are the parents of our young children. So low literacy and related low health literacy in parents of young children increases <coughs> developmental risk because they can't access what they need to, to support their children. And med something very um, mundane in the healthcare system, but it, it incredibly important. They can't um, negotiate medication dosing or adhering to um, routines or goals or, or, or pre-op preparation or goal setting around a chronic illness. They can't adhere to that because they don't have the health literacy skills. And then the perpetuation of this really perpetuates the cycles of poverty, poor health, and dependency across the life course. So it's really important for us. Um, adults with limited health literacy, and you'll hear this probably over and over today, have diminished disease knowledge they, de they don't use preventive services at the same rates. They have increased hospitalizations, poor health status, poor control of chronic illness, and you know we have an epidemic of chronic illness in this country. Globally, we would call this non-communicable diseases, lifestyle-related diseases, and the ability to control chronic illness is crucial to your ability to prevent early death and severe morbidity and, of course, and mortality. So um, reading a, a routine for a person with type 2 diabetes and managing insulin doses is actually quite a complex set of interactions that have to occur and can occur in adults with limited health literacy. So in 2014, we put out a statement at the Academy on uh, literacy promotion and just highlighting some of the things that you all know, that one, oh, uh, greater than one in three U.S. children start kindergarten without the language skills needed to learn to read. Reading proficiency by third grade is the most important predictor of high school and career success. And two-thirds of children each year, 80% of whom live in poverty, fail to develop reading proficiency by the end of third grade. So I had a father in my office. and. Uh, he was, uh, actually was a grandfather raising uh, his grandson, and his grandson uh, wasn't learning to read in school, and he had begged the school to hold him back so he could learn to read, but the school had their own promotion criteria and were set on promoting the young man. So I had the situation of a grandfather pleading with the school and pleading essentially with me for some help in helping his grandson learn to read, because he knew if he got farther into school without learning to read, that was a sentence for him, and it was a sentence about not being able to complete high school, not being able to get a good job, not being able to execute on the dreams the grandfather had for him. So we talked about early child care and education. Um, this is the early learning unmet need in our country, and you see um, the maps, the light pink here is uh, 0 to 25 percent. The dark is 76 to 100 percent, and it's a map that looks a little different than some maps. So when we look at these maps of the United States, the health disparities and the disparities in accessing solutions to health problems uh, often look the same. This looks a little different, but we have a lot of um, four-year-olds that don't have uh, preschool education. And this is sort of an interesting map um, about the change in preschool enrollment. So some preschool enrollments have gone down in the orange, some have gone up in the dark blue. We don't have a uniform approach to this. So merely by being born in your county, in your town, in your state, really sets your health trajectory for the rest of your life because these disparities are reproduced on every health measure that we can find. So no one state is doing perfectly on everything, but I think that that leads to are saying that the zip code, it may be your most, most important health indicator as a young child. So where does literacy start? Well, we look at young children, 
This is a slide courtesy of Pam High uh, uh, from her presentation to us at our national meeting that um, language environment of children at home is highly variable and really tracks with um, socioeconomic status often. So the vocabulary at age three and the parent words per hour, you can see how that tracks. So the, the ability to, um, to be in a high word environment or not will set your word gap uh, by kindergarten entry. So there have been studies that show the kind of talk that ha happens in families. So some families talked a lot to their children. Some pa families talk very little. Business talk gets things done. Brush your teeth, sit at the table, finish your vegetables. Don't say I said that. But um, non-business talk is sort of that chit-chat, the mother or father leaning over the child and just having a conversation, uh, talking about what's in their environment, talking about a book, for instance. Business talk was constant across families, but it was this non-business talk, this, this sort of relational talk that really uh, made the difference. And you'll see here. So the talkative families had more praise than prohibitions. The, the more silent families, more prohibitions than praise, because if you're doing a lot of task-oriented talk, that's what happens. At three years, the IQ correlated with non-business talk, and at third grade, the receptive language. So even very, very early on, and this is what makes early reading and early relational attention to those early relationships so important for our young children, because long before they can read, you're laying the groundwork for literacy and reading. So talkativeness predicted IQ and vocabulary. I want to talk a little bit about literacy and poverty, because as I told you, half of our almost half of our children live 200% or below the poverty level. Children from low-income families have fewer words in early childhood, no fewer words by three years, have fewer literacy resources which, within their home, and you'll hear a lot more about that, less likely to be read to regularly, and more likely to experience early childhood adversity and toxic stress, and we'll talk about that. And these are our poverty rates in this country. So this is the dark red are the 20 to 30 percent of poverty, and you can see, courtesy of the 2008 recession, what has happened to child poverty in this country, and so children are sort of the first affected and the last to be lifted out of poverty. So I want to talk a little bit now about some of the science that's emerging about what happens in early childhood and the impact for later health trajectories. And uh, many of you are familiar with Vince Folletti's study on adverse childhood experiences. And uh, Dr. Folletti was a physician at Kaiser Permanente and studied over 17,000 adults, and many of whom uh, had chronic illnesses, including obesity, and he merely asked them, what happened to you as a child? So he asked them about abuse, emotional, physical, and sexual, household dysfunction, mother treated violently, household mental illness, divorce, incarcerated household member, and later about emotional and physical neglect. And in this study, these were the percentages of adults who reported having experienced one of these adverse events in their childhood. And I would say if you looked at this, you would say this is pretty high. Um, physical abuse, 29%. Mother treated violently, 27%. This is pretty high and is disturbing in and of itself. But what happened when he looked at their current health status, he, he realized that the current health status of these adults had a graded relationship to the adverse experiences they experienced in childhood. So if you experience more of these adverse events, you're more likely to have chronic heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, skeletal fractures, and liver disease. If you experienced more adverse childhood events, you would have more risk factors for chronic disease, smoking, alcoholism, promiscuity, obesity, substance abuse. These ACEs, these adverse childhood experiences, were associated with general health and social functioning, poorer general health and social functioning, poorer mental health, depression, sleep disturbance, anxiety, poor anger control, and memory disturbances. So this takes us right back to where we started, which was what's happening to the child as a child immediately is so important and needs to be attended to, but what happens to that child embeds itself in our biology and has lifelong health effects. So this was a study of a maternal report of ACEs at a five-year follow-up study, and these were fragile families at risk. It was a fragile family and child well-being study, and these were mothers of children age five reporting maltreatment in their families physical, sexual, psychological abuse and neglect, and I think that you can look at these numbers and say that's really disturbing um, how many of these children had experienced these ACEs, household dysfunction. And then the, 
Children that had no ACEs were 45%, but over half the children in this study had one or more adverse childhood experiences, 27% one, two adverse childhood experiences, 16%, 3%, 8%, 4%, 3%, and five ACEs, 1%. And so they connected these adverse childhood experiences to their, their experiences with literacy. So children who had not yet or not begun to understand and interpret a story or other text that was read to them, if you had one ex adverse experience, you had a slightly higher odds ratio of not being able to understand and interpret a story. If you had three or more, you had an odds ratio of 2.2. Not yet are beginning to easily and quickly name all upper and lowercase letters. You can see the, the trajectory, the trend for more ACEs, less ability to do that. Not yet or beginning to read simple books. You can see the trend. Not yet or beginning to demonstrate understanding of some of the conventions of print. So we know that, that literacy is interwoven here with the experiences of childhood that can either promote literacy, prevent literacy, interfere with literacy. And we know that this is also affecting children's brains. So the first years of life hold the most critical periods for brain development. This is a classic slide that shows the synapses you have at birth, and then you develop a lot of them at six, and then they're pruned by 14. And the pruning is really the refinement of the circuitry in the brain. So, and that refinement is experience-based. It doesn't happen the same for every person. Based on your experiences, your brain is altering your synaptic connections, and literally it's an anomaly. So, the regions of the brain that are most affected by these toxic stress and adverse childhood experiences are the hippocampus, learning, memory, discrimination of danger and safety, the prefrontal cortex, impulse control, the amygdala, increase in impulsive behavior, and that mediates fear and anxiety. So these toxic experiences are shaping the children's brain development, shaping their exposure to protective factors like literacy, and the context from which a child comes is so important. So part of what we're asking pediatricians now, and all of us, is to not just um, deal with that immediacy of what, uh, what the situation is when the child walks into your clinic, but ask, what's happening to that child? What's the context of the child? What's the state of the family? What's the state of their experiences? And we're trying to build resilience. And so the flip side of this is how do we build resilience in our children? And you'll hear later on in this conference how literacy is a uh, promotion in children is a powerful um, skill, tool, and pathway to build resilience in children. It's powerful. It's something every parent can do. And it, it involves building relational support for the children. It actually, I think, and maybe Bob does, we don't know this, Bob, but it, it forces, I think it reduces stress in the adults to have these quiet moments with children. So I used to pr literally prescribe time to my parents. So I was in clinic. We were trying to do a hard thing. We were trying to really shift lifestyles to promote a healthy weight. And any of you who've tried to do that, that is very hard. So I literally would prescribe 15 to 20 minutes a day for the parent. And they were not, al they were not allowed to do tasks. Like it couldn't be 15 minutes on the homework or 15 minutes on, you know, uh, what you're going to wear tomorrow. It had to be this engagement time. You could read. You could paint each other's fingernails. You could do hair. And the children were delighted, and the parents were often astounded. First, that I would ask that they spend this time, and they, they started to ask, well, how can I get that 15 minutes? And we figured that out. And then when they would come back, they were astounded. Because what happened with that time was that they remembered the joy of being a parent. They remembered how fun it was to engage their child. The children, of course, were delighted because there was never a child I ever met that didn't want to spend more time with their parent. And that, so I think that um, this building resilience is not rocket science, but it often feels like rocket science to families when they're trying to carve out this time, time to read, time to be with their children from very busy, highly stressful life, and you add on those ACEs that not only are occurring now, but the parents experienced, you can see that this is, that we need to be absolutely supportive of our families here. Um, increased sensitivity to the child's needs. And it's hard, and, and th that relational time, that time with the child increases that sensitivity. And then when we spend the time to address the problem in its immediacy that the parents are having so we can become solution oriented for the parents. So this is a handout that I would often give parents. And again, not rocket science, but often hard to imagine doing when you're in a highly stressful situation. Share your feelings, play, 
set consistent expectations, protect the child from adult concerns, encourage small goals, try something new, keep healthy, try something relaxing, things we would all, all sort of endorse as sort of basic foundational elements are often hard for parents to do unless they're supported. So our literacy promotion recommendation for pediatricians were to promote literacy at all health supervision visits, really inform parents, advise parents that reading aloud can enrich the relationships, counseling about what are developmentally appropriate literacy activities, and provide books, and you'll hear more about that as well. We also said make your office literacy friendly, use posters and inform uh, parents about the importance of literacy, partner with advocates like we're doing today to promote literacy, um, incorporate literacy in our training programs, support, uh, support funding for children's books and research. So we, we call out our profession to really do a 360 degree support of literacy. And we have some tools. So we have Bright Futures that, that has literacy and uh, woven into it, um, and also the ability now in the new edition to detect these adverse childhood experiences and build resiliency. Promote Reach Out and Read, which you'll hear about, and many, many pediatricians are doing this in their offices, and address these toxic experiences that prevent the building of resiliency, the building of literacy in our families. And this is just an interesting um, map of the book deserts in the United States. And so you'll see that the orange is um, percent of homes with more than 100 books. And 100 books is a lot for some of us. I don't think 100 books is a lot in my house, but it is a lot. And you'll see that um, they're, they're very, the map reproduces itself, on, overlays many of our maps of chronic illness and health disparities in this country. So we have um, uh, on our website literacy building tools, books building connections toolkit. This is for, PD, for professionals and families, and just to highlight um, that. And then we talk about and help pediatricians understand and parents why share books, what a child can do with a book, how parents can enjoy the book, and when to share, and how to m m weave literacy into your house. Um, and so the supporting evidence for professionals because our docs like to know why they're doing it and then what to ask about and what to do. And then promoting the five R's, reading, rhyming, routines, rewards, and relationships. And you can see how integral literacy and literacy promotion is into building these really foundational elements of uh, family relationships. So all families need to understand and hear the important message that literacy is important. So, um, and we said that in our policy, but I was uh, taking the red eye to Chicago and I jumped into a cab and the driver and I were chatting and he learned I was a pediatrician and many of you who are pediatricians know this happens. People find out you're a pediatrician and they really wanna tell you about their children. And so he began telling me about a six month old daughter and he's working two jobs and he's not home with her very often, and he wanted to give her the best possible life, um, but he said, I, I, I am working to give her a better life, but I don't have a lot of time, and he was really kind of lamenting that, and he asked me what he should do, and I said, well, we'll read to her, and he looked puzzled, and he said, but she's only six months old. Like, what are you, crazy? Read to her? And I told him how reading builds brain, brains, vocabularies, changes behavior, sets up children for success, and we wound up discussing early child development, literacy and learning in the cab ride from O'Hare to our uh, headquarters at Elk Grove Village. And he was amazed, and he was grateful. And he was grateful that he could do something for her, even in the little time he had. And we arrived at the hotel, he couldn't stop thanking me and shaking my hand. He said, I will read to her. And he said, there's something I can do to help her and help her have a better future and I will do it. So I think we can't underestimate the importance of this for our children, the importance of this for our parents, the importance of this for our families, and the importance of this for building the foundations of child health in our country. So thank you very much and I'm pleased to be here. Thank you very much for that wonderful beginning, follow-up to what we started last night. Uh, I'm pleased that we can approach this subject from so many points of view 
and there are many points of view to come. I want to say just a word about today's schedule and logistics. Uh, we, uh, last night, those of you who were not able to join us, I'm sorry, did not have a chance to see the Library of Congress's historic building, the uh, Jefferson Building, which opened in 1897. Instead, we're in our newest building, which opened in 1980, the Madison Building. We're proud that all three of our buildings across the street, the second building we're not visiting at all, is called the Adams Building. But of we were created in 1800 as the first uh, federal cultural institution, and our three buildings on this campus are named for pre book loving presidents. Uh, and Jefferson had a special role in founding the Library of Congress by uh, selling um, at his at cost, really, his library, his comprehensive library, to the fledgling Library of Congress in the Capitol after the British had burned it in 1814, and from the comprehensiveness of his collection came the comprehensiveness of the approach of the Library of Congress, which meant we collect in all subjects, and we try to share resources. Uh, we are, in effect, the National Library, even though because we're legislative branch and have Congress as our most important client, uh, we don't have the official name National Library. But uh, that gives us the feeling that we can reach out through um, educational outreach and other activities uh, that cover many different subjects and are a natural place to bring together uh, groups that normally would not come together. And it's in that spirit in which the Center for the Book was formed and also in which we are meeting today. Now down to the nitty gritty. The restrooms are just outside. Uh, the, there is a lunch for the speakers and their guests next door, uh, but members of the public who will be coming and going all day, our cafeteria is just a step away. So it's, um, it's close by. All of our uh, talks are in this room, is that that's right? Uh, we are featuring panel discussions that have been organized with experts on the various aspects and approaches to our topic. Uh, we also will have a couple of uh, specialized sessions. Uh, one uh, with, our, uh, with Roby uh, Harris, who will speak about an author, who will speak about her perspective as a wonderful author of books on our subjects. Uh, a second one is something we talked about and are going to have a, a, a short presentation. And the general idea was, uh, the role of health uh, in a crisis, in kind of a policy crisis or a, a different kind of national crisis. And we are going to have a short presentation, uh, it'll be at 110 today, by a specialist from the World Bank about Ebola, literacy in the Ebola crisis, uh, to try to bring us up to date on another way of looking at what we're talking about and uh, in our keynote this morning, it's interesting, you know, that we really are talking not only about research for specialists, but in fact, real life for cab drivers and for providing advice. And that was another point that came out last night, is that first confrontation with an adult about a very young child, and what time are you spending together? And uh, Dr. Bailey made the point, at least to me in another conversation, that sometimes he knows immediately, or maybe it was someone else last night, that if there's no reaction at all, you know there's work to be done. And when someone thinks about their youngest child, and that's an opening, I think, for all of us. Uh, our second, uh, let me see if I know, and we uh, will have a chance, we'll, we have a, we'll have a chance for conversation depending on, I know I'm not going to quiet anyone down, we have the time uh, to speak, uh, but at the very end of the day, we'll see how it works, and uh, we have some free time for conversation and questions, but I will encourage the uh, chairs to uh, use that time now uh, to the best of their judgment, whether you want to take questions or not. I, we also will not spend much time on biographies because the biographies are in your handout uh, along with some general information about our program. 
uh, about the Center for the Book, but also about uh, at the Literacy Awards program. And you'll see those handsome, uh, we've now had three, lit three years of Literacy Awards, and I urge you to take a look at the handouts because we have developed um, a plan that goes beyond the cash awards, which Reach Out and Read, I should note, was the first winner of the Rubenstein Award, so maybe this is prophetic that we are all coming together with uh, this particular focus. It shows how we really are, I believe, beginning to learn from what we're doing and using the Literacy Awards connections with organizations as a way for us and you, if you're here, to see what, how big this world really is. Uh, but we developed something called best practices, obviously, uh, and we, it goes beyond the three large cash awards, and these are recognitions from the Library of Congress. So far, it's just with the certificate, but uh, we're hoping that uh, as our program evolves, we can uh, do more in helping out some of the smaller organizations that are getting best practices awards. Uh, and beginning with our second year, we really expanded, figured out what to do with best practices, and each time we've given between 12 and 15 organizations from around the world best practices uh, acknowledgments and been able to bring them here to the library uh, to talk about their programs, and we are filming our programming in, in the process developing our website, uh, which one of these days when we crash, not crash, went wrong, wrong, adjective, wrong verb. When we uh, penetrate the Library of Congress's web services to the point that we can move our results up a little faster, uh, we'll be showing you some of our, uh, the website uh, films from our winners. And for us, it's a great stimulation to have people from other countries come and just have their 10 or 15 minutes of recognition, and we film it, and we also have a page for each of them in our last two annual books, which they can use to promote themselves. So this is an ongoing process, and you are now part of it, and we will move to our first panel. Uh, the panel is Child and Adolescent Health and Literacy Issues, and I, the panel consists of Libby Doggett, who will be the chair, uh, Laura, who is part of it, Lindsay Carter, and Dr. Uh, Needleman, and I would like them to come up, and I will introduce Libby a little bit, but not much. Come on up, everybody come up. Uh, Libby will have the panel members say a little bit about their own uh, backgrounds, but Libby herself is with the Department of Education. She's an assistant, deputy assistant secretary for policy and early learning in the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. And we are all meeting, some of us are meeting each other for the first time. That's right. That's <laughs> we are. Trying to figure out who's sitting We'd actually met on the phone, because we, we are prepared. Um, so I think what we'll do is I'll, I'm going to introduce the panel a little bit, or the frame the panel, although you, um, Sandy did an incredible job of really introducing the whole topic, and it was just a beautiful presentation. So thank you for your presentation, but more importantly, thank you for what the American Academy of Pediatrics is doing in this country. They are making a difference. So one of our panelists couldn't come, but we promised that we would make sure that her message on diversity in books would be heard. So uh, Ellen O was not able to join us today. I regret that because uh, she would have been an incredible person. She is an author as well as the CEO of a uh, group called We Need Diverse Books. And uh, we do need more diverse books, so we will try to work her message into to what we're saying. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's, it's such an honor. I think the Library of Congress is the most beautiful place in the entire world, and the idea that we have so many books available uh, here and electronically now, and then in libraries all across this country is just pretty incredible. Uh, we have a program at the Department of Education called Race, Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge, and we have spent a billion dollars funding 20 states. In one of the states, Maryland, has worked really diligently to get 
families engaged in their children's education and, and to just establish stronger partnerships. And one of the things they've done is to actually introduce families to the library. And I think we all take libraries for granted. When I was a little girl, my uh, family, my mother took us to the library every week. And beside her bed was always a stack of books this high. And I don't know how she got through them with four kids, but she somehow <laughs> at least got through a lot of them because she was always reading and reading to us. And so we all got used to bringing home a stack of books. But uh, in Maryland, some of the newer families, the new immigrant families, didn't know that the library was free. They hadn't used the library because they thought that that incredible resource was something for others, people who could pay. And uh, so it, they, they had events at the library, made sure the families got a library card and taught them how to use it. And I thought that was just such a great uh, way to make a difference in, in families' lives. Uh, I remember very well when uh, the first time I learned to read. I grew up in a family that I had no excuse for not reading, a uh, family that did very well. I was raised to uh, marry well, which a little, fortunately I did, but I did more than that, <laughs> hopefully. But I didn't know how to read when I got to first grade. And I'd gone to kindergarten, I'd gone to preschool at the church, Norton's Preschool. Uh, but I had no idea how to read. And I remember sitting in the reading group. I have this vision so clearly in my mind. And the teacher put a book, a little book, in front of about eight of us and uh, asked if anybody knew what T-I-P meant. And there was, of course, a be beautiful, cute picture of a dog. And my friend, Mark Blumenthal, who is still a friend, said, Tip. And I just looked at him like he was the smartest person in the world because I had no idea. No one had ever taken the time to teach me to decode the letters and the sounds. And I was in first grade. And of course, once I learned, it was very easy. But it was so interesting because t learning to read is not easy. And some kids just automatically get it, but most children do not. And it is very difficult. So we're going to have a chance with Laura to go into depth about that. And then we've already heard about how important it is to have books and that that reading and the relationship that develops between the parents and the child, sitting close, talking about things, slowing down, uh, is so very, very important. We know to do that. We still aren't doing it. It's just amazing to have, we have Reach Out and Read. We have uh, Riff still. We have all kinds of ways to get uh, children books, but we're not doing a very good job of getting those books into the home yet. But we have one great way to do it, and I'm glad to see it's expanding. So uh, Robert will tell us about that. And then I think it's interesting that other countries are using our great research and are doing all kinds of wonderful things. And so we're very fortunate to have Lindsay here from the Department of Agriculture to help us frame this, not just in the United States, but globally. And so she'll talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, here and abroad. Before I turn it over to my incredible panel, I want to just give you a little bit of background about what's happened in the last seven years. Uh, I th in early childhood education, because that's what I do. Uh, we have been fortunate to have a president who really did focus on this. Uh, I can remember sitting around the table in Austin, Texas, where I actually live, with uh, some of my friends thinking, who can we get to champion early childhood education? We didn't, you know, there was no city council person, certainly not the mayor. There was no member of, of the House or Senate in Texas. There was certainly no one in Congress no senator, we wouldn't have thought of the president championing this. We did find a business leader, or the wife of business leader, Roya Kosmetsky, whose husband was president of the business school at the University of Texas. She was an incredible advocate for us. And we wouldn't have dreamed of where we would be now. Uh, I was sitting just across the way at the uh, Capitol a few years ago watching the State of the Union, and I had been told that there was going to be a special announcement about early childhood education. Little did I dream that the president would set such an incredible goal, but we have the goal of providing pre-K for every four-year-old in this country. We're not there yet, but we keep the president keeps coming back with it year after year. Uh, we know that's not a silver bullet, but we know that's doable 
because Oklahoma's doing it, because West Virginia's doing it, Georgia. Vermont now is offering pre-K for every three and four year old. So we know how to do this. States are getting in line. It's not a silver bullet. We need to do pre-K for three and four year olds. We need to improve the whole child care system and make it into an early learning system where every setting for children is a learning setting. Uh, and that's going to take a lot of money, but there is a proposal on the table also to improve the quality of child care across our country. And then there's a wonderful piece of the president's agenda which talks to parents because we know that every parent wants to do the best possible job for their children. You've never talked to a parent who hasn't said, I want to do a better job. I thought your um, story about the taxi cab driver was so wonderful because we all hear that. And every parent wants that. They just don't know how. And uh, even our middle-income families and upper-income families are stressed now because mothers are working and fathers are working and their lives are so very complicated. I have two young daughters and I just marvel at how they carve out time for everything. So with the president's agenda, we have money set, uh, ask, we're asking for a great increase in the home visiting money. It has come down through this president where it's exciting because we have home visiting now, which is really parent coaching in every single state, but we know it's only re reaching a small portion of the families that need it. It's, it's all voluntary, but you know what? If a family's asked, would you like some help? Would you like a coach or a mentor? They all nearly always say yes. So there's a, there is an agenda on the table. Uh, we have people at the highest levels now talking about it. Uh, we had more recently in New York, um, really a competition between the governor and the mayor of New York City about who was gonna pay for the pre-K program. We need more um, arguments like that to raise this up. I do think the American Academy of Pediatric has really made a, a, been a great advocate for this because it's not people like me who are advocates but it's really the business leaders the doctors the the actually the flag officers generals and the the naval officers who have come in and have really made the case that we need this not just for the kids and for the parents we need this for our country and for the future of our workforce so it's been a great ride. I hope we can continue the momentum because there's, we've just barely started. The, the growth is way too small. It's way too late. These first five years disappear like that. For us, five years is nothing. But in five years, children are already in kindergarten and then in first grade, and we've missed an incredible opportunity. So now we're going to go in depth, and uh, we're going to start off with Laura. I mean, with, I'm sorry, with Robert. And he's going to tell us about a great uh, Reach Out and Read, which Sandy mentioned, and he'll tell us a lot more about it. And they're, they're limited to three or four minutes, and they're going to introduce the topic, and then we're going to just kind of have a conversation among us. But we are reserving 20 minutes for you to have a conversation with us. So write down your questions. Be thinking about this, because we really do want to engage uh, the audience, and we have incredible experts here. So, Robert. Oh, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here uh, seeing old friends, uh, making new friends, uh, realizing that uh, our vision is shared and it's very powerful. Now, I, 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 my heart was sinking though, uh, Sandy, while you were talking because I'm thinking she's saying everything I was going to say. <laughs> and my only consolation is as a uh, pediatrician, I know that learning uh, is closely connected with repetition. <laughs> so this will give you an opportunity to master some of this material a little bit more. Uh, and I have written my comments down because I, I didn't want to go over. I could easily talk for the hour myself, but this is, this is to keep me in line. So uh, Reach Out and Read is an approach to pediatric primary care that puts the connection between health and literacy front and center. We do this in several ways. First, we create literacy-rich waiting rooms. Uh, in the best situation, we have volunteers who are reading with the children. Uh, and more importantly, demonstrating to the parents two things. One, that it's easy, and two, that their children love it. In the situation in which Reach Out and Read developed, which was a large clinic serving a low-income urban population, Boston City Hospital, now Boston Medical Center, uh, parents regrettably would often wait for an hour for their visits. So instead of that hour being 
filled with the kind of control sp speech that you talked about. Mm -hmm. It was an hour now filled with uh, observing their children responding to books and somebody who could present them in a happy way. And we discovered a form of waiting room contagion, which was that as parents were watching one person interacting with children about books, other kids would come along, and then the parents who were hanging in the back would start picking up the books and looking at them with their children. So that pretty soon we created a, a milieu in which literacy suffused the waiting room. And we also noticed that things got quieter because the kids weren't running around and the parents weren't yelling at them, they were <laughs> engaged. Uh, we have a new developmentally and culturally appropriate picture book at every visit to the pediatrician, every well-child visit starting at six months of age. Um, that's important for a lot of reasons. One is because the books cost money and so we have to raise money. Two, uh, though more importantly, it's not about giving books to families. It's not about getting books into the, into the home. There are many more efficient ways to get books into the home than having a pediatrician hand them out. It's about having the book in the clinic to use together with the parent and the child. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, and specifically, the most important thing I think that we do is we provide individualized one-on-one -on -one, uh, guidance to a parent with a child about how that child and parent are together using literacy to create connections, to enrich their language, uh, and to establish a, um, an optimistic outlook for the child. So a great pediatrician told me something at the very beginning of Reach Out and Read. He said, you know, when I bring the book into the room, we have conversations with the parents that we never had before. And the conversation is about my child growing up to be a learner. And uh, that was sort of a, a, a world-changing perspective for us, is that we were tapping into a very, very powerful, strong current within the parents of optimism and hope and also fear. Parents who had not had good experiences themselves in the educational world, those are our patients, could see, as your cab driver could see, there's something I can do. Tremendously powerful. Reach on Read reaches 4.4 million, mainly low-income children. It's about 25% of the low-income children in the, in the country. That's awful. I mean, it's wonderful, <laughs> right, 25%. It's awful. What about the other 75% uh, who receive care at some 5,500 clinics around the country? And we have affiliated programs now in many other parts of the world. Uh, Italy and Germany are on board. Uh, and some places where books are being used specifically to help the most stressed kids, like the Philippines, where we've been involved with kids who were uh, affected by the uh, storms there and Haiti. Um, we embrace a holistic view of health, which includes physical, social, and emotional well-being. And I won't go into more of that because it's been talked about. Uh, and importantly, physicians, pediatricians, family doctors have a special opportunity because of our contact with parents at 10 regularly scheduled well-child visits, because they're in the room with us one-on-one, -on -one, and because parents we know come to us not only for advice about health, but also for advice about their children's development and what they can do. Uh, Reach Out and Read rests on a strong base of evidence. We have 14 and now maybe 15 uh, studies published in the peer-reviewed literature uh, that demonstrate some very important outcomes. Um, most importantly, parental attitudes towards reading aloud, including the judgment when you ask parents in a sly way that doesn't uh, sort of prejudice their answers, the judgment that reading aloud is one of the favorite things that parents do with their children, so a source of joy together, uh, and correspondingly increases in the frequency with which parents read aloud and in the number of books in the home. Uh, and then most importantly, uh, we've been able to document through several studies five at last count, improvements in children's language development, specifically vocabulary. And that's because vocabulary is both a direct result of reading aloud, that we know that as parents read aloud children's vocabulary increases, the number of words that they're exposed to increases, and it's also a very robust predictor of later school success. So that when we can show experimentally that institution of a reach out and read program increases children's vocabulary, which has been shown, then we know that we're setting those children up for later success. 
Uh, new evidence, including a marvelous report uh, published in Pediatrics a while ago, increasingly shows that literacy acquisition, listening to stories, engaging with literature, changes the structure of the human brain, specifically the parts of the brain that are engaged in listening to stories. So when we talk about literacy and health, we're really talking about the health of a very important organ, the brain, and now increasingly we're able to see uh, through technology how literacy changes the brain. Uh, no mystery there, but it's quite clear that a healthy brain is important if you're going to become a literate and successful member of society. So uh, our intervention is specifically health related in the sense that we have a target organ, the brain, uh, that we're changing. And also, as you mentioned, Sandy, very importantly, shared enjoyment of stories strengthens attachment and emotional health, and I believe builds resilience. So uh, recognizing this intimate connection between literacy and health, Reach Out and Read is an answer to one very specific question. Uh, what can doctors do? What can doctors do concretely every day in their offices there are many things we can do. We can advocate, we can educate, but what can we do every day in our office, day in, day out, to move children towards greater literacy and thereby greater health? Uh, I just want to end, I probably talked too long, saying one thing about the name Reach Out and Read. All right. I will say it in this context. Uh, it's a little in-joke for me. <laughs> the name was thought up by my wife, who is a surgical pathologist. And if she sees children in her professional life, it's little teeny pieces of children. Um, and she thought up the name because we wanted a cool acronym, so it was R-O-A-R, -R, Reach Out and Read. That only lasted until the mayor of Boston informed us that R-O-A-R -R also stood for Restore Our Alienated Rights, which was an anti-busing group oh. in Southie. <laughs> So we became the first, maybe only, literacy organization that spells its name wrong. <laughs> but it also turned out to be prophetic uh, in the sense that we're learning that reaching out is not only reaching out to parents and connecting with their aspirations for their children, but that this enterprise for pediatricians requires us to reach out to other professionals who have other expertise, to business people, to educators, to policy people, the program really only works when we cross boundaries. Pediatricians cannot and do not do it alone. And that giving pediatricians, family doctors, a tool that they can use every day also encourages them to look beyond the walls of their clinic because they need to make common cause with others in the community. So in that sense, we're reaching out as well. And that's a reason that I'm especially delighted to be here to have this discussion with you. Thank you so much. You know, we wouldn't have Reach Out and Read if it weren't for Robert, because he's one of the co-founders. So uh, the fact that your wife got the name uh, obviously tells us how intimately you were involved in the beginning of that. Uh, I think he's given us a, a challenge. Only 75% se uh, of the kids don't have this, and we know we know to do how to do this. This is doable. I think uh, the other challenge that we all have is getting time for pediatricians to do this. Because I know I have a son-in-law who's a pediatrician and uh, he's, he's challenged and my daughter did family practice, does family practice and the, you know that challenge of having the time to do it, they both do it, but it's very difficult. So thank you. So Laura's next and she's gonna take a little bit different tack and talk a little bit more about literacy, but you'll see how it all comes together. Good morning, I'm Laura Baylett and I direct the Nemours Bright Start program. Nemours is an integrated children's health system, and Nemours recognized reading failure as a major child health issue several years ago. Given the really significant health, educational, and truly life consequences of poor reading ability, Nemours identified that it couldn't just sit on the sidelines of this issue. And this has been so um, reinforced to me just in the last 12 hours, listening to Dr. Bailey's wonderful talk last night, and then Dr. Hassink this morning. And these are two of our uh, physician leaders at Nemours, Dr. Bailey as our president and CEO, and they're pediatricians. And to hear them talk about literacy issues with such in-depth knowledge 
um, and emphasizing all the ways and how much that's important for pediatric health care is just um, stunning to me still. And it just reminds me what an honor and privilege is it, it is to work at an organization like Nemours that really does um, value the whole child and helping every child maximize their potential. So I just, I just had to give that commercial break for Nemours. It's, it's stunning. So for the past 11 years, Nemours Bright Start has developed and researched new tools for educators, parents, and healthcare providers because, as we know, all of those folks in our community have a big role to play and we want to help each of these folks understand what it takes for every child to become a strong reader and Sandy did a great job of reminding us we need to talk more about what all children need and and there still is a lot of misunderstanding about what every child needs to thrive we also focus a lot on how to identify those children who may be at risk and what to do to catch them up before they have a chance to fail. So we've developed educational tools that through our research have been proven highly successful in reducing that reading readiness gap in these vulnerable children before they even get to kindergarten. Um, I want to talk a little bit about one of our current projects, which is a website for parents of children from birth through five called readingbrightstart.org. On that website, we've really taken everything that we've learned from our work with thousands of children. We've worked with children ourselves, parents and teachers, direct work with all of these people, and put all of that content into a website with the goal of empowering parents, really putting them squarely in the driver's seat in preparing their own child for reading success. One of the best features of our website is our preschool reading screener for three to five-year-olds. This is a simple checklist that helps the parent find out if their child is on track in their reading readiness or maybe needs more help. After the parent completes the screener, they receive a customized action plan for their child. All aspects of the website are currently free and we've optimized the site for smartphone to make it as accessible as possible to people across the income spectrum. So today, in this setting, we're releasing our very first National Reading Readiness Snapshot. So through the website, thousands of parents from all 50 states and Washington, D.C. have completed that screener, and thousands of them have given us their permission to use their child's data for research purposes. So we're sharing with you our very first set of results as a springboard to our goal ultimately of universal reading readiness screening for every four-year-old in the country. We have copies of our reading readiness snapshot document out on the table, so please grab one. We're happy to discuss the results and answer any questions you have about that. And we think this screener as well as the website as a whole can work really, really well with programs like Reach Out and Read and other community initiatives to strengthen early childhood programs and resources. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, we will want to hear more about that because I do want to hear the results. <laughs> so, we're as I mentioned in my intro, uh, Lindsay Carter's here from the USDA, Univers uh, U.S. Department of Ed uh, Agriculture. So we have education, and we talk about health, and we have agriculture, and uh, they're doing amazing stuff. We were real excited when we were talking and, and just hearing all that's going on abroad. So. Lindsay, give us a little taste. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm here today uh, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and many of you may be aware of the National School Meals Program and School Breakfast Programs that we implement here in the U.S., but uh, over w that's with the Food and Nutrition Service, but coming over to another part of um, USDA, we have the Foreign Agricultural Service, which has a mission to improve agricultural trade and reduce world hunger. And one of the programs under our agency is the McGovern Doll, full title, International Food for Education and Child Nutrition Program, which I think even in the title alone really ties in the health and the nutrition. Our program began in 2003 after being authorized under the Farm Bill. And our mission is to help promote education, child development, and food insecurity in some of the world's poorest countries. This is done through the use of U.S. agricultural commodities as well as technical and financial assistance to initiate, start, and uh, continue with school meals programs. 
And it's through this provision of school meals that we look for an initial increase in school enrollment and school attendance rates, which um, is very visible. Uh, visiting programs in Malawi, you suddenly see a lot more children are being sent to school when their parents realize, hey, our kid's going to get a free meal. And sometimes that is the only meal that they receive the day in a day. And we through this... Um, program as well. We're improving enrollment, increasing attendance rates, and then also reducing school dropout rates. Our program is implemented uh, by our um, private voluntary organizations and also international organizations like the um, UN World Food Program. Our program's running from three to five years, sometimes with potential for continuations. Um, and at present, we have 33 active agreements in 25 countries across Latin America and the Caribbean, all parts of Africa and Southeast Asia. And what we find through um, our programs is, while we saw initial increases in enrollment, our program was doing a great job about getting children into school it's when you get their butts in the seats, how do you start teaching them to learn? So in 2012, we um, developed two results frameworks, which include increased literacy and increased use of health and dietary practices. And this is through how sort of school feeding leads to more children being well-fed, being active and attentive, ready to learn a, hung a hungry child, is, going, is not going to have the same learning capacity as a child that is well fed. Improved nutrition that comes from providing a daily nutritious meal. But we found that in order to reach these goals, we needed to have complementary activities. So what we have a lot under our program is in addition to the providing a school meal. We're bringing the parent-teacher orga uh, organizations together, usually to prepare the meal, to serve the meal, as well as to support the school. We'll introduce school gardens, which include a, um, the FAO has developed a school gardens curriculum. This isn't for the children to be you know, out of the classroom, but it's the opportunity for the children to use the garden to be out learning about what's being grown. I've seen um, <laughs> school gardens where they create the, the planting beds in different shapes so the children can learn shapes. There's a whole way of developing a constructive, con um, constructive curriculum. We then talk about, um, in order for the children to get the nutrition of the meal, building latrines, teaching hand washing, making sure there's access to safe water so that <coughs> school meals can be safely prepared and the overall health of the child is going to be supported. We're also doing teacher training and when making sure that there are books in the classrooms um, for example, Room to Learn is working in Laos to make sure there are school classrooms. In a lot of these communities, there's usually a generation of parents where a large proportion of them are illiterate. So how do you bring them in? Our program in Mali has developed report cards, which is landmark report cards for illiterate parents that connects the parents with the goal of the child because we believe a parent doesn't necessarily need to be literate to understand the value of education and want their child to be literate. So we have brought all this together. We encourage our organizations to build capacity at the national, regional, and local level, um, which usually involves developing a national school feeding policy and understanding what is the benefit. So we try um, a lot of, there's a lack of data um, connecting really what is the value of providing a school meal to improve literacy and uh, health and nutrition of the school-aged child and how those two objectives support one another. So we have, we have baseline, midterm, and final evaluations, building a base of data, as well as taking our own initiatives within our office to develop um, systematic reviews of what's already been studied out there across the world, and then build upon that by building our own learning agenda of what 
What do we need to know and what pathways of attribution do we need to learn so we can provide this data to foreign governments so, to further support their school meals programs and their uh, literacy, improved literacy? And I think this is important. Um, final note that I want to touch upon is here in the US, our school meals program is housed within the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> This isn't the case in many of the countries that we work. The school feeding unit is usually housed within the Ministry of Education. So working on curriculum development, when we need to advocate for why there should be a national school feeding policy, we're talking to the education ministry. So coordination with them and recognizing the connection of how school feeding can lead to improvements in literacy and health touched upon today, especially the uh, pediatricians between the connection of literacy and health and health and literacy. And then my f um, final thing is that, my final point is the connections that we need to make in as far as thoughtful coordination in order to supplement these impacts. Providing a school meal alone is not gonna improve literacy. There need to be complementary activities and our office has benefited from a memorandum of understanding with USAID's Office of Education, who have a goal one to have improved the literacy, um, early grade reading of 100 million children worldwide. Working with them, their literacy experts, we're able to improve the quality of our program and further providing a school meal helps to bring those children to school. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Lindsay. That was an amazing. Yes, clap. I think it's incredible for us to be reminded again how important food is. It is the very basic medicine. I mean, it's, it's, it's so basic. And we don't worry as much about that because of the great school meal programs, although I think we worry over the summer and over vacations because some children, even in our country, aren't getting uh, the nutrition they need. Uh, that was that was incredible. So we're going to go a little bit more in depth. Be thinking of your question because you all are next. Uh, <laughs> Bob, I want to go back to to you and talk a little bit about intergenerational poverty. I mean, you're working you're you're working with the, the parents and the children, and right now there is a resurgence on what we call two gen programs. Mm -hmm. Programs that don't just focus on the children, don't just focus on the adults, but focus on both because we know they're important. So how does Reach Out and Read fit into that? Um, many years ago, I had a study uh, underway through the Maternal and Child Health Bureau uh, in which we enrolled several hundred mothers of children coming for their five-month well-child visit. And part of what we did in the study was we gave the mother a very simple reading test, the wide range achievement test, which is nothing but a list of words that you have to read and you get a score. 50% uh, of our mothers in that study were untestable. Their, their scores were below the bottom of the test. Mm. So the problem of literacy is extreme. Um, many of the graduates from our public schools graduate without the ability to read well. My uh, own take on it is that um, having low literacy skills as a parent uh, contributes to a sense of despair in terms of your ability to help your child see a better way. And um, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, every time you pick up a book, uh, you're reminded of your own history of uh, frustration and discouragement. Uh, growing up in school. So one of the things that uh, we try to do in Reach Out and Read is uh, be aware of that and understand that telling a parent in that situation you should read to your child is not a benign thing to do. It's actually a very bad thing to do. And that uh, the message needs to be you can help your child love books by having fun with your child with the book don't focus on the words, make it fun and talk about the pictures and enjoy it together. So that uh, we have a problem in terminology, we, we call it reading aloud, but what we're really talking about is not reading at all. What we're talking about is a joyful uh, interaction between parents and children and books. Um, and to convey that to parents, 
what we find is most helpful is not really to say very much at all, but to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, our methodology, at least what I think is most effective, is to watch the parent looking at the book with the child for a very short period of time. One can get a good mm -hmm. sense of it in a very quick interaction. Uh, to notice when it looks beautiful and be a witness to that, this is beautiful. Or when it doesn't look beautiful, to be able to right there demonstrate how to do it. And uh, it is as simple as stepping in and saying, why don't we try this? And then you do something. And it may be just looking at a picture and saying, hey, where's the boy? What's he doing? Where's the dog? Can you show me the, right? And you play that game for a minute. And then when the child is engaged and happy, you say, this is what we mean when we talk about reading. Now you do it. And then giving the parent a chance to um, mimic what we've done. So that's a very concrete approach to this question of interrupting a transgenerational transmission mm -hmm. of not only literacy as an inability to read, but literacy as an unhappy relationship with mm -hmm. books. Uh, and uh, I think we can do that because of the power of the relationship between the doctor and the parent, where the relationship is one of appreciation uh, without judgment mm -hmm. and of collaboration. We're in this together to help your child to be the most wonderful person right. they can be. So your quote from uh, Dr. Fester was exactly right. That's exactly what we're about. So Laura, Laura, talk to us more about the reading. I mean, it's difficult to learn to read. We now know from Bob a lot of families can't read, and we have to teach them how to read the pictures and tell the stories and, and use their words in other ways. But how hard is it to learn to read? What is the, what, what's going on in the brain, and what does the research tell us? Well, learning to read is really a very challenging task for the brain, and, and I think we're reminded of that with the statistic that Sandy showed in one of her slides, that by the end of third grade, two-thirds of American children, we're a very affluent country um, on an international scale, two-thirds of them are not proficient in reading. That doesn't mean two-thirds of all of our children are disabled or that there's something, something wrong with them. What's wrong is that they're not getting the kind of instruction starting early enough to help them become proficient readers. And, and one of the things that the basics that we've sort of forgotten is how challenging a task this is for the brain. You know, reading occurs very late in the course of human development. And, and you know, I think a lot when I'm at the Library of Congress about Gutenberg, and I once heard a brilliant neuroscientist, uh, Dr. Gordon Sherman, say, you know what really caused dyslexia was Gutenberg. Because when he invented the printing press, all of a sudden, the masses are sort of expected to be able to read, whereas before it was only the elite few that could read. But now that everybody has the opportunity to read, the expectation goes up, well then everybody should read, and, and it's not a natural easy thing for the brain, and so I think there's a lot to that. But we still have this prevailing myth that children do learn to read naturally if they just sort of have books around them and a reasonably supportive environment. Now children do learn to talk in this way, but most children don't learn to read in this way. For most children, learning to read in English takes about three to four years of intentional, systematic, high-quality instruction. If you're Italian, it only takes about one to two years to learn to read. If you're Chinese, it takes about 10 years. So it definitely varies depending on the complexity of the written language system. And even many educators don't fully understand this. Learning to read requires several parts of the brain which are built to do something else, to learn a new skill, and then synchronize with these other brain areas that are also learning something new at the same time. So it's pretty darn complicated, and we really shouldn't be surprised that so many children struggle with it. Now, I do want to emphasize that success with reading instruction is really predicated 
on a lot of high quality talking, reading, singing, and playing that parents and other caregivers will do with young children starting from birth. So that is absolutely necessary and lays down that solid brain foundation so that the child is ready and able to benefit from that high quality instruction. So it takes both sides of that. And the earlier that we start providing that evidence-based developmentally appropriate reading instruction, the stronger the reading outcomes. I do want to, to go back to a point that Libby actually mentioned. I can't believe she said it. But another really important, because we didn't talk about it in advance, and I already had this typed, you can look. Um, another really important point about reading is that it tends to be viewed as a proxy for intelligence. So it works like this. If you're a good reader, you must be very smart. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Libby said. That kid mm -hmm. who knew the word tip, she said he must be very smart. He was, that's and, he what, and he still is. And he still <laughs> is. But you're no slack, and you weren't reading that word. so. <laughs> But if you're not a good reader, maybe it's because you're just not very smart. And this is the message that struggling readers receive over and over and begin telling themselves. And those of you who work with adults with low literacy skills, you know what I'm talking about. I can't tell you how often I have heard from children, teenagers, and adults that they think they are not smart, no matter what other evidence there is that they are incredibly bright and talented. And once they start to think that they're not smart, it's like it becomes sort of seared into their psyche and they just can't stop believing that. And it has so profound an impact on their confidence, on their willingness to ask questions in institutional situations or with authority figures like a doctor they are terrified to read with their children because they think they can't do it well enough and that if they don't know a word or make a mistake, that's the worst thing that can happen. We spend a lot of time and effort on our website in, and in our direct interaction with parents talking exactly about what Robert said. It's not about reading every word on the page. It's about engaging around that book, having fun, having a loving, supportive conversation. That's what's important with the babies not reading every word on the page. Um, that's what really motivates us at Nemours Bright Start, so I'll stop there. Great. So, Lindsay, you've, we've talked a lot about the intersection of health and uh, literacy, and you added really nutrition because we know that's important too, and, and Dr. Hessing talked about it. What have you learned from abroad that we should, should know or, or heed? It's... Um Across our programs, depending on what they are, there um, there's a lot of differences. But sometimes I'm struck by when I'm in the field, when I hear very similarities. A lot of sort of qualitative discussions I'll have with a parent or a community member really drives home and be like, I'm pretty sure I could be having this conversation with a parent in the U.S. Um, a lot of it having to do with, we talked a lot about early childhood development. Hearing teachers in Burkina Faso where child care and early childhood development is certainly not a um, common feature, but we do, part of that, our activities there is we do support um, early child care centers and provide training to caregivers. And hearing the parents there and the teachers talking about these children, they arrive and they already know their letters and they're ready to read in a community where many of the households have no books whatsoever, but a well-supplied early childcare center has the same impact, very similar impact to what it can have in Burkina Faso to what it has in Oklahoma. So there are a lot of similarities um, as well as some differences, but what, what really strikes me is um, the conversations today, as far as what I've seen, is literacy is not restricted to the classroom. It's what happens in a pediatrician's office. It's what happens in a child care, what happens a lot in the home. Mm -hmm. And when we're talk working in very remote and isolated locations um, around the world, a school is important because a school is where a community can come together in a place where there may not be a health clinic, but there is usually a primary school. So I think it's important to remember that a school, an education system, is a resource of the community where it can be 
a location, but it's not the, the boundaries of the school go beyond the school gate. So that's really how our nexus of providing a school meal and addressing nutrition, health, and literacy, that's sort of our entry point. But we really try and develop programs that go beyond the school gate, and that engages with um, engaging with parents and doing nutrition trainings and working, if there's a preschool, working with a preschool um, and developing that sort of sustainability and really trying to serve a community, which I think is probably true in the US. And I'll just use this as another place is we found that the school is incredibly useful in these very remote and isolated locations as also an entry point for providing certain aspects of health education and um, health services. And I didn't get a chance to mention during my introduction, but another part of the ability of a child to take in the nutritional quality is something like providing deworming um, campaigns. So that's actually a way that a Ministry of Education may coordinate with a Ministry of Health um, as far as if there's a national deworming campaign, having that entry point into a community not be through the health center that doesn't exist, but being through the school. And by providing nutrition and education um, and health education to a, a child, it's kind of a twofold effect because you both, you reach the parents and also you're reaching the future parents through the children. Great, thank you. Can Laura? I um, share with the audience a little bit of a conversation that the three of us had as, as we all met first thing this morning? And Lindsay, that was the point that you made that sometimes inadvertently um, a, a literacy program or a feeding program because of time and resource constraints end up one supplants the other. And it may be inadvertent or you, you know, organizations may know that this is going to happen but feel like, well, we can't do both, so we're going to have to pick one over the other. And I think in some ways that happens a lot in this country, too, where we, we, we sort of have the tyranny of the or. We think we can do this or we can do this, but there's no way we can do both together. And I think that's where, you know, some creative thinking and thinking across traditional boundaries and silos could really help us do both in a, in a very resource efficient and time efficient way. I don't know if you, either of you, we all talked about well, that. Um, I think that the key insight is you can't be healthy if you can't read. And you probably can't read if you're not healthy. Mm -hmm. So the or proposition is a non-starter. And we need to just be really clear about that. I think it brings us back around to actually what Dr. Hessing was saying, which is zip code and community and how important all the services are in that community and how we need to really work to bring it all together and make sure that, that it's efficient, that there's not duplication, but that, that we're reaching uh, all the families. So to, I have one more question, and then we're going to throw it open to the audience, and, and this is for any of you. Given that, that we need to break down these silos and that we need to do and instead of or, what, what advice do you have? Research. <laughs> um, it's uh, understanding that school feeding, it's the hardest thing as far as we can collect all the data, but especially um, even though there have been a few random control trials when we're when we're working in schools, when you're providing a school meal to a child, having developing random control trials that really help us draw that line of attribution is difficult at best. And we, we need more data and research in order to tell our story of seeing not only the intended impacts, but some of the unintended impacts and making sure we're designing the best set of of the best package of interventions to reach our goal. Um, so if, if your answer is research, my answer is bookkeeping. Okay. <laughs> um, in particular, uh, because our focus is on very young children, very young children tend to be served through the health system, and older children tend to be served through the education system. And it makes it very difficult to do a cost-benefit analysis if the costs are being borne in one system 
and the benefits are being realized in another. So we need to do some creative bookkeeping where we recognize that investments that may flow through a, a doctor's office might have payoffs that show up later in school. I love that. Laura, you want to comment? Sure. I, I think both of these are so important. And, and I think also how we, how we talk about issues of literacy and health, um, just, just how we frame the issues and the terms that we use have such impact on the structures that we set up. So I was really struck again by what Lindsay said. You know, in the United States, the school nutrition program is housed in Department of Agriculture, whereas in many countries, overseas, it's housed in the Department of Education. And, and the very fact that it's in agriculture force, and I'm not saying that's bad or that's wrong, but there's historical precedents and decision making that have implications down the road that we may not have recognized. And so by, put, by having it in agriculture, in some people's mind, we think of that as, as strictly a food program and a farming issue and not an educational issue. And so to, to be aware of how the structural barriers prevent us from thinking differently, which then prevents us from acting differently. And, and I think um, blended funding streams where, you know, or recognition that dollars spent in one system may have their greatest dollar savings long-term in a very different system, but that that, that is good that that's not bad, um, and how do we have that sort of joint accounting monetarily and also in terms of the broader goals of what we're trying to accomplish. And, and I keep coming back to what Sandy said. We've, we've sort of taken our eye off the, the fundamentals. And, and what does every child fundamentally need? And they need food and nutrition, and they need to learn to read. I mean, those should be fundamental things that no matter what else is happening nationwide, we don't take our eye off that ball. And, and I think that's happened a lot. So you can see we have an excellent panel. It's your turn now. What questions do you have? What, what's raised? And we'll go to the very oh, back. Yeah, I love that. And hands tell, and tell us your name and where you're from, just so we'll have a context. Sure. Good morning. I'm Dr. Sandra Charles. I'm actually the physician here at the library running the occupational health program. And you're coming at it from the child literacy point of view. We try to come at it from the health and literacy for the adults who are our employees. But I'm really fascinated by this because I couldn't agree more with the whole premise of getting not only to the nutrition but the, uh, the literacy combined. And to that end, the responses to that last question, we, uh, we talked about we need more research and um, data. I, would say you have enough of that to try start the collaboration between the USDA programs and the education programs and try to get that out there where people are making the connection. So put what you already have out into the community. I guess that's sort of like the practical uh, application of the research that you've done. So make it more out in the community. And I think that we will, uh, I'm sitting here thinking of all kinds of possibilities <laughs> in terms of programs that people could start. You know, I actually have a child, a daughter who is, um, she aspires to be where you are in terms of pediatrics and uh, dealing with the, the childhood problems of literacy and health and uh, nutrition. And um, so, I've been hearing this for some time from her, and I just think that you have enough to start making the collaborations and, and implementing some of the programs. And um, one of the things we've started to do here is starting a family health and wellness day where we encourage employees to bring their families in and introduce them to different health and wellness things. And I think this is a real key component that we could um, incorporate. You. And I commend Dr. Cole because ever since I've been here, you know, Star where the reading is fundamental and it's come a long way and it is fundamental to both health and wellness. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone want to comment? I'll just say stick around. We have an adult panel right after lunch. So <laughs> Okay. Roby, it's Hi, floor is yours. Stand up and tell them who you are. Oh. 
and Ruby we're Harris. I'm yours. a children's book author. Um, I'm just sorry that Ellen O can't be here today, uh, the founder and a marvelous children's book author on her own. And I just wondered, uh, started with other, mostly librarians, but people in the children's book field, we need diverse books for children. And I just wondered if the panel could maybe comment on the issue of diversity and how you see it fitting in what you have to say. I'll start. Thank you very much. Um, so in the, in the course of the work in the clinic, um, especially for older children, uh, my clinic, because of funding issues, relies on donated books. And so the books that we have for children six, seven, eight, and nine are whatever we can get. And very few of those books are Afrocentric books, and very many of our patients are African American. And so uh, I'll ask parents when their child is, you know, holding that book and being very excited about it, do you know about Afrocentric books? Do you have any? And for most of the parents, they don't. And it really is a problem because the message to a young child who has a beautiful book that has people in it who are not identified with that kid is that these books are written for somebody else about a world that is not your world. And the, the shame of it is, is that there are many, many, many wonderful Afrocentric stories and books, but our parents don't know about them a lot. And so, you know, if I could wave my magic wand and get a budget to do it, I'd be buying a bunch of those books. I would make sure that I have Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters. I would make sure that I have The People Could Fly. I would make sure that I have Ezra Jack Keats books, you know, The Snowy Day in Winter and Whistle for Willie in Summer in profusion so that every kid with darker skin in my clinic who identifies as African American could have some books like that. I'd make sure that I have some biographies of great African American leaders that, that the, the little kids who I see who feel, you know, sort of disenfranchised can read about Malcolm X, who was sometimes angry, <laughs> you know, just like they're sometimes angry. But he took that and he made it pretty powerful. So I, just to echo, we need it. And we need to be aware of it. We need to fund it. Thank you for reminding us that. I think it's important. You want to mention something? I, I think this is a wonderful question because it's um, a challenge that we face with the McGovern Dole program, but we're trying very hard with our implementing partners to address because not only are we trying to make sure that we have appropriate books in an international context, but and this is helped by our colleagues at the USAID Office of Education, and Laura alluded of how difficult it is to learn to read, is um, we're trying with a lot of these countries where there's usually a colonial language, mm -hmm. and then there's a mother tongue. So often children are being asked to learn to read in a language they haven't even learned or spoken until the age of five. So trying to, usually we're having to actually seek out, be very creative, and being able to produce both uh, textbooks and fictional books for the community in a language that is understood. And there's some very creative ways that our projects are doing that the most. Um, as far as finding a affordable and eager resource, my, my favorite is in some West African countries, um, Peace Corps volunteers who are working with a program to help and produce books because they know the local language, they've learned it, they can read and write it and they're producing these books that can go out in communities and then tying in with a health aspect, making sure that the message of this book is not only enticing to children, but making sure it addresses issues such as hand washing, improved nutrition, working with others in the community. So I think there's the language that we choose, as well as how the books look, making sure they're exciting. It's an accessibility issues, but there are lots of creative ways that we can um, make these resources available. And we want the diverse books for all children, because I want my Anglo kids to not just see right. 
themselves. I want them to see others. And Dr. I, Sullivan. Can I just say one other thing, oh, though? I, sorry, Laura. I think it's important to remember diversity is, there's so many types of diversity. So there's diversity of, of race and ethnicity. There's linguistic diversity. There's also health diversity. And, and uh, Roby's going to do a talk on, on her books where she writes about children with different health issues. But books are a fantastic way for children, teenagers, and adults to see themselves if they have a health condition or a learning challenge through characters in a book and to broaden their world perspective, see a world that with without limits instead of the limitations and the helplessness that they often feel when they have a health or a learning condition. And stories just can open a person's eyes to um, broader a broader world view. And if nothing else, books are a great companion for sick days. And we don't want to forget about the joy of reading. And actually, an author ambassador, a former one for the Library of Congress, Kate DeCamelo, um, who wrote the story because of Winn-Dixie, um, she talks about, as a young child, she was sick a lot. And, and books are what kept her sane and opened the world of possibilities to her. So I don't want to forget that. Sorry, Dr. So Sullivan. Book, books are windows and they're mirrors. Way to see out, way to see yourself. Dr. Sullivan, we're so glad you're here. Yes. Thank we're you. all honored. Thank you. First of all, this is really an excellent panel, and I'm very pleased to be here. And one of the reasons I'm, <coughs> I'm here is because of the well-established um, known relationship between level of education, literacy, and health. And I, <coughs> and I maintain that while we really have, as a nation, had tremendous development of our scientific uh, knowledge and new therapies, et cetera. We really haven't done as much or as well as we should on improving health literacy and, and health behavior. Mm -hmm. But I'm pleased that that's getting some, some recognition. Having said that, I, I have several questions or comments I'd like to make. First, uh, I have a specific question for Dr. Hassink. I'm curious as to what happened to that grandfather who wanted his grandson held back because it sounded as if that didn't happen. Uh, and it meant the system was not responsive uh, here. And it bothers me because often we find that our rules and our regulations, our bureaucracy, get in the way of good decision making. And that really is one of the issues that I uh, w worry about. The other um, uh, comment I would want to make is this. With the tremendous programs that you have, I'm bothered by the fact that we don't, as a country, support education as strongly as we should. Everyone knows that we are really in a new era, that we really are moving towards an, a, 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 a system where those who have good education are going to do well, those who uh, do not are really falling by the wayside, part of the income gap that we refer to now. So the question I have is, with the programs that we have, what's being done to really let the public know and generate support for them so that our legislators in our states or in our school systems or in the Congress really support them. Because the paradox is we have these tremendous programs, but yet we have a real problem really getting the kind of support for our education system. So I'd be interested in knowing what have been your experiences been or what are your thoughts, how can we really take these tremendous programs that you have and generate the kind of support that we need so that they will really be promulgated uh, around the country as they should. So Dr. Hussing is going to help us. But the grandfather was not able to um, get his son held back because his son was not a behavior problem. Mm -hmm. And did what you know was a quiet little boy who sort of was there in class, and we tried and didn't have um, any other feature that would have allowed us to um, advocate, except that he couldn't read, and we couldn't do it. We couldn't solve that problem for that grandfather. So, um. so anyone want to address that complicated, difficult question? I'm speechless. <laughs> we need everybody here to, to help us because this is not going to happen easily. I think in other countries, they do it because of it's a moral obligation to take care of your kids. But somehow in the United States, we've got to prove that it's cost effective, that 
that we're going to save money. And even though we know, even for, for something as simple as preschool, uh, there are people that say it, the, the results fade, uh, it doesn't make a difference, and we're having trouble selling it. So it, it is an uphill battle here in the United States, and we need everybody here to speak out repeatedly, and your voice would be a particularly helpful one. Well, thanks. I really would not hesitate to do that in every opportunity. I have one other qu uh, comment uh, for Dr. Needleman. With the lack of uh, diversity, ethnic diversity of your books uh, and the need for them, I wonder, um, you're in Cleveland. Um, I'm sure you know Reverend Otis Moss. Uh, uh, and uh, the Cleveland Urban League, I know for years, has been one of the strongest Urban League chapters uh, around the country. So I guess my question is, have you raised this question with some of the black leadership uh, in your community? Because these are people uh, who really ought to be responsive to that. And you could tell them that I sent you. <laughs> <laughs> I Reverend will. Moss happens to be a Morehouse College graduate. Oh. So I, I knew him. He was two years behind me in college. So, I, so we I, have a quick answer, and then actually we're out of time, so I'm going to let the panel wrap. But uh, I will be glad to convey your message to the Reverend. Uh, there's a very small health center in the uh, Fairfax neighborhood of Cleveland called the Otis Moss University Health Center, and they support us fantastically by allowing us to store our books in their basement. Uh, just to clarify, uh, the Reach Out and Read program as organized through our national center and as supported in our local chapters, does raise lots and lots of money to purchase culturally appropriate, ethnically diverse books for our target audience, which is children from birth to age essentially six. Uh, that's the sweet spot for us because that's when we see kids frequently, uh, and we think that that's when the foundations of literacy are, are laid down. So on the good side, I would say that we do have a wealth of uh, beautiful culturally appropriate books, uh, largely through the generation, uh, generosity too of Scholastic, which makes these available to us at great discounts and also supports their generation. So that's the good side. And the bad side is uh, we are limited by our budgets to books that are not terribly expensive. And so the books that we can provide at every well child visit uh, retail for a, somewhere between five and six bucks. Mm -hmm. and uh, to our nonprofits uh, cost us somewhere between two and three bucks. Uh, but that prices those kids out of a lot of the very best literature that's out there for children. So when I was raising my kid, uh, I didn't only get books that cost five and six bucks. Uh, right. So there's a great disparity and injustice, even as we try to do our best we could do a whole lot more to make the full range of beautiful literature available to the full range of our kids. So I told them they could have one last word. Anyone want a last word? I just want to thank everyone for being here. I think in response to your, your question of how can this be better publicized, I think by being here today and then going out and messaging and continuing to work together, it will, we'll start, um, we'll plant some seeds and um, Funding is always an issue, but, but thank you all, and hopefully you'll learn a lot today that you can message about. Thank you, panel. Thank you, audience. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone and just uh, make one more before we take a little break, very short break before our, we, we hear from Roby. Uh, on the diverse books issue, uh, tomorrow here, at the Library of Congress, we will be have, giving the, uh, hosting an event at which the first diversity award in children's books will be given uh, by an award by the American Library Association. And this is a momentum, no? Okay, Karen is gonna correct me. Uh, yeah, we, need we Need Diverse Books is the name of the group, which is carrying on in this whole area. And the first awards will be given, and it's going to be called the Walter Award uh, in honor of Walter Dean Myers, who was our third national ambassador for young people's literature. And Walter uh, sadly passed away soon after his two-year term. Uh, Kate DiCamillo uh, followed Walter, and our new, uh, our, our new Jean Yang is our new national ambassador. 
But tomorrow, it's a public event. It's at 10 o'clock in the room where we were last night. It's in room 119, and you would all be welcome to come and learn more about we, give me the phrase again, we need diverse books, which is the name of the group. So this is very much a theme of what we're doing, and thank you for bringing it up uh, indirectly and directly to everyone here. Uh, I thought, Roby, we're going to take a five-minute break and start with Roby, and when you come back, the restrooms are right next door. Uh, please be back in five minutes, and we'll continue with the program. Thank you for a wonderful morning and first panel. Well, we have a special author's perspective uh, on our topics today, and from the beginning, we uh, had the notion of having an author's perspective, and we've been exceptionally lucky uh, to have uh, Roby Harris here, who is known for to many of you uh, as a very prolific and thoughtful writer and author about books relating to families, childbirth, sexuality. Uh, she, in fact, has been at this for so long that some of her books are having anniversary editions, and there is a brochure uh, for both It's Perfectly Normal and It's So Amazing, 20th anniversary of It's Perfectly Normal, 15th anniversary of It's So Amazing, and those brochures plus a display of num a number of her books are uh, on the table in the back. Uh, when we spoke on the phone, which is the first time we met, to talk a little bit about her presentation, uh, I was struck how she w emphasized that uh, in the research for her books, uh, she often started by, whatever the topic, <laughs> talking to kids and talking to children about the topic that she was about to write about. And I thought, well, can, may we call this a perspective from the childhood? And she said, no, it's going to be my perspective, <laughs> but I want you to know that I do my background research, you know, with uh, the real thing with the children. And when I've seen the range of, act, of books that she's put out uh, and heard her speak a little bit about these, I know we're in for a treat. Let's welcome Roby Harris. Thank you so much. I'll take my notes. Sorry. So um, I'm feeling a little speechless. And for those of you who know me well, I'm really not, just because so much has been said already. Uh, which has been so wonderful. So I, I want to join Dr. Needleman in the repetition model here. And John, you mentioned that I might be able to go on just, just a little, little bit longer. Okay, so uh, I have permission to do that. So it's an absolute privilege to be here at the Center for the Book at the Library of Congress and to be able to thank you, John Cole. And I've written out my words, too, so that I don't go on too, too long the founding and current director of the Center for the Book for your critical support and the Center's support for the work all of us do in the world of children's books and children's health. I want to thank Dr. Bailey for last night, for your leadership in the world of child health, the Bright Star program, and your wonderful words, everything we do must be for the child, and I quote here. If it's not, then we need to consider why we are doing it. And also Dr. Hasek uh, for your leadership in the field of pediatrics for mentioning the ACES study and literacy this morning, which I think is very important, critical work on childhood obesity and the link between health and literacy and the, and it goes on and on, the toolkit. And to all of you in the audience, I'm, you know, I'm behind my computer and then they let me out every once in a while to do, to speak. Uh, but you're, you're on the front lines and all of you for your leadership in the field of pediatrics, um, your critical work on childhood um, uh, and to all of you in the audience who care about or give care day in, day out to our nation's children from infancy through adolescence and actually prenatally, because that certainly is a part of health, to help them and their families stay healthy. So I gave um, uh, John Cole a title, which is up there, Read Well, Be Well, Stay Well. And I'm going to continue to look at the question, which I also sent to Dr. Cole. What role can children's books play in helping kids of all ages and their families stay physically and emotionally healthy? I'm a children's book author. I have a strong interest and background in child development. And I think children are so wonderful. I can't stop 
watching them, listening to them, hearing their words, watch their play, watch them when they get angry, watch them when they get upset, get worried, concerned, and so on. So, but in order to create the books I write, I still find it extremely healthy, uh, helpful, not only to cons talk with kids, and I have conversations with the kids. I don't sit them down and I don't have a tape recorder and an interview, you know. We just sit and talk about a topic. Um, but I also find it extremely helpful to consult with librarians, teachers, scientists, healthcare, mental health, child development professionals, and also with parents who often know their children the best. I do this to make sure that the nonfiction books I write have the most up-to-date, age-appropriate, medically and scientifically accurate information. And we do this every time we go back to reprint um, on my nonfiction books, every time. And if some big change came through, my publisher for those books, Candlewick Press, has said, yes, we would go back to reprint right away because kids have the right to have the latest and most accurate information. And I do this also so that the picture book stories I write reflect with honesty, and that's a very important word for me, honesty, the powerful and yet perfectly normal emotions that most young children experience day in, day out. Because I think we all in this room believe if we're not honest with our kids, then we lose them in a conversation or if they're a book that just isn't being honest in what they know in life, they turn away from the book. The books I write, the words I write, are my way of having a conversation with children. And they include, you know, by what I choose to write, they include the values that I have. Um, so they are my way of having a conversation with children about staying healthy. And as I said earlier, that includes their physical and their emotional health, which is we all, everyone in this room, we all know are so interconnected. I've been told that the books I write, and this is all anecdotal, spark many questions from children. And it's true for many children's book authors, so I'm really speaking for all of us as a gang together. So it's not just my books. So they often lead to conversations between a child and a parent or caregiver or another trusted adult in that child's life. And that these books that I'm talking about this morning, and I not only provide access to information for a child, but also for that child's parents. Information that kids need and have a right, and I say that really loud, have a right to have, um, so that they are able to stay healthy and eventually make healthy decisions for themselves, not only for themselves, but for their friends. Or that a picture book story I write sparks a responsive chord, and this is what I hope for, in a child that might help that child stay emotionally healthy and reaffirm that the strong feelings they have, and I write about in different books uh, all of these feelings, from love to anger to joy to fear, jealousy, sadness, loss, yes, even hate, are legitimate feelings and more often than not emotionally healthy feelings. And the book about hate is really a book about love when those words just pop out of your mouth and then this little child in this book, what does he want to do? He wished that moment he could stuff them all back in but it's too late. Um, onward on to some of my books as examples um, of some of the ways in which children's books can contribute to literacy, hopefully and potentially the other healthy, healthy or healthier outcomes. And um, just so you have a chance, that, as Dr. Cole said, there are books back there that if you feel like it, you may not have time today, you can take a look at and ask me any questions about. Uh, let me first note that for parents and for their kids, kids of all ages, and especially for kids and parents with low literacy school, skills, when the words in a children's book are married to the art in a book, and I can't draw for beans. I work with amazing, brilliant, wonderful illustrators. I'm so lucky. And they bring a whole new dimension, but we work very closely together. That doesn't always happen uh, for other authors. The art is another way to pass on information and can help kids and teens and parents become visually literate as well, since today so much of the information um, they and we seek is visual, and we get it through vi the visual world. Together, words and art in a book often bring both kids and adults alike 
in, uh, engage both kids and adults alike in multiple ways. Now, I don't travel everywhere with copies of my books, but I, you're going to see an image on a screen. I had 200 um, five-year-olds in a gym outside of Illinois a year ago. And I, so they, I, they couldn't see a book if I opened it. And I, what I loved about it, and you'll see this a little bit later, is that I had, they had a huge screen. And so I had kids come up and hold books. And I said, so what's the difference? And this child said, you can't hug that, looking at the screen. He said, and he went like this, you can hug a book. And that to me, and it was before, the last book that I'm going to show you, it was before I showed them the whole story, which is the last book that you'll get to see. That, I think that tells us something about books. Um, this book is a, uh, that I'm going to talk about. It's perfectly normal, and I have to remember to do two things at once. Um, the, the, this is just a range of the different kinds of books I write. But here's the cover for It's Perfectly Normal. Um, it's illustrated by the amazing friend and my dear friend, Michael Emberly. We worked hand in hand together on these books, uh, on, on this book and on many other books. But this book is now talking about the international in, in more than 30 uh, five languages and pirated in some countries. In um, country now, I can't remember, in Eastern Europe, there's, um, do you know the, photo, the photographs by Anne Geddes um, of, a, of a baby in an eggshell? That's the, that's the cover, which is total not science. <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy. I have a copy of it, so I haven't brought it back to me. So, and the art and text in every book, as I said, are, are vetted by the kinds of specialists I mentioned a minute or so ago, and if need be, are updated every time one of our books is reprinted, which happens often. You know, one such example, but there are tons of them. You know them in the pediatric world, in the medical world. You know, the HPV vaccine, and now... Um, uh, was approved for boys, then, you know, we know not enough kids are, get, are getting it. Am I correct? Uh, the pe pediatric world. Um, so that's in there, plus so much more. I began knowing that I wanted to write a comprehensive book that would answer almost, not every, but almost every question kids and teens would have about sexuality. I chose the title, It's Perfectly Normal, because the truth is that most, not all, Things about sexuality are normal, except, of course, those aberrant things such as abuse, infection, becoming pregnant when one is too young to take competent care of a child, and the list goes on. But we all know this. When a topic engages kids, they want to know about the topic, and most often, so do their parents. So here we have a book that is about sex and human biology for kids roughly 9, 10, and up. And I would posit the following. What a preteen, what, what preteen or teen does not want to read about the perfect combo, sex and science? In this case, human biology and yes, health. This is also a book about them and what they are experiencing as they begin and then go through puberty and adolescence. What preteen or teenagers does not want to read about oneself, right? A little egocentrism here. I would also posit the experience for an adult who reads such a book with or before their child reads it. I always, I give one piece of advice. I also tell everybody who I'm not. I'm not a pediatrician. I'm not a healthcare provider, children's book author. But I say one foot to parents, I say, what should I do, what should I do? I said, read it through any book on this topic, not just mine. Read it through first on your own. You'll have a temporary leg up on your child, right? <laughs> It's the only piece of advice I give. Um, so, um, so a parent who reads a book with or before their child reads this can help build literacy, not only for the kids who are reading this book, but for their parents as well, who use a book such as this to get information they may find too difficult to deal with. I, I understand that completely. It's easier for me to talk about other people's children when one talks about mine are grown up now, but. When my kids were young, it's harder to talk to your own children, your very own children, being a parent. Um, uh, so, but for parents as well, who, who use a book such as this to get information they may find too difficult to deal with or hard to access and going back to trauma or may have had a traumatic experience in their own lives where talking about health and sexuality is, it's just, 
it's too painful, it's too, it's too traumatic, and then they can go to the rest of the healthcare world to get that information passed on. We have told, been told over and over again that the words in this book and other books I have written and the art Michael created gives parents permission to talk about, and I hate this word, tough topics. I'm talked about as writing about tough topics. These are the normal everyday topics that every family deals with, and yes, many of them are, are difficult. Um, and in this case, given the words, parents, and language they can use to talk with their kids about sexual health. This means that parents are reading to and modeling reading for their kids as well. A road to literacy, I think I know what this room would say, would we call it family literacy? And it's also a way for parents and kids to become or continue to be emotionally attached to one another through a shared experience of reading the same book. And by the way, often they're not reading it together at that age. You know, the child, parent, I say to parents, um, they say, what do you do? I guess I do have more than one piece of advice. I, I say, you know, um, it's okay if your child reads it on your own. You just can say, you read it. You know, I care about you, I love you, I want you to stay healthy, you might find this interesting. And of course, the kids always say, I, I know all this stuff, I don't have to do it. And you know, parents leave it on the back of the toilet or next to the computer and it's gone. We've been told that. Um, so through a shared experience of reading the same book that can lead to talking together about so many topics, including a parent's own family values. Fostering this kind of attachment between par a parent and one's child certainly seems to me to be an added positive literacy outcome. Our children's book librarians and teachers and daycare providers and so many more I've probably not listed also provide this day in day out by having my books but not just mine and others in their classrooms as Bob said, if they can afford it, get to get them, uh, in their collections and on open shelving, not in a hidden shelf under lock and key that the librarian keeps up, up on top. So, um, and, and accessible to kids. So, here we go. Um, here are some images from the recently completed um, 20th anniversary edition. And I chose these, I could have chosen a million. So, let's see. So, this is from the first chapter called What is Sex? Okay? Yes, these are cartoon characters. Um, <laughs> I had a boy and a girl, and then I couldn't use a boy and a girl because it would mean girls would think one thing, boys would think others, and uh, now all the stuff about gender, I mean, it gets just very complicated. So they might not know who the bird and bee are. Bird, the kid who wants to know everything, asks every question, can't stop. The bee thinks it's all gross and disgusting, except gets fascinated by the science. I, I was more the bee than the bird. So here's just a little text from there. This, this is the opening. Sex is about a lot of things, bodies growing up, families, babies, love, caring, curiosity, feelings, respect, responsibility, biology, and health. There are times when sickness and danger can become part of sex too. Most kids wonder about and have lots of questions about sex. It's also perfectly normal to want to know about sex. You may wonder why it's a good idea to learn some facts about bodies, about growing up, about sex, and about sexual health. It's important because these facts can help you stay healthy, take good care of yourself, and make good decisions about yourself as you are growing up and for the rest of your life. Besides, learning about these things can be fascinating and fun. So on to, this was a, a change in the, uh, in the, in the um, chapter on um, straight, gay, trans, uh, bisexual, LBGT. And um, this is just new art that, that was done. Um, and here's some text. Many people use the term LGBT, these initials, L for lesbian, G for gay, B for bisexual, and T for transgender, are a way of referring to people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And then I give a definition of transgender, which I'm not gonna go into now, I'm not, not, I mean, I'm happy to, but we need to move on. And, um, uh, it then goes on to the end of that chapter to say, if a person has any questions, thoughts, or concerns about his or her sexual feelings or gender, talking to someone you know and trust, a parent, relative, therapist, doctor, nurse, teacher, or clergy member can be helpful. 
No matter what some people may think, it's always important for every person to remember and treat all people with respect. And it's important to know that a person's daily life, making a home, having friends and fun, working, being in love, being single, being a partner, being married, raising children, is mostly the same, whether he or she is straight, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Okay. Um, whoops. Yeah, okay. This, um, five years ago, put in a chapter of, began to, about the Internet. Absolutely critical. The chapter has become larger and larger. And um, Michael, Michael and I work out what, I can't draw, as I said, but we work out what we want the image to be, and then he does his brilliant work. Once your words are on the Internet, they are there forever, and you cannot get these words back. Others whom you do not want to see these words may end up seeing them. There is no way to guarantee what you will have sent will be private. And think about the emotional implications. And if you say online that someone is fat or skinny or sexy or ugly or beautiful or handsome, uh, what you have said is never really private once those words are in the Internet. Saying, and here we're talking about the emotional health of kids, saying something mean or bullying someone or spreading any kind of gossip, even sexy gossip, or or about another person can make that person feel really crummy and can hurt that person's feelings. When someone does this online by texting, posting, or emailing, it is called cyberbullying. Bullying. To cyberbully means to mistreat another person. Cyberbullying means mistreating another person online. To bully means to mistreat. Cyberbullying means doing it online. And then um, here's just uh, another way to get information across. And we certainly want to pass this on to kids. Th these, these are things that were in the book, myths that I'm told kids still think, right? Here's a way to talk about that you need a condom for protection, right? And it's a smart thing to do. So to call kids smart, if you do this, this is, this is smart, something you can do. Um, Oh, okay. Um, this is where they fit. I think boys, <laughs> men, <laughs> as well as women and girls need to know this. Sometimes people don't know it. Um, and this is just one piece of contraception here. And then this is what our house looked like. I now have our grandmother. And um, this is the last chapter called Staying Healthy, Responsible Choices. And I couldn't write this without saying, without ending like this. Everyone makes mistakes and has bad judgment once in a while. I didn't want kids to think that, you know, I am, through the words that I write, saying, you know, you'd have to do this and this and this. I, I don't want to ask the audience about what mistakes you may have made during those years. We won't do that. And, and you probably will too, but most of the time you can and will make responsible choices, ones that are good for you, right for you, and healthy for you and your friends. So that's, it's perfectly normal. Okay, on to, um, on to some of my, um, uh, here's a quote I just want to, I want to, uh, Posit. And by the way, I've done books that now go down to three to five year olds on this topic. One called Who Has What? Naming All the Parts of the Body. Not just that wonderful song, we all love it, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, but it seems to me maybe some parts are left out. <laughs> <laughs> and, to, and to kids, too. They know at a very young age. Well, they know immediately, <laughs> almost, right? <laughs> right, infants. Uh, let's, let's, let's get real here. So here's a quote from Dr. Alicia Lieberman, a gifted clinical psychologist at UCSF, in a book of hers called, I think it's The Emotional Life of a Toddler, about words, young children, um, and, and about young children. And I quote, when a parent is able to translate, and she says the infants and toddlers, and I have the privilege of knowing Alicia, um, and I talked to her about this. I said, how about children of all ages are able to translate the words of children of all ages are able to translate uh, children of all ages and experiences into words of understanding. This helps contain the child's negative feelings and makes them bearable. In this sense, this is her quote, 
Talking can represent relief from amorphous feelings because it puts some order into chaos. I find these words to put order into chaos central to my writing um, for children, and in particular writing about the emotional life of children. I feel that children's books can provide those words, words that can help to ameliorate the perfectly normal and terrifying feelings that children often have, and for most children, can help make fearful feelings bearable, including the traumas that we talked about. And here, uh, Robert, I want to ask you, it's OK to use R-O-A-R, and would Mayor Tom Menino of Boston, the late wonderful mayor of, of Boston. <laughs> So here's a little bit from the incredible illustrator, if you don't know his work, Chris Rushka. He's a joy to work with. So here we go, I think. When lions roar and monkeys screech, when daddies yell, when mommies holler. There's a lot left out of here, uh, of the pages, of the spreads. And Chris understood that these parents were not yelling at the child. As parents, you yell, and it's scary to hear a child a parent out of control. When daddy's yell, when mommy's holler, the scary is near, the scary is here. So I sit right down, shut my eyes tight. Go away, I say, scary, go away. And then the quiet is back. A flower blooms, an ant crawls by. A mommy sings, a daddy dances. The scary is gone, and I go on my way. Chris is brilliant. Others, Nadine Bernard Westcott. Um, so I wanted to do a book on healthy eating and nutrition. And um, this is, you know, meet Gus and Nellie, and their, their, their fam parents, I hope, are in here. This fall, here's another initiative some of you may or may not know about. Maybe you do. Um, first book, and the Mario Batali Foundation. He's the famous, you know, New York City chef. But I think in Tokyo, too, all over launched their Healthy Kids collection. And What's So Yummy was one of eight wonderful books uh, for young children on healthy eating and exercise. And It's Perfectly Normal, I'm proud to say, was one of them. Um, and they did that as their way of ensuring that all children are well-read, well-fed, and well-cared for, and to show kids the importance of healthy eating and nutrition. I'm just going to show you a little bit on sugar. I got a lot of help. Um, our wonderful people over in Congress, um, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Congressman Rosa DeLauro um, on the Agriculture Committee, it was, it was chair, and now I forget when you're not a uh, ranking member now of the Agriculture Committee, um, put me together with, uh, consulted on this book, we talked about sugar, but also so did so many other. It's fun to eat a sweet like ice cream or cookie or a piece of cake, pie or candy. Most sweets have a lot of sugar in them. But too much sugar is not good for your teeth or the rest of your body. Still, it's okay to eat some sweets sometimes, but not too many and not too often. And eating a sweet is almost always a special treat on birthdays and holidays. Again, don't, I don't want to put the shame and guilt there. And there's Gus. These cookies are done. Let's try one. There's Nellie. These chocolate chip cookies are so yummy. It's time to pack them up for our picnic. And oh, why is this not good? Okay. And there they are in, on their picnic. And it says, fruits and juices also have sugar in them. A lot of fruit drinks and soda even have more sugar added. They have too much sugar in them. So it's better for your body to eat a piece of fruit and drink water than have a drink or soda. And there's a whole range of, of every issue, water, you know, everything, allergies. Uh, you got it in this book. And here is. Um, my latest book, which is coming out, uh, again with Nadine, which is coming out uh, uh, in two, a week, a week. And I, I wanted to thank Ellen O again, creator of We Need Diverse Books, for opening up the critical dialogue about children's book and diversity and also the publishing world, the children's publishing world. They are doing a really fine job, but we, we're working on all of us of getting more people in the publishing industry who are people of color, and therefore more sensitivity of the need for books that shows all of us and what America really looks like. Michael Emberley and I am proud to say did that. And people stand up and say thank you, and, and, and we don't know what to say. We say, you know, it's just what America looks like. It's who we are. Here we are with the title. 
So um, this is Gus and Nelly again. And, um, and I actually sold this book way before We Need Diverse Books began. People say, and that was fine, you know, you, you did it because of We Need Diverse Books. But I applaud so much what they are doing because children need to find themselves, not just in the words, but in the images. And it's, it's kids of color, and as Libby said, all of our kids uh, need to find them. So um, because it has to do with our kids' emotional health big time, to find themselves, to validate them, and that you count, you matter. And here's, um, and I take on what some people would call tough issues. Uh, I, take about, I talk about um, how you talk to each other. How a person walks or talks, or the clothes a person wears, or the color or shade of their skin, hair, or eyes, can't tell you what a person is really like. These books are for threes, fours, fives, six, and sevens. It's a big range. The holidays a person celebrates, or the people in a person's family, or the food a person eats, can't tell you what a person is really like. That person may be a lot like you in some ways and different from you in other ways. You may have freckles, another person may not. That person may speak Spanish, you may not. You may use crutches or a wheelchair, another person may not. That person may like to sing, you may like to tell jokes, or both of you may wear orange sneakers. You can see if you can find two sets of orange sneakers here, or have the same backpack, see if you can find that, or have brown eyes or curly hair. And then we spend weeks on end. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this, is, this is published by uh, Candlewick Press, as are the books on sexual health and what's so yummy. Um, we spent ages just looking at the diversity in this art, which we did with It's Perfectly Normal. And we have people of everywhere look at it and say, you know, do we leave anybody out? When you meet another kid for the first time, you may want to play with that person right away, or you may not want to because he or she is someone you've never met or seen before. You may feel curious or even shy or nervous or surprised or a little bit afraid of someone you don't know yet or who looks different from you. Hey, Gus. Hey, I'm Gus. This jogger is so cool. Uh, this juggler is so cool. And if I go back just to this one, uh, uh, Nellie's saying, all I know about someone new is what they look like. And Gus says, you may not even know if strawberry ice cream is their favorite ice cream or chocolate. If you do play with each other, you might find out that something he or she thinks is scary or something you think is scary. Or you might find out that something you think is silly is something he or she thinks is silly. And before it know, know it, you're talking, laughing, and having fun with each other. It's possible. <laughs> it often happens. Let's... Uh, Bob, you were talking about the positive outcomes, the resilience, but the, how kids see it. So I really, I did a movie years ago um, on, the, on the, fir, the siblings of the first Head Start, one of the first Head Start programs in the nation, a film. And um, we certainly t talked about these issues back then. And here we are still needing to talk about them today in this nation. And I think particularly... Um, with what's going on in our nation right now, um, issues of race and diversity, our young children feel it greatly. And so if this is a way to talk, maybe it'll help some families. That's my hope. So last book, uh, published by Scholastic. Uh, Karen here from Scholastic. Shout out to Scholastic. Uh, and... and uh, uh, um, uh, when Lion's Roar was also published by Scholastic with my wonderful editor, Ken Geist. So um, here's a story about a pediatrician. Uh, many of you may know as the medical director of Reach Out and Read. Is that still Perry Kloss's director? Perry Kloss. And a breakfast we had together several years ago. I have consulted with Perry on many, many of my books. And... Um, she would have been here today, but she's out of the country if she could have been, so she sends her best. And Bob, I want to give a shout out to Reach Out and Read uh, as one of the founders and keeping it going. And Brian Gallagher, who's here from Reach Out and Read. At that breakfast, Perry asked me if Michael Emberley and I would be willing to create a new poster for Reach Out and Read, and we can go right to it.
just sticking with this slide, I really take on all the issues about diversity, and I like books that are a challenge, because, but I think they're books that, that um, I, I would have conversations my kids are grown up with now. Now, but I would have had I did have conversations with my kids about, and uh, as a grandparent, I can know what's happening today. So here we go. Uh, if we would do a poster for Reach Out and Read, so Perry and I were having breakfast, which is the way we mostly meet, talk about nutrition. She also helped with what's so yummy, uh, and um, uh, I said, "Well, wait a minute." Why, let's do a book. <laughs> Let me do a book. And then I said, I don't want to do a book by committee. I want to do an actual trade book, meaning that it would be a book that I would do anyway that would go into a bookstore. But I will consult with people on this, and this is a different kind of take. So, um, so I said, um, and I came up with an idea at the table. I often, often come up with an idea, but then, oh my God, you sign a contract and you have to write it, and then it's really. So, I, so my immediate resp response was, why not a book? It could be about a young child who loses its favorite book of the moment and can't go to sleep without it. I'd had that happen, my kids had that happen, and since this book came out, I would say nine or 10 librarians have said to me, uh, have had librarians at libraries say, you know, I, I get to work at whatever time I get to work, we open the door and there are three or four people maybe once a month, you know, adults come in and say, I was just reading X and I can't find the book and do it and they're totally panicked. So it's not just kids, okay? And so um, the book you love, 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 love the most, just at that moment, right? Because the next book you love is coming up soon. Before slipping into bed and you have to have it, it's gone and panic sets in. Maybe a bear ate it, you know, maybe that's what happened. I knew that Michael Emberley would draw the most marvelous bear, and he would say yes. And luckily Scholastic published it. Uh, Perry and I spoke the other day about this book, and we talked about how, how picture books can not only help kids become literate, but as we've talked about, contributed to even more kinds of healthy outcomes. Just for starters, and maybe a bear ate it, feeling that it's okay to be very upset over a loss. I mean, I wrote a book called Goodbye Mousy, which is a different loss about a book that, that about a, a, a child who discovers his mouse is dead. He doesn't know it, he thinks it's just sleeping. But it's about death. It's not about dying, it's about death. It's a picture book for young children, it's over there. Learning the bedtime routines, such as getting into bed with a book. Uh, and other bedtime routines are, is a good thing, and that sleep matters. Giving a child a, book into a sense of agency, the child in this book, this character right here, is, um, you know, the, the child in this book uh, really does something about finding its book, so I can do that too. Figuring out answers to such questions as, who did it? Do you think a bear ate it? Which can provide the cognitive back and forth between a parent and child. Giving, new ch giving children new vocabulary and a way to understand a story, to riff on the story just read to them and then make up their own stories or I'll go on to another book, to ask questions, to fantasize and as all of you have spoken about so eloquently, to help parents have access to information in kids. So in the end, books matter, I'm finishing up here, to children even more than we ever imagined because they can be part of many healthy outcomes for children and children's families. And sharing a book with a child can help them become literate. And I just wanted to say thank you, um, Sandra Hasek, for your JAMA article on literacy and health. It's a must read. Sandra Hasek and Perry are two of the, the co-authors. It was really important if you haven't read it. I'm going to end by asking you to pretend that right now you're about to hop into bed and maybe my talk is making you sleepy and that you can't find your favorite book of the moment, the book you love so much. Well, here's a story about that that I would love to read to you now. This will take about one minute. Maybe a bear ate it. Is it, is it moving? Okay, so there we go.
You can read it. Michael called me up and he said, what can we do about this whale? And I said, well, what's, what's the whale, you know, swallowed? <laughs> but he could draw it. I sure couldn't. And terrible things, really awful. All these ridiculous places that they would have these. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Time to uh, stretch it again to try to stay close to our schedule. Uh, we're very pleased to have some visitors this afternoon, uh, some students who are interested in our, the topic, and um, we also have uh, part of the panels are still meeting, getting ready for this afternoon's performance, but we're going to start and this was the special brief presentation I told you about where we are taking a look at our overall topic, which is literacy and health and how they relate or should relate. And uh, we're taking another look at a literacy health public policy project of immediate concern, and that is the literacy in the Ebola crisis. And we're fortunate to have a speaker from the World Bank, one of our board members, uh, Mike Trucano is uh, from the World Bank, but Mike, having a World Bank member as a panel, as a member of our advisory board, has great advantages, but a disadvantage is he's traveling a good deal of the time. And uh, he has asked, kindly asked, and Calliope Ozzy Huck, who is a senior education specialist at the World Bank, has agreed to come and talk to us a little bit and uh, about literacy in the Ebola crisis. So let's give her a little encouragement. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. I promise I'd only talk for just about 10 minutes. I'm just going to set myself the timer. Um, I'm Callie, and I uh, cover the education portfolio for the World Bank. Um, I work on a number of countries, mostly throughout West and Central Africa, but I specifically cover the Sierra Leone portfolio, uh, which is the one um, in question here. So to delve right into it, I just wanted to give you some background on Sierra Leone. It's nothing that you don't know, because it's been in the news quite often the past year or so. Small country, population of six million. About 42% of people uh, are literate, so, um, and that number, sorry, I meant as high as 75 are not literate in rural areas, mostly uh, women. So um, their out of school rate, which means kids who are still growing up not literate, uh, is about 25% of school age children. And their infant mortality rate, which, um, given the subject uh, of today is relevant, is about 117 in 1,000. Um, in terms of human development impact, Sierra Leone has immense <laughs> challenges. Um, it's ranked 181st out of 188 countries in terms of human development, which means social services, health, education, social protection are very, very weak. They don't have the systems for it, and they don't have the infrastructure for it. Um, so when Ebola hit in, um, I, I think it arrived in Sierra Leone in April of 2014 and steadily climbed up. Initially, it covered the uh, districts, if you will, that bordered with Guinea and Liberia, and then it spread. And once it spread to the capital of Freetown, then it just became an immense 
uh, problem and it just climbed up and up and um, as you know. So the havoc that it um, unleashed is on the population. 14,000 people were infected and about 4,000 death, I think just um, under that. Uh, it fared a little better than Guinea where you know the death rate was much higher in Guinea compared to the infection. On the health systems, I just wanted to give you this fact. It's a country that already had weak systems. Uh, six million people, 188 specialized doctors, and Ebola took 12 of them. Um, to give you an anecdote, what that did for the um, medical school, they only have one medical school in Freetown, has basically stopped it. Uh, the doctors were also lecturers, so not only did you lose practitioners, but now you're losing a generation of future practitioners. So on the economy, the GDP growth was cut by 50%. I won't bore you with that because it was obvious. Everything came to a halt. Um, they were embarking on a huge economic strategy. Iron ore was doing well, so they had invested a lot in mining. They had already had diamond mining, and the sector basically collapsed. Uh, two of the three major companies packed up and went home, so people were left without jobs and without any prospect for one. On school children, uh, for health reasons, schools were supposed to start in September of 2014, and they did not, and they remained closed for eight months. Um, so children were left idle, and as a, a sort of a side, um, element of that teenage pregnancy skyrocketed. And, what, and this is something that we as partners didn't know either, that a lot of young girls actually are in school and are de facto protected from all these social issues. It became an issue for these uh, young women who were at home, no income, no sort of prospect of anything, and uh, things became really, really challenging. So I'll talk about why that became an issue after school reopened um, at the end of this. And then on physical infrastructure, there just aren't roads, so it was really difficult to get out to people and to get the messages out to people about what needs to be done in order to um, um, sort of combat the um, EVD. So how the government responded, there was a national curfew that lasted for, for months. You basically were not supposed to be out after 7 or 8 p.m. Uh, restaurants were not supposed to be open unless you were a hotel and, and um, therefore you needed to feed your guests. Traditional burial practices were eventually outlawed and essentially, the, initially they were discouraged and then they basically said no. So if anyone passed away, you couldn't touch them, you had to call and ambulances would come and they would just take the body. And it was regardless of how they passed away, they fell off the roof, they, you know, it didn't matter. And you would then wait for a call from someone to say this body is cleared and you can now bury it. Or oftentimes they would just bury it and give you a name and said we'll deal with it later. And that's what we're dealing with now, is a lot of tribes have very unique burial um, traditions and they have to get the bodies back in order to um, rebury them, essentially. So it's a matter of figuring out what needs to be done there. Um, there was intense collaboration among partners in government. I think unique to the situation was that there weren't a lot of people in Sierra Leone to begin with. So uh, there were only four or five donor partners that were already engaged. So we all kind of worked together. The funds that were provided funded uh, medical supplies, that's obvious, food to quarantined communities, medical staff, and local health workers' salaries. And because UNICEF was on the ground, UNICEF took the lead in the implementation and the coordination and the World Bank and DFID and others, basically we worked through them and with the, with the government. So overcoming the crisis given the lack of literacy in the country, we used radios. We uh, procured radios, used radio messages, used television messages. We hosted talk shows, produced uh, jingles, anything that would get the message out. Uh, this, some of you may know this, but your cell phone in other countries, actually all other countries except the U.S., has a radio transmitter. So we were able to get out to people with radio messages as long as they had a cell phone. We also bought 
um, as donor partners about 80,000 radios for households, that, mostly for the rural areas. Uh, we also broadcast lessons, and in those lessons, it was the core subjects as well as psychosocial messages about Ebola about five times a week. And these lessons ran sort of on the hour because the government wanted the kids to get as much education as they could during the closure. So they initially had said, you will still be required fit to, to complete the academic year. Um, we also use image-based media campaigns. I think you've seen these on the internet. So instead of saying, if you have symptoms of vomiting or diarrhea, we actually had cartoon images of someone vomiting in the diarrhea. And that was the most effective way to get the message out, especially to uh, those who couldn't, couldn't read. Uh, we used the communities. There was a lot of social mobilization. So basically, it was the trickle-down effect. We use the Paramount Chiefs. It's a country of 149 chiefdoms. So all of them came to town. And these are the elected officials, so to speak, but also traditional leaders. So they can read and write. And they came to Freetown. And there were workshops that they um, attended. And then they would go back and carry out community mobilization. Um, and so that when that seemed to be only somewhat successful, and it was in December, I believe, and the numbers were still climbing. The government took a drastic measure of doing this os to os Ebola talk. Um, it's basically house to house Ebola talk. And there was a national quarantine where everyone was to stay home for three days unless you were one of the volunteers that were moving. We used a lot of youth and they went house to house with two objectives. One was to identify if you had sick people in the house and bring them to treatment centers. And two was to communicate the message about um, Ebola. And this, I think, was the most effective way to do it. It was a lot of manpower, uh, and it was drastic, but it seemed to then work because the numbers began to go down after that. There was diligent contact tracing. So as soon as someone was discovered to be ill, a team of contact tracers would go out into the community. The community would have to be quarantined. So one of the major investments that the donor partners did was food for these communities. Uh, I think you heard a lot of, and well, at least we heard a lot of anecdotal stories about people trying to escape simply because they'd run out of food and they needed to, to get out. Um, so with these contact tracers, there's also a lot of messaging that was involved. And then there was a dedicated hotline that was involved. If you suspect someone of um, having Ebola or being sick, uh, or if someone dies, there, there were hotlines. And the hotlines were well-funded and well sort of oiled to move very fast. Um, so, coming, sorry. so coming out of the Ebola crisis, because education is my background, so I can speak to you about what we did to reopen schools, one of the major concerns was the safety of children. Given the infrastructure and the fact that children share everything in the classroom, including seats, and you have four or five kids sitting to a seat, and Ebola is transmitted by touch, all you needed was for one kid to transmit it to potentially an entire classroom. So there were working groups established that focused on everything. There were protocols that were developed. Uh, and received certification from WHO. And then we implemented a system of distributing wash buckets. Uh, I don't know if I have, somewhere in here I have the photo of it. It's basically a plastic bucket with a little spigot at the bottom that spews into another bucket. And you put some, a little bleach and soap in it. And every child had to wash their hands coming into school. We also procured tons and tons of thermometers. Uh, every school received at least two thermometers per 50 kids, and then for every other 50 kids, I think an additional thermometer. And kids had to be tested um, every morning. Communities, not the schools, were tasked with reporting that a school was ready to be opened. So we used social mobilization, and if a community felt that school was not cleaned and was not open, they would report it back to the ministry, and then we, uh, we would uh, engage the um, sort of Ministry of Health to make sure that it gets clean, because the Ministry of Health took care of cleaning the schools. Um, we also used the radio to inform parents that schools are safe to reopen, that they are being sanitized, that um, 
their children will be ensured safety, that there are measures in place. And then we trained at least one teacher per school to um, understand how to deal with Ebola. Um, the reason I wanted to put, to say that we covered psychosocial and technical areas is we wanted to make sure that if a child is found to just have a fever, that they're not stigmatized. It's very likely they would just be put out in the field in the sun until their parents came. So we wanted to make it understood that there's a lot of compassion that was necessary given what was going on. Okay, what we did not do, uh, we did not evacuate our international staff and that helped significantly because we still had the manpower. On the bank side, we did not require that staff travel there if they did not feel comfortable, but if they were able to, everyone was coming and going regularly. We did not establish isolation rooms in schools. Um, and this was important because as we went to reopen schools, the government received 4,000 mattresses um, that they wanted to put in schools. And the decision in the end was that you can't you can't build mini treatment centers in these um, schools and you, you can't give the impression that this can be taken care of at the school level. Someone who is suspected of having Ebola needs to come off the premises as quickly as possible. Um, we didn't open schools that had been used as holding centers uh, prior to WHO certified sanitation. This was obvious. So we need the Ministry of Health to clean it and then someone to say this is okay because there was a lot of, um, um, there was a lot more diligence than just cleaning up of, of that school. Uh, we didn't take a unisectoral approach, and this is often what happens, so I can only think about education in this case. Um, we figured out that health needs to step in, social protection, the Ministry of Youth needs to provide the, 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 the manpower, and education needs to come up with a plan and deliver information. We did not address the issue of pregnant girls from the start. Um, we knew that the pregnancies were rising and as schools uh, were announced to be reopened on April 14th, the ministry announced that pregnant girls could not return to school and they could not take the exams. And the reasoning was that they would uh, give the wrong lesson or there would be wrong role models for the other girls in schools. The donor partners and many um, felt that this was punishing the girls twice, once for getting pregnant and once for now losing out on a potentially education. Well, there was a lot of back and forth and in the end what we now have is a program for the pregnant girls and those who gave birth in the last eight months to do alternative education. And once they have their child and they can catch up, they can return to school, assuming that they've not fallen too far behind. Um, it's a reasonable kind of catch-up effort, but I think if we had dealt with it early on, this wouldn't have been um, a bigger issue now nine months down the road. And that's the extent of my presentation. I put in some pictures that you can see of the students and the wash buckets that were uh, students having their uh, temperature taken and the wash buckets. Okay, so that was 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Kali, thank you very much. Uh, this is um, insightful and interesting and brings us kind of into a different part of the subject and we appreciate it. We have to move on to try to keep up on our schedule. So I'm gonna have uh, Jeff come up and uh, bring his panel and we will get started. And give Mike our best as well. <laughs> Our chair is uh, Jeff Carter, whom uh, many of you know. Uh, Jeff has been deeply involved in all aspects of literacy, but especially adult literacy. And he is the executive director of the National Adult Education Professional Development Consortium. 
and the National Council of State Directors of Adult Education. I know him best in yet another role of his, and that is he's currently president of the National Coalition for Literacy, which is one of the Center for the Books, uh, Reading and Literacy Promotion Partners. So we've come full circle, and I'm turning it over to Jeff. Thank you, John. Um, thank you, John, and thank you, everyone, for coming out today. Um, this has been an incredibly stimulating half day so far, and I'm looking forward to the second half of the day. Uh, as John mentioned, I have several titles. If you work, I said this to someone earlier, if you work in adult literacy, you have, usually have two or three jobs. <laughs> you know, maybe a couple that pay you and several volunteer jobs at the same time. Um, I just want to sort of set this panel up. We're going to be talking about adult literacy and health during this panel. And I thought it might be helpful to just give you very briefly a, a, a sort of a review of the landscape of adult literacy in this country right now. Um, uh, many of you, I hope everyone actually, would find it shocking to know that according to the latest data we have from uh, an international survey conducted by the OECD a few years ago, they estimate that approximately 36 million adults in the United States have low literacy or math skills. Um, our federal system of adult education, and I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like, serves about 1.5 million people. And in that survey that OECD conducted, uh, they asked people, would you like to attend an adult education class? And they estimated as much as 3 million people would love to attend an adult education class but cannot access one. There isn't one where they are. Um, and that probably is just, that's probably a very undercount of the actual demand for these services. So that's the landscape that we work in. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the kinds of programs that work with adults in adult literacy. They range from community-based organizations, uh, volunteer-based organizations, faith-based organizations, uh, schools, including charter schools. Uh, and community colleges. So it's a, it's a system that a lot of people are not as familiar with as compared to K through 12 or higher education because it is so diverse and uh, many of our students, of course, um, are, they come from all kinds of different backgrounds and they're not as easily identifiable or as visible as in our other educational sectors. Um, I wanna talk briefly about why I think um, a discussion around adult literacy and health is so important in this in the context of our day today. Um, and I was, I was thinking about this as we, I was listening to the speakers this morning. You know, one of the first statistics that um, was mentioned early was this issue that, and again, talk about another staggering number, that 48% of our children are growing up in low-income households. So why, why are adults critical there? Well, educational attainment is directly correlated with earnings power. So when we educate our adults, we effectively can address the issue of children growing up in low-income situations because we empower those adults to earn more and raise their incomes. So that's one factor. Of course, the other one, parents are a critical influence on a child's literacy development. And uh, frankly, if we are uh, going to make a significant impact in terms of health outcomes as we uh, uh, look at the connections between literacy and health, we can't ignore adults. There are too many of them. As I mentioned, 36 million adults. If we put all our energy just into children, we would be disappointed by the outcomes because we would not be addressing the needs of those 36 million adults. And then lastly, uh, and this has been touched on um, a little bit, and I'm really glad to hear it, uh, I, I think we have a moral responsibility. Um, one thing that's really important to remember about a lot of adults who find themselves in this situation is that it's related to factors that have, uh, that are related to issues around inequality and historical vestiges of uh, discrimination. Uh, Robert Needleman mentioned, this is a very strange coincidence, I hadn't thought about, he mentioned how Reach Out and Read had, uh, had to change their acronym because it, it was uh, uh, being used by an organization that was protesting in Boston during the busing crisis, ROAR, I hadn't thought about that in years. I grew up in Boston, and it made me reflect. Uh, the first time I uh, got involved in adult literacy was as a tutor, and I tutored a guy who was every bit as smart as I was, every bit as engaged and curious and hardworking, probably more hardworking than I was. 
The difference between me and him is that he grew up in a city that was practicing systematic discrimination for people of color, and he did not receive an adequate education, and that's why he ended up where he was. So I mention that because I think, I think, uh, I think social justice and inequality is an important part of this discussion, and I was glad to hear some people touch on it today, and I, and I think that's something to think about as we continue the discussion. That said, I'd like to introduce my panel, my esteemed panel. Uh, to my left, um, Robert Logan is a member of the senior staff of the U.S. National Library of Medicine and a professor emeritus at the University of Missouri Columbia School of Journalism. And I'm always worried about when senior staff, I think that's the, the I'm always wary of those titles because it makes you sound old, but you're not old, Steve. <laughs> I am. Uh, well, it's... <laughs> um, to Steve's left, I'm sorry, to Robert's left, is uh, Stephen Rush, the director of the United Health Group Health Literacy Innovations Program, an enterprise-wide program to help consumers understand and use health and wellness communications, and the former director of physician engagement at United Healthcare Health Services. To his left, Michelle Erickson is the executive director of Wisconsin Literacy, which supports, develops, and advocates for literacy organizations across the state of Wisconsin. Her work with Wisconsin Literacy has focused on health literacy and ways to improve health outcomes and reduce health care costs by educating both providers and patients on more effective ways to communicate. And we're going to start with, uh, uh, with, with uh, Robert Logan. And the way we're sort of organized this is that Robert's going to give us the 10,000-foot look at this issue, and then we're going to have Steve give us the 1,000-foot issue, uh, foot perspective, and then when we get to Michelle, she's going to give us the perspective from the ground. So with that said, take it away, Robert. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, our lawyers say we have to say in public, we speak for ourselves. We don't speak for the National Institutes of Health. We don't <coughs> speak for the National Library of Medicine, and I don't speak for the De U.S. Department of Health and Human Services either. Or I also don't speak for the National Academy of Medicine Health Literacy Roundtable that Steve and I are very active in. Uh, Steve, I guess you could speak for it if you wanted to. Uh, I'm also the editor of the first book lit on comprehensive health literacy international research that I hope will be published in about 18 months. And before I go on, thank you, Dr. Sullivan, for your leadership. The National Library of Medicine would not be what it is today had you not been at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at the time you were there. Very nice to see you, as always. Uh, let's, um, this is the front entrance to the National Library of Medicine. Walk nine miles that way, and you'll get there, okay? <laughs> it, is a part, it is part of the NIH campus. Uh, look at our um, unambitious mission. That's a joke at the bottom of the page. Um, Met, NLM is, Met, is PubMed. Okay? That's all I have to say. I mean, that's what we need. <laughs> need one mean board I have to say. If you don't need, if you don't know what PubMed is, uh, quietly don't let Dr. Sullivan know that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're, also, we're also the publisher of Medline Plus, uh, something that Dr. Sullivan has been a long advocate of. Medline Plus is uh, trying to provide health information down to the level of consumer. I'm not going to show that today, but nevertheless, uh, that is, if you're not familiar with that website, all of you who are interested in those issues, go there. Please don't tell me that there aren't efforts to explain health and medicine in a broad, comprehensive scale to the American public. There are, and they've been there for about 20 years. Uh, by the way, if you go to Medline Plus, you'll see lots of links to Neem Wars. In many, in many of Medline Plus sites, we link on various issues to uh, websites that Neem Wars has. I'm going to talk briefly about one topic, how health literacy, adult health literacy differs from adult literacy and educational attainment. The second topic I, we, I've decided for, for the purpose of time to discuss during the Q&A, assuming that Jeff asked me the right question. Uh, I might uh, surprise you. Yeah, who knows? Uh, they trusted me way too much. Yes, uh, on the screen is the Calgary Charter definition of health literacy. As you read it, and I'm not going to read it for you, as you read it, remember this, that every single word you see is the most expensive real estate imaginable, okay? 
People fought over every syllable of this for months <laughs> before it was actually published in 2012. There are more than 50 definitions of health literacy. This is just one, but this is the only one I know that was done by interdisciplinary consensus of people from around the world, which is why I have it up on the screen. Here's my wonderful friend, Cece Doak, who was the pioneer of health literacy. This was taken several months ago. Cece and Len Dokes were health, adult health educators in the 1970s. And they discovered there was surprisingly little research about how to best explain health and medicine to patients. So they decided to get it, dedicate their career to professionalizing adult health literacy, health education research and practice, which they later named health literacy. They coined the term. Here are some of the Dokes' discoveries in the 1970s. First, persons with below eighth grade reading and other literacy skills rarely understood health and medical information. So, low adult educational attainment, they believed, was associated with low adult literacy. Low educational attainment and low adult literacy also were associated with less understanding of health materials and also health information seeking, which is just as important. The Dokes' other discoveries in the 1970s, that medical and health information were not presented so they could be read by a low literate person. For example, the term avoid, the term prevention alone were meaningless to most of the people that they use. If you put the word PRE, they said in front of any word, Immediately, said they argued about two-thirds of the American public have no idea what you're talking about. Just stop. Just think about that right there, <laughs> okay? Medical jargon was an obvious barrier understanding. That's just three examples. Uh, I'm sure we could come up with several hundred among us, okay? Routine medical jargon, which was well-intended, was a significant barrier to understanding. And they argued that clinical materials need to be better matched to patients' skills, something that we still very much believe. And they began planned intervention to match materials with skills. In the 1980s, after several years of, many years of practice, the Dokes hit an interesting confound that well-educated literate adults, I said well-educated literate adults and young persons, often did not understand health and medical terms either. Often, they had as little interest in learning or discovering how to seek health information as low literate persons. They concluded the association among educational attainment, literacy, and understanding of an interest in health may be one directional, which was the first time that was ever postulated. Yes, low educational attainment was associated with low adult literacy, and less understanding of health and interest in health information seeking. Yes, higher health education, educational attainment was associated with higher literacy. However, and here's the key point, higher educational attainment and higher adult literacy were not consistently associated with more understanding of health and more interest in health information seeking. And that was a jarring, mm -hmm. to this day, okay, hypothesis. The confound. <coughs> Why are the associations not bi-directional? This troubled the Dokes at first. For years they tried to explain it, and then they began to notice that it helped explain the disinformation and misinformation about vaccines, for example. This is one example among very well-educated Americans. That's the only way it could possibly explain. Then they begin to say the confound also provided insights, such as why English is second language adult learners often are helped by using health materials, while other adult learners, people who speak English well, are not helped by using health materials. Again, they couldn't explain that until they began to realize that the, what they had assumed all along was not necessarily the case. Soon, okay, the Dokes started to use the term health literacy to describe the underlying dynamics they were experiencing. In the 1990s, the Dokes argued, as a dynamic of personal learning and constructive interventions, adult health literacy might be independent of adult literacy. They began to argue for the first time that we need to assess health literacy on its own merits, on its own terms, as an independent research construct and intervene with strategies to impact literacy as well as strategies to impact health literacy. Not do one or the other, but do both. 
21st century research, which is now abundant, suggests very strongly that the DOCSIS observations are correct. Health literacy is apparently an independent dynamic, at least the evidence strongly suggests it, that should be assessed separately from educational attainment and adult literacy. Health literacy is an independent research construct that's separate from adult literacy and educational attainment. While health literacy and literacy are similar and they're highly complementary, there are times when they diverge from each other and they can be different. The National Assessment of Adult Literacy and Other Findings confirmed about in 2003, it is important to respect some inconsistencies and think in terms of dual strategies, work on both literacy and health literacy simultaneously. Here's some current health literacy research issues. They're less about acknowledging the differences between literacy and health literacy. I think that era is basically over now. And mo most people instead focus on health literacy and health outcomes, health literacy and the utilization of the healthcare delivery system. And briefly here are a few findings. Some of the clinical benefits that have been linked to health literacy interventions include reduced mortality, improved patient and adherence to medical instructions, and overall patient safety. The health literacy interventions can therapeutically assist patients with cancer, diabetes, asthma, hypertension, and at least 11 other diseases. The specific health administrative benefits linked to health literacy interventions, and again, these are all, I'm just making it, trying to, a lot of research, more than 60 papers in a few moments. Yeah. Uh, some of the health administrative benefits linked to health literacy interventions include improved diabetes, patient self-management skills, much more use of preventive services, as well as a, as a significant reduction in hospitalization and re-hospitalization rates. As Dr. Sullivan knows well, the latter has a direct impact on the cost of health care. Here's a glimpse of why it is an absolutely fascinating time to be in health literacy research or practice. Health literacy interests cover the waterfront. They include all the various stakeholders you see on the screen. The interest is well outside the United States. There's very active health literacy research now in several other countries here, are four prominent ones on the screen. Michelle and I will be in a conference call on I think it's a week from Tuesday, where there'd be at least six or seven other people from around the world on, and that's normal. <laughs> Health literacy roundtable of the National Academies actively takes a leadership role in this area and has uh, for now for 11 years. Here's their website. Sorry, it's so long. And I'm afraid, to, I'm embarrassed to tell you they're about to change it. <laughs> <laughs> they changed it yesterday. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> You can follow the field's progress, of course, in PubMed or MedlinePlus.gov. Here are three resources to cover the field. The first is how you cover it in PubMed. We have a special curated area that does nothing but provide articles, excuse me, referee journal publications about health literacy. Here's Medline Plus's health literacy page, which for those of you who are not a healthcare practitioner, I encourage you to go to. It'll make much more sense to you. And finally, there's an excellent resource, which we have nothing to do with at Harvard University, about resources. And the reason I put that one on the screen among many is that this particular one specializes in health literacy and adult education. I went through my references really fast, but, that doesn't, but I certainly have them. And uh, I thank you for your attention. So I'm Steve Rush, and I'm the director of the Health Literacy Innovations Program at United Health Group. And you'd say, why is a health insurer uh, interested in health literacy? And in the next few minutes, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, I don't want to let out of the bag. Let me just ask a question. Um, how many of you have been faced with decisions about uh, buying insurance or using health care? How many of you know what your certificate of coverage says about getting a ride to the hospital uh, in an ambulance? 
<laughs> oh. How many of you truly understand everything your physician has told you? Guess what? We all have <laughs> low health literacy. Low health literacy, we've talked about it, and it is really interesting. Uh, people have talked about health literacy last night. Dr. Bailey talked about it. This morning we've talked about it. And I wanted to share with you that health literacy is not a trait. It's a state. It changes. And I'd like to thank the Library of Congress and the Moors for inviting me here today to talk a little bit about that. This morning, uh, Dr. Needleman talked about bookkeeping and basically talked about downstream costs. And I'll be addressing that in a minute, but what I wanted to tell you was that health literacy at United Health Group really began about seven years ago. And uh, Dr. Migliori, who's shown here, is really a very big proponent of that. At United Health Group, we have the Just Plain Clear Communications Program where we're attempting to create health communications that are simple, accessible, understandable, and actionable. So why is health literacy important? We've talked about it a little bit. We all know that health literacy is, is transient, and people have difficulty understanding and using health care. And in today's healthcare environment, more and more responsibility for utilization of healthcare is being put on the consumer, the patient. And it's difficult. It's really difficult to understand all the intricacies. We've talked a little bit about people with low health literacy having a greater risk of hospitalization. The cost to the healthcare system using 2005, 2004 data was up to $238 billion a year. I think it's more upwards of $240 billion a year. And we do know, and Rob just talked about it, that health literacy is related to medication and treatment errors and medication adherence and ability to uh, follow treatment recommendations health literacy by the numbers. Um, it's a minimum of 77 million adults in the United States have, don't have basic literacy skills. Um, from, uh, from a payer standpoint, the average medical cost per year of a person with higher health literacy is about $3,000, while the average cost per year of a person with lower health literacy is about $13,000. That's a difference of about 433%. We did some research and we found that taking a look at people utilizing health care within a low literacy community versus a higher health literacy community, the difference was amazing in terms of unavoidable admissions to the hospital, utilization of uh, the emergency room, following treatment recommendations. The average reading level for a lot of health insurance documents is, was at about 10th grade. 10th grade, wow. We have states that are requiring health information to be written at the third grade level. Most states require people to have written communications at about the sixth grade level. And realistically, nav choosing and using healthcare is really very difficult. The Patient Protection Affordable Care Act defined health literacy in the law and it's been uh, talked about here, but people in the health literacy community talk about that definition as not being quite enough. Because just because you make a decision doesn't mean you're actually able to take that decision and then actually use it, to put it into action. I like the definition that Rima Rudd, one of our colleagues, talks about, and she says that health literacy happens 
when anyone on the receiving end of health communications and anyone on the giving end of health communications truly understand one another. There's no blame here. Early health literacy work blamed the person. You have low health literacy, you're dumb, you don't know what you're doing. No, it's an equal bi-directional responsibility. So we at United Health Group feel that health communication should be simple, accessible, understandable, and actionable. So why is there a health uh, focus on health literacy other than all of the costs? Well, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act 2010 defined health literacy in the law for the first time. Mm -hmm. And then there followed federal rules and guidelines, and now accrediting organizations and quality organizations are demanding that health literacy be a component of the way people in the health community do business. State agencies are mandating um, that literacy levels be put into play. Customers, people who are paying for health insurance, CMS, um, and larger corporations, even employer, uh, other employers are saying, you got to give information to our employees that are simple, accessible, understandable, and actionable. And consumers and members say it too, and there's that gentleman in the lower right-hand corner. And most of all, Providing information that's simple, accessible, understandable, and actionable is the right thing to do. So why is there, um, what's the linkage from health literacy to health outcomes? You'll notice that reading isn't there, but that's something that, uh, is, that I point out, because reading is in fact uh, a very important segments, but so is race and ethnicity and language and age, vision, hearing, verbal ability, memory, and reasoning. And one of the things that I did when I was talking to one of our leaders was to say, hey, look at this over here. And he said, I didn't know that vision and hearing and verbal ability and reasoning was in there. Oh, yeah, it is. But take a look at how health literacy impacts how people choose and use health care. Take a look at how health literacy is important for that uh, provider, health care provider and patient interaction. And if people can't understand, how is it that they're supposed to be able to take care of themselves? The many, many, today's healthcare environment really focuses to a, to a greater extent than in the past on chronic care conditions, diabetes, heart, asthma, other pulmonary problems. The day-to-day -day care that needs to be done for that person <coughs> is provided by that person or their personal caregivers. 95% of all chronic care on a daily basis is provided by that person or their personal caregiver, 95%. So Kathleen Sebelius at one point said, if people can't understand, they can't decide and they can't do. And that's, the, that's what's shown here. There are a number of factors affecting health literacy. One is the general literacy level of the people, experience with the healthcare system, physical and psychological factors, culture and language, aging, complexity of information. And my God, I can tell you that Health insurance information and health care information is so complex. I wish I could say that I had a full head of brown hair before I started working in an insurance <laughs> company, but I can't do that. Learning style is really important and how information is communicated. So reading is really important. So is listening and math. Math is really becoming a very important factor. Um, speaking, writing, thinking, healthcare problem solving, health literacy, think healthcare problem solving, and remembering. And if these, these skills need to be put into consideration to think about what a member does or a patient does in the healthcare system. So here's some startling facts. 
$240 billion a year in medical costs are associated with low health literacy. Recent research showed that four in 10 uninsured don't know basic health insurance terms. Wow. Yet these people are going to be responsible for medical spend. And fewer than four in 10 understand complex coverage concepts. This is an amazing fact. Millennials may, have, may be the best educated, but they have huge gaps in their care. And choosing and using health insurance creates cognitive burden. But the other piece to that is many people overestimate their knowledge of health insurance. Three out of four people say, hey, I can do this, I know this stuff, but when push came to shove, only one in five really demonstrated the capability. So what does that mean in terms of literacy? So Jeff talked about PIAA, and that was the International Program for the Assessment of Adult Literacy. Three components to it, understanding written communication, working with numbers, and then using computers for <clears throat> healthcare problem solving. Take a look at where the US is relative to 24 or 20 countries. What does that mean for literacy? US is tied for seventh lowest of 24 countries. We're third from the bottom in math skills and we're third from the bottom of 20 countries when it comes to using computers for problem solving. Very interesting stuff. What's the implication? Health communications and learning style. Um, we did some research and we found that in the general population of, of uh, 18 to uh, 49 uh, to 64 years old, 60% uh, were visual learners, 60% uh, were visual learners, 15% were auditory learners, and 25% mixed. Now take a look at what happens when people age. It's really different. So that's, I'd like you to think about cognitive burden. Cognitive burden has two parts. One is the burden of illness. Boy, there's a lot of stuff that you have to remember when you're a diabetic and it changes the way you live your life. And then there's the burden of treatment. And when I work with our telephonic pharmacists, training them to communicate in simple, understandable, and actionable ways, I say, to what extent are you adding to the burden of treatment when you use terms like, um, Med you, there's a uh, we have a medical class or a medication class called angiotensin beta blah, 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 and they go, hmm. <laughs> I was just put on a medication and I could barely say it. Right. So, um, health literacy, another look. I really like this cognitive burden piece on the left-hand side. Basically, it says, when you load my brain up with confusing choices, ambiguous phrases, on parsonable sentences, you impose a cognitive burden. You make me think, and not about your subject, you are making me translate, transform, interpret what you say, and this distracts me from your point. And then there's always George Bernard Shaw with his uh, statement about uh, the illusion that communication has taken place. I want to share with you a resource that we've created. It's free. It's done as a social responsibility, and that's the just plain clear English Spanish glossary. No one will call up and say, hey, you used our glossary, want to buy our insurance? No, we're not, that's not what it is. What we've done is taken over uh, 3,400 complex health insurance, healthcare terms, and other terms, um, and put them sim more simpler, understandable language, 
and we crosswalk that with complex Spanish and complex and, and uh, more understandable Spanish. And we're going through a redesign right now where we're gonna hook up into uh, images and to uh, movies and PDFs. Uh, the Just Plain Clear, www.justplainclear.com. Uh, we've used this with uh, English as Second Language, with adult basic education programs, and because it's on a responsive platform, you can open it up, and when you're seeing the patient and you can't remember the English or Spanish term, you can look it up, and it really does work. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Erickson. Um, I have been involved in uh, adult literacy for quite a while, longer than I'd like to admit, but about 30 years <laughs> now. Um, I started um, in adult literacy just out of college. Uh, I got a call from the Beloit Public Library asking me for money, and I said, I have two college loans. I have no money, um, but I probably could help someone. I had been in the library and saw an uh, advertisement to become a, a literacy tutor. I thought I might be able to do that. Um, and so um, I went to the training and um, met my first student, Bill. Uh, Bill was a 39-year-old father of, um, of a nine-year-old, and Bill did not know the names of the letters or the sounds that they made, and he had just, gotten, he had just been laid off from his job as a welder. And um, we started, we were going to meet at the public library, and he um, told me, he, we could sit outside on the bench, but he would not go in the library. There were far too many books for him to feel comfortable in, in a library. So we sat outside on the bench, and we talked a while and started to meet at his kitchen table. Um, not long after we were meeting and some trust was built, he shared with me a letter that um, he had had in a drawer for about two and a half years. It was from the DMV, and the letter um, told him what he needed to do to get his driver's license back. It had been revoked and neither he nor his wife could read the letter, nor did they um, want anyone else to know they couldn't read the letter, so there it sat. I was thinking about that. I'm really glad it wasn't a letter from a doctor telling him what he needed to do to take care of his health or his family's health. Um, so we started working toward um, getting Bill his driver's license and, and moved on from there, but that's how I got involved in this, and it's just stuck with me ever since. I did not realize as a college student there were adults that didn't read and write. It just never, ever occurred to me. Um, so I find myself at Wisconsin Literacy. I started there in 2005 and been working um, a lot in health literacy. We're a coalition, a statewide coalition of, of 78 agencies that um, provide direct support for adult learners. And um, we, what we do is provide the capacity building and um, training for those agencies to help them train more volunteer tutors. Um, we work also as an advocacy agency. We work around workforce development, so we're helping our agencies pr uh, prepare their adult learners for the workforce and job readiness skills. And then our biggest division is um, an area we work in is called Wisconsin Health Literacy. It's a division of itself under our Wisconsin Literacy Inc. umbrella and um, has, has its own website and has really been working in this field since about um, 2003. Um, a lot of growth since 2003. We have um, services that we provide. We do a summit every other year. Um, we have one coming up in April of 17, and these have become um, larger and more comprehensive. Now, they're, they're national summits, and we've had um, international guests as well, and it's a wonderful opportunity to bring health and education together under one roof, and we spend about two and a half days, and we learn a lot about the things that are going on um, in, in our country and other countries as well around health literacy. We do a lot of awareness building. We started out just educating our state about what health literacy was and its impacts and implications. 
Um, we do a lot of community health projects where we go into community agencies. Primarily, we started with our literacy agencies, but now we've branched out to a lot of social service agencies that um, are serving vulnerable populations and do community health projects. And then on the other side of this, we work with um, providers on a lot of education and training, how to speak plain language. Um, as you, the definition that Rob provided in the Calgary Charter talks about the communication piece of health literacy, and it really is a two-way street. It's really important that when providers are communicating that they understand how to communicate in health literate uh, ways, and so we, we work on training along those lines. So again, um, you get to learn this over and over. I wouldn't say repetition this morning <laughs> is one way to, so you've seen this, but um, 90 million Americans trouble understanding, and um, I think that it's really important to remember there's just so many areas in this field from insurance to, you know, taking your medicine at home that, that are impacted by, by health literacy. So I wanted to focus just um, on one of our projects. We do many different projects out in the community, but the one I'm gonna talk about today is called Let's Talk About Medicines. It's actually, um, we had one before this we worked on called Let's Talk About the Flu. Um, so these are community projects that are funded by, um, this one by Security Health Plan and Insurance Company in our northern part of the state. And um, we look to agencies where we can go out and provide um, information in a health literate manner at a level that everyone can understand. Um, this goal, we, or this project, we started out working with seniors because seniors are at most at risk for um, health literate, health literate um, behaviors that can have grave consequences. They take more medicines and um, other things that are happening at that time affect this. So we've gone from seniors, and, and I'll talk a little bit later, we're now working with refugees on the same with the same project on medic, let's talk about medicine. So these are the goals of the of the um, project. Really understanding um, what a medication label looks like, um, the dosage, special instructions, feeling comfortable talking to your pharmacist, remembering how to take your medicine and where to store them. Um, we usually do this in one-hour workshops in different community settings. So we've been everywhere from, as I said, senior centers. Um, We've, we're in um, Salvation Army, we're in our literacy agencies, we're in neighborhood centers and providing this information. This particular project has um, uh, pillbox incentives and um, this is a workbook that we um, developed for, for this project. There were some on the back. There was the let's talk about flu and let's talk about medicines. Um, but basically we developed this. It's written about a, a fourth grade reading level and it goes through the, the many project goals that I had just talked about previously. Lots of pictures, um, easy to understand, um, writing, lots of white space. So um, this is the tool that we used, similar one with a flu. But we started in 50, 50 workshop locations across the state and um, delivered the, the workshop. We've had Every time we go, they ask us when we can come back. Um, we um, are working on developing other things with a, with a workbook, so examples of what that looks like inside. Um, types of medicines, prescription medicine and labels, and the medicine reminders. Each participant is, gets incentivized with a pillbox that they get to take home, um, as well as we do other things like um, we do a pre and post test so each participant comes in with um, a very simple pretest and then um, is post-tested so we can get some measurement on understanding and, and knowledge gained during the workshop. We've developed some card games that they do during the workshop as well that give situations uh, about um, medication use and safety. Um, we've also worked on some videos that are posted on our website now um, there's three of them. These two here, uh, when to take your medicine and how to store your medicine. They're just about a minute and a half. Really short, easy to understand videos. There's also one about um, talking with your pharmacist. And um, we promote these videos during the workshop. Uh, we've done an online as well as a printed quiz so that participants can take that home and use it with their family. And we're also now training the trainer on these um, workshops so that 
uh, when the funding runs out, that organizations are equipped to carry on the workshops on their own um, with as many resources that we can make available for them with, with very limited cost. So here are some of the things we learned, that there's a really big gap um, in this particular project with seniors, what uh, they really know and what they think they know. Um, as, as you had pointed out, everyone kind of thought, yeah, I can do this. And then all of a sudden, when you're asked to demonstrate it, it becomes a little different. Um, medication storage is an issue. There was just something on uh, Good Morning America today about the, um, children accessing pill boxes and medications and how easy it is. They had all these little kids opening up um, childproof pill boxes huh. and, and you know very easily. Like one kid had it down in nine seconds. And um, and these were childproof. These are were yeah. childproof. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, it was it was a really interesting story. So um, <laughs> medication storage is a really big issue. Um, the label instructions often cause confusion. Those are the ones on the side, too. The special labels are often a source of confusion for, for many people. And remembering when to take them and how to take them, um, and the reluctance to ask pharmacists. Um, we, we show a lot of, we show this video a lot from the AMA where people talk about their own health literacy experience. And you know, knowing when to take your medicine is not something that's easily understood on a label. So um, take two tablets twice a day. That doesn't register with everybody. And um, there's, a, there's a little video clip of a woman saying, I, take, you know, I have 16 pills a day that I have to take. And I don't want to forget. And I'm not sure exactly when to take them. So I just take them all in the morning. So I make sure I've got them all in. And so. Um, you know, this, this happens, and um, it's, it's very real. So these are the results. We're, again, trying to, measuring health um, behavior outcomes and changing health behavior is a very difficult thing. This is just the results from pre and post test, um, understanding or identifying the number of pills. Like I said, people think they get it, but when they're asked to, like, put the number of pills correctly, the correct number of pills in their hand, and it becomes a little bit different. So um, 72 were okay um, on the pretest, 85% on the post-test. I should also say that this similar study um, done in 2006 with um, intermediate, uh, well, limited literacy intermediate and proficient literacy adults was done, and even the proficient literacy um, folks that were asked two tablets twice a day, um, there was consistently uh, one or two mistakes out of that group that, that was in the, the high literacy group. Um, so people make mistakes as well. And, and then again, as I mentioned, the when to take medicine is a huge issue with understanding medication labels. So these are just a comment that the, some of the the difference the program has made, um, a lot of people didn't understand about not storing your medication in the bathroom. That's a really convenient place for most of us to store it, but really not a good place at all for so many reasons. Um, uh, we had another story of a, a participant who just happened to be going to um, the her doctor and the pharmacist the next day after a workshop and felt very empowered to be able to ask questions and felt in a much better place in terms of understanding what she needed to know um, in order to, to correctly take her medicine. And then um, lastly, one of the things about, as I mentioned, we've spent a lot of time on just raising the awareness in our state about health literacy. Um, a lot of small implementation projects um, like this. And um, these projects have allowed us to um, expand. So we start out with these pilot projects, and this medication one in particular was, um, uh, we, we applied to our Wisconsin Medical Society Foundation, and they ended up funding all the counties that the insurance company that funded the original project wasn't able to fund, uh, that were outside of their service area, and so we were able to do this project and get statewide coverage. Um, the same medical society asked us to apply again um, for more funding this year to continue it because they were very happy with um, the project and the impact that they were seeing. Um, we got funding from our 
Department of Health Services then to expand this medication workshop to refugee populations, which is, we're learning was just a whole nother challenge and a different audience in terms of the language barrier, in terms of the cultural barriers, um, and being so new and understanding our healthcare system. So um, we're in that project right now. It's a two-year project, and we're um, about halfway through our first year and learning a lot um, with the refugee groups. And then um, Wisconsin Health Literacy is also um, starting a second phase of a, a project where all this information on these medication workshops has helped us to develop a white paper. Um, I have some in the back of the room. I have another one here if you haven't seen it. But we are um, trying to adopt an easy-to-read medication label in the state of Wisconsin. And the US Pharmacopeia in 2013 put out new standards for what a medication label should look like. Right now, the biggest thing on that small little piece of real estate is the pharmacy's logo. And so um, that's a bit of a problem, as well as how the wording for the label and for the directions is, is mentioned. So um, we're working on this, this project right now um, in a second phase. We have three pharmacy networks that are actually implementing a new prototype label we're designing. And we're going to be able to measure how, um, through um, health insurance uh, network, how these patients do with a new label. So um, exciting work. I wanted to thank Nemours for having us here and um, for the Center for the Book, for John and Jillian and all your work, as well as Pro Literacy for inviting me uh, to speak. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that was a great panel. Um, and I want to, um, you know, John asked me to try to keep us on time. Uh, we were a little behind starting. Um, I, I, I do want to give you all an opportunity to ask a question. I, I have a few I could ask, but I feel like this is an opportunity for you to get your question in. So in the few minutes that we have left, I throw it open to the floor. Any questions for any member of our panel? Yes. Not as well as I'd like. <laughs> um, the, by the way, her question is a very good one. The, 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 the question was um, the diagnostics okay, that you can use to, uh, to help you um, assess okay, the grade level okay, of various types of, of efforts to try to explain health and medicine to the public. Most of the diagnostic tools are not designed with health and medicine in mind. So as soon as you have a word in there like pediatrics, immediately you're at college level, okay? And it completely skews off all those diagnostic tools, as you know, okay? And we have never come up, okay, with a, with a, what I consider to be a good substitute, okay? There is a private firm in this area that does sell software that they allege, okay? Uh, enables it, it enables you to get a good reading that is not thrown off by medical terms. So I'm, I'm giving you a technical answer because unfortunately we I don't have a good solution for you other than the private firm that sells software. The name of the company is called Health Literacy Innovations. Um, no, we do not use that in our own work uh, for a variety of reasons. On the other hand, though, um, and, and I'm going to give you a direct answer. Okay, uh, I distribute Strunk and White the elements of style to everyone I work with, okay? And, uh, and I make sure that uh, and whenever I edit or whenever anybody else is in a senior editorial position, I make absolutely sure that the elements of style is foundational to what everybody does, okay? And I'm not going to go into detail. Those of you who never seen that book, there's no, that's still the best thing ever written about how to, how to write in plain English. Yeah, but it, is it but still, we've got a ways to go, and I think, um, I wish we had better diagnostic tools. 
Yes, Steve. Yeah, and uh, that's a really great question, and it's something that we need to do for lots of reasons, not only for patient education, but there was a federal district court stipulation that came out of Louisiana that said, if you're going to deny care to somebody, you have to do it in ways that people can understand it, which is really very good. One of the things that we have to do, and we've been training our people to do, is that if you're going to use a term like pediatrician, maybe you put in parentheses a doctor for children, and then you could use the term pediatrician again. And part of it is to, in the communication, is not only to uh, make people aware of certain terms because they're going to have to become aware of it because it's common usage within the um, healthcare environment. So we're taking pains to not only use the term or terms and define it, but also to make sure that there's a correct flow of information. And I've seen the, um, uh, your kids and teen uh, information website, which I think is absolutely tremendous and gives the term, the definition, and, and the usage of it. But it's very difficult, particularly when states are saying you got to have a certain reading grade level, but it doesn't do anything for comprehension. It just occurred to me that there's a part of the answer that I didn't give that we should acknowledge, okay? I'm so impressed by how much, how improved natural language processing is, okay? I mean, we may be talking about a non-issue in several years, Okay, because, because na natural language processing has become so sophisticated that it may very well take care of this issue by itself, okay? I certainly hope so, that would be a nice solution, <laughs> <laughs> but I can't guarantee that. Let's have for one more question or two really fast questions. Klaus has a question. Don't be intimidated because I said the two fast question things. <laughs> Ask, just anybody, any other questions? Yes. Um, here at the library, we are tackling health and health literacy here because um, Dr. Charles's office, um, Health Services, we started a, a forum here that is on health and wellness. And so we've been doing this for about a year and a half. And it's surprising the amount of staff that actually doesn't know, but now knows much more because of the. Um, because of the programs that we've been having here to actually conquer that situation about health literacy. Well, I want to um, close. I'm going to just take the moderator's privilege here to close with this one thought, which is that I'm really glad that we had this panel talking about both health literacy and how adult literacy impacts health. And the reason I think that's important is because I think it's a good reminder that, you know, we're all learners to one level or another, and I think to the extent that we can identify with each other as we uh, learn about our own health care. Um, you know, instead of sort of thinking about our, 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 the folks we serve in adult literacy as being these other, this other group over there, I think it kind of brings us all together as learners. So I think that's kind of how the, the, the spirit I'd like to close out this panel with. And I'd like to thank the panel, and I'd like to thank you for your attention, and Center for the Book, and, and, and everyone who organized this thing, thank you very much for having me. It's been a great privilege um, to be able to uh, to work with, with this group here, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Well, I'd like to thank, thank the panel, and I'm, we're going to move right into the next uh, panel discussion. Uh, but as I said, the restrooms are outside. You can come in, but we're going to keep moving because our panel members are here just for a limited period of time. I must say I'm very pleased that the Library of Congress Health Services uh, has come into this and is joining us. Uh, it's terrific. I had, it was one thing that I uh, had kind of hoped for but hadn't followed up on, and it's great to see you. Uh, our next panel is going to be on, um, we call it, after some discussion, business perspectives on uh, literacy and health. And our moderator, Nancy Fishman, is going to bring her panel up right now and introduce them. Oh, this is a unique panel uh, with some people that we are very pleased have taken the time to join us. I'm going to let uh, Nancy Fishman uh, 
introduce them or get them started. Nancy is the Deputy Director of Ready Nation, and I'm also going to have Nancy tell you about Ready Nation and its importance to what we are doing here. Let's give Nancy a hand to get everything started. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for having us. Ready Nation is an organization of business people across the world who support investments in quality early care and education programs as a way of building their workforce and the economy. And we partner with other business group and organizations across the country, and yes, I said across the world earlier, we are doing some work internationally, and Ready Nation is very honored to have had an opportunity to help put together this panel today to talk about business perspectives in this topic area. Very honored to have with us this morning, Mike Edwards, the retired state supervisor of banking from Washington, state, that is, who flew across the country to join us today. We have Karen Baker, the Director of Community Affairs from Scholastic. Next to Karen, we have Dominic Robinson with Center State CEO, Vice President of Economic Inclusion, Director of Work Train, and the Director of Northside Urban Partnership. And on the end here, we have Dana Connors, the President of the Maine Chamber of Commerce. So we are from all over the country today. We are thrilled to be here. Ready Nation is part of Council for a Strong America. That's our umbrella organization that in addition to bringing the business perspective to this issue, we have a sibling organization, Fight Crime, Invest in Kids, that brings a law enforcement perspective. Their members are district attorneys and sheriffs and police chiefs. We have Mission Readiness, a group of 600 retired admirals in generals who find this issue important from a, a military readiness perspective. Shepherding the Next Generation, group of evangelical pastors who bring families together to support these efforts. And we have champs, elite athletes and coaches to talk about nutrition and physical activity and teamwork as part of these efforts. We know that high quality early childhood programs can lead to a host of better health outcomes. It's for that reason that we're here today to share with you some examples. Since we know that reading proficiency is a predictor of overall health, we'd like to talk to you how the business community has gotten involved in this subject area. We're gonna make ours a little bit more of a panel. We're gonna address certain questions to certain panelists, give them an opportunity. Since we're crowded up here, they may choose to stay seated to answer the questions. And we'll leave a few minutes at the end uh, for some questions from all of you. So we're gonna start at the very beginning. Mr. Connors, when we spoke earlier, you mentioned that you had an aha moment that came when you first learned about early brain development. We know that the foundation of many critical workplace skills is established in the earliest years, but what's really happening then, and how does that relate to success in school? You're not asking me to explain the brain. I am. I'm asking you as a chamber president. To, how about why it matters to you in your I role at a chamber? I had to leave the airport about five minutes ago. Just before you ask me, my aha moment was not around um, explaining the brain to you, but I can tell you exactly what it was. It was 2007, it was a September day, it was about uh, this time in the afternoon. And the speaker, oh, that would help, huh? <laughs> and the speaker was a professor from Harvard whose name was Dr. Yoshikawa. And I had, well, first of all, let me go back to set it up. The governor at the time, Governor Baldacci, had asked me to come to the Blaine House with probably a dozen other people to talk about a conference that he was gonna hold at one of our prime locations in the state along the coast. So I attended because I had great respect for him, we had a great relationship, so I went. The subject was early childhood development. And I confess, um, you some, you've heard these words and it's happened to me more than once, you don't know what you don't know. Well, 
I really didn't know what early childhood development was, and I probably should not admit that in front of this group, but in truth, before that moment in 2007, I really didn't know. I thought it was more like daycare, and admittedly there's an aspect to that, but it was much, it, my understanding was far, far immature and not really aware of its value. So he asked me, I went there, I listened to the discussion, I really could reasonably follow it, but wasn't too tuned in, until he said to me, Dana, I want you to be the final wrap-up speaker on Friday. To which my immediate thought was, what the devil am I going to say? Because I really don't know the subject matter. But out of respect to the, to the governor, I went. I'll make this story short because I could, move, I could make it last forever. So I go. And it's not my habit to attend conferences that last three or four days. But in this one, I figured I better go to learn the subject matter so I can wrap up the session. So this Thursday afternoon, it started Tuesday night. I'm speaking at Friday noon. So far, it hadn't clicked. My aha moment hadn't come. And I wasn't so sure that it was going to come, but it did. It happened, I was sitting in the conference room. The professor was speaking. And when he approached the subject of the early childhood development and spoke in terms of the formation, the architecture, the brain development, 85% occurs in the first three years, 90% by the fifth year. And then he went on both in science in terms of the number of neurons that a young person at birth has, 100 million, the Milky Way, as many stars in the Milky Way, I can remember that term. And then he went on to explain the synapses and how important that was, those connectivities, and you reach the peak of those synapses about the time of your 85% brain is formed. He went into more detail because he knew a heck of a lot more about the issue than I just expressed to you, as you could obviously tell. But I was so struck by it because he went on to explain that those three years, much like a house when you build, is the, you start with the foundation, you frame in the house, you do your electrical system, the circuit is really what he was talking about. He went on to explain it becomes the foundation for your intellectual, your moral, your emotional, your physical, your health, your psychological. And I remember saying out loud to the person next to me, hurry, oh my God, I get it. <laughs> I know exactly what I need to say. And the guy next to me, who was a Maine senator, not a US senator, but represent us in the ledger, said to me, what'd you say that for? So I explained his name was Richard. I said, Richard, didn't you just get that? And I went on to explain why I felt that way. And he said, Dana. You're so wrong. That's the parent's responsibility. At that moment, I realized part of the debate. And as time has gone on, is I've come to really realize, as I've heard the speakers, and may I say, very inspirational day today. And I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to get here early because it was very heartwarming, but also very informative. I've, gone, I've come to know that it's not about one or the other. It's clearly about both of us. It's a community concept, but we ignore it. We have ignored it for so long that we start with K to 12 and then expect by the fourth grade we're gonna be at a national standard on reading and math, and you're really investing too little at the early stages and expecting too much in such a short time. So to me it became almost everything that I do and work for, whether it's and grow in the economy, whether it's dealing with skill in the workplace, whether it's productivity, whether it's helping a kid, a young person achieve through aspirations, through educational attainment, it lowers crime, it lowers remedial reading, remedial education, special ed, productivity's up, oh my God. That became the aha moment. And to me it was so significant. I can, and later on if I'm asked the question, and even if I'm not, I may go there just as I did on this one, <laughs> is that to share with you what's happened since, because I'm really, it's a race that has no finish line, but I'm, I'm very encouraged by what the state is doing and what the business community has stepped up to do since 2007. My final comment is this, that afternoon when I stood up, I didn't tell you this or it wasn't mentioned, there's no reason to, but previous to being the president of the state chamber, which I've been for 20 years, I was commissioner of transportation. Yeah, I know, I'm only 30, but I, <laughs> I was commissioner for 11 years of transportation. And I used to always say, you know, 
the foundation of our economy is our transportation system, moving products, people safely and efficiently. And it costs a lot to build and maintain a good transportation system, but it costs a lot more not to. You've got to maintain it, you've got to invest in it, or it's going to cost you more when you try to fix it. Well, that afternoon, that was my message, but it wasn't transportation. It was early childhood, quality care, and education. It does cost money to do it, but it costs you a lot more if you don't invest in it. That was my message then. That's my message now. That's my aha moment. <laughs> Mr. Robinson, you've just heard about how the community can benefit when we get kids off to a good start in life. We know that your work involves community and economic development. Can you tell us how you think businesses can get more involved? For example, are, you just, are we just talking about businesses making donations to worthy programs, or is it more? Sure. Um, well, thank you um, for the opportunity to speak here today. Just a little bit of context for my <clears throat> um, position up here. I'm a vice president for a regional um, economic development agency and chamber of commerce in central upstate New York, based out of Syracuse. And for many years, <clears throat> the organization I represent has operated like a traditional chamber of commerce, representing the interests of its members um, and, and promoting what, what um, was kind of conventionally thought to be what was in the best interest of the regional economy. Um, we have kind of had an evolution in leadership over time, which has also included um, my coming on board, which has really been about um, <clears throat> thinking more broadly around what economic development means. And, and <clears throat> in the case of my role, um, very specifically trying to connect the dots between economic development and community development and community investment. And what I really think about our, our work is that we're, really, we're actually trying to, to break apart of a false dichotomy um, in, our, in our public narrative, which is that the interests of business or economic interests are at odds with the community interest. And, and I think, you know, much like <clears throat> what Dana was saying, it, there's, a, there's a profound business case to be made for investing in communities, investing in children, investing in education. And I think that um, we need to do a better job as a business community of articulating that. And so it's, it's the work we do is both kind of um, advocacy-based and, and, and programming-based, but ultimately is about leveraging uh, the self-interest of our businesses in our region and the self-interest of those who are trying to drive the regional economy um, in order to make smarter and more effective investments in our community. Um, the work we do ranges from <clears throat> programmatically, we do workforce development, we, we, we put together workforce development programs and initiatives that connect the needs of our employers to the un- and underemployed and disenfranchised members of our community. We foster entrepreneurship um, in low-income neighborhoods. We, um, we help spur neighborhood revitalization, and we ultimately <clears throat> um, are looking for ways to advocate and echo um, policies that we think um, align our, our community's business and economic interests with uh, community impact. And so when we think about the role of business and all of that, <clears throat> there's, there's really a lot of, um, a, of different ways that, that that can happen. But I think what we're ultimately talking about is a shift away from what many of us might be all too familiar with, which is kind of the corporate sponsorship model. You, you carve out a little piece of your budget and you send some of your employees every year to some you know, really bad convention center dinner. Um, <clears throat> you get your, you know, your company's name in a program and you maybe even go and send some of your employees to go clean up a neighborhood for a day. Um, I think what we can all believe in this room is that those things are fundamentally paternalistic. They, they actually disassociate the business owner and the, the, <clears throat> the workers in a business with the community and with the problem. It, it creates an otherness. And I think what we're really trying to do is create a space where business owners and business leaders can come together and own some of the challenges in our community. So that really ranges. <clears throat> One of the things we're doing um, around workforce development is simply saying to our employers in our region, you have hiring challenges, you have high rates of turnover. Um, we have the 23rd poorest city in America um, and some of the highest concentrations of poverty among minority populations in the United States. Um, there's, there's a supply and demand challenge here that, that we can knit together. Let's figure out how we meet your workforce needs <coughs> um, and better prepare and equip a pipeline of workers who need it. 
And, you know, we've had great success um, piloting programs in, in, with this philosophy in mind for the last several years. And I think <coughs> fundamentally what we're able to do is get our businesses to understand that they can act in their self-interest um, and yet contribute to solving a community's challenges. So, you know, when we think about things like early childhood or we think about um, th literacy in general, we are, are, are doing all kinds of stuff. Um, one, one big effort on behalf of my organization was um, contributing to a campaign among our local businesses to um, invest in something called the Syracuse College Promise, which is a, a program that allows for any uh, city of Syracuse school district student who graduates, whose parents make less than $75,000 a year to attend college for free. Um, <clears throat> so we've been able to help raise that money. It's not been, it's not our program, it's not our effort. We have been able to um, be an organizing force for our local businesses to get them in, to invest in that. <clears throat> um, we also are, are starting to um, jump on board to advocacy efforts um, around early childhood education investment, expanding the facilitated enrollment program in New York State for, um, <clears throat> for middle and low income workers. Um, and, and what's really powerful about that is when we get our businesses to stand up for that and we get, um, <clears throat> and we, we use our voice for that, it's a voice that people aren't expecting. So our, our, you know, our Republican state politicians suddenly pay attention. We're also thinking about how do we get our employers to think about their their workforce um, and some of the challenges that they're facing at a family level. Um, so right now we're, we're actually, just yesterday, um, we, we partnered on a grant application to the Federal Department of Labor with our local workforce development board um, <clears throat> for something called the Strengthening Working Families Initiative um, in which we would you know be able to have access to underwrite workforce development efforts here uh, in our community. <coughs> um, kind of building on some of the work we already did, but specifically to underwrite the, the workforce training efforts for um, parents of children under the age of 13 who are low income, and, and specifically to address some of the child care and early childhood education um, needs of those individuals. One thing that we um, have written into the grant would be that we would actually be able to place an ombudsman of sorts or a navigator um, in some of our major employers you know, who could go in and actually consult with lower wage workers um, about their child care um, options and opportunities to better facilitate um, child care enrollment or utilization of the child care system, especially if they were trying to embark upon ongoing training and education in order to move their way up a career ladder. So. You know, to do that though, it requires willing participation from our employer partners. We were talking to our employers, asking them if this is something that we could um, do as a part of our uh, an incumbent worker advancement strategy that we'd been working on with them, and um, and they were open to it, receptive to it. And so I think it's it's really getting employers at the end of the day to become part of the conversation and see themselves as part of the solution beyond the obligatory check writing and and the superficial you know kind of engagement. Thank you very much. Mr. Edwards, you have an amazing history with the banking community. So would you talk to us about some numbers? What can you tell us about return on investments made in young children and how that might impact our economy? Thank you, Nancy. I, um, you know, the amazing history is out there, you read about it every day in the banking world. <clears throat> I retired before most of that came around, I'll have you know. <laughs> I am one of the, in fact, I am the only legally declared, governor declared SOBs in the United States. <laughs> Each state has one, but in my state it was the supervisor of banking. Everywhere else is bank commissioner or whatever, and I was appointed by two governors. Two of them said I was an SOB. <laughs> I also found out today that I'm a, uh, also uh, learned that I'm a health care practitioner. I didn't, I didn't fully realize that, but listening to the speakers this morning on the earlier panel, I find with uh, having six grandkids, I find that I'm in a, often in a health care provider position. It also gives me the perspective on what these growing kids need. The youngest I have is three and the oldest is 13. Adorable children, of course. <laughs> but I find, too, that uh, in the course of working with them and caring with them, uh, I find that I'm also um, 
Well, I'm having some literacy problems because in the course of things, my little five-year-old at breakfast one morning was just, uh, we were just finishing up and I said, uh, she said, well, Pop, I, I, I'll save, her, save, save this for later. And uh, I said, well, you don't have to save it, honey. I said, you know, there's plenty there. If you, we'll have more for dinner tonight. And she says, no, Papa, I am savoring my food. <laughs> it's a five-year-old. They're in, they're in preschools, and I now watch them very carefully, but it is amazing what they have. Uh, you, you know, versus uh, the banking industry that I came out of, uh, the literacy there is, my gosh, you have to be a Philadelphia lawyer to open a checking account nowadays. <laughs> And then it doesn't do too much good, and you usually come out on the short end. But anyway, I will share a few things. I was drafted a couple times in my life. Well, I avoided the first draft. I signed up for the military rather than getting drafted. Uh, but this program here I was uh, drafted into uh, after I had mostly ac actively retired. And it was uh, for the advocacy of these uh, younger kids that we're talking about. And I was brought in by the law enforcement people. My brother was the elected sheriff for 20 years in our county. And through the uh, fight crime program for the law and justice folks that have gone out with early learning uh, messages, uh, they, we, in our state, we evolved in the business community having sprung off of that same concept. So we now have three three pronged approach. We have the uh, retired military that uh, Nancy talked about earlier, and we have the business community, and then we have the law enforcement, uh, including prosecuting attorneys. All three have really taken off and done extremely well, and, and the messages that we're able to deliver have been very well received everywhere we go, as you can imagine. The problem is most of our, well, a lot of our parents aren't aware of the fact that they need the uh, pre-K education quality, and they have, uh, that's the first problem, so we have a message to deliver to the parents as well as elsewhere and the legislators, and it's often the case that uh, our uh, investments go uh, to the wayside because we're not in it early enough on our own. If you don't get these kids early into the program, you're missing a terrific opportunity because of that, as I learned as well, uh, that uh, early brain growth is uh, something you can't reverse and come back on. So it's really important to get them. When I'm in the legislative body asking for some funding for our state programs, we have a state program called uh, ECAP program, Early Education and Assistance Program. And until last year, it was not very well funded. Our, our state is having a difficulty, as you can imagine, as a lot of states are, on the K through 12 programs. In fact, we just had a, a state Supreme Court decision come down that said uh, there was an inequality in funding in our state because the state was not meeting its basic obligation across the board. And a lot of the dependency for education was falling on local levies. And so that would take disadvantaged communities, uh, lower income communities, they, were, they can't just spring forward and, and do the uh, levy action to bring it up to speed. So a long story short, we're still in the legislative sessions trying to resolve that issue, which is about a $1.2 billion additional um, uh, burden uh, for that education program to bring it up correctly where it needs to be. So you can well imagine as uh, the business community, I and others that we brought into the program as we go before the legislature, you know, we're very well received. I've been in the legislative bodies for a long time and not always well received. And I was an SOB for a good reason on many of those occasions. But when I appear up there with a message for the legislators on the need to fund this pre-K program, the state program, uh, I can tell you I'm, 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 it's a fun thing to do. You get up there and the uh, legislators are actually anxious to hear from you. They're anxious to hear the message. Uh, it's a bipartisan acceptance and uh, not, in the, not this year's session, but the years before for a biannual period, 
we were actually in our state able to get $160 million to the program that we hadn't really had before. So that was a major step up on the part of the legislature. I'm having a hard time this year getting them to follow with that good record, but, but sooner or later, if we don't get it this year, we'll get it next. And that's one of the things that we find too, is you have to be steady in your course. You have to be steady in your message and now, fortunately, we have some 130 business people throughout our state that are carrying forth the message, not only in the communities that they're in, but and to the legislature when we call on them. So it's me and these other folks, community leaders, that are going before the legislature and face it. You know, they're business, they're known, uh, they get there. These people are in office because somebody supported them. Usually it's the ones that we have in the... Uh, cadre of our group and so we do get a real good hearing and a get, a, get a good reaction but I can tell you that it's very severe and I know it is in other states as well is to get the funding for these programs and it's just uh, desperate but early, early uh, learning as you've uh, heard earlier starts at a very early age we get a return on investment when we start them off in that in our state we've got it pretty well planned uh, down to four to one ratio that we get four dollars back for every dollar that we've invested and uh, it keeps from uh, repetitive uh, uh, needs for going into additional uh, years of, of education we actually had about two thousand people two thousand of our little people uh, that had to go back into remediation back in from the kindergarten so the kindergarten pro program is uh, impacted in our state to a tune of about 5,700 a student uh, per student, or 10 million uh, in in re-educating and re-taking those pe people through the young people through the uh, course for another year is a 10 million dollar issue. So we use that kind of example. You know, you pay us now, or you pay us greater amount later. And so really when I was in asking for 10 million, uh, the message I was giving to the legislators was, you know, this, is, this really isn't new money. I mean, if we don't come up with the 10 million, you're gonna spend it on remediation the next year. And we know that about 44% of our little youngsters come in that haven't had the advantage of early education, aren't really up to speed by any means to go on into the uh, K through 12 and they fall behind and the, the results are poor. And I guess we could go on with stats for that forever, but we've only got a short time today. But I will tell you that it's a known through studies, that it's valid, it's there. When we bring the message, the legislators listen. So we get, when I come in and ask for the $10 million, even though I didn't get it this year, we'll get it next year. Uh, it's really money that there's gonna be spent anyway, and it's a lot smarter way to spend the money. And uh, uh, it's just been fun. It's been an, a neat experience uh, now as I've uh, retired from my banking career to come into this endeavor, especially being the grandfather of six growing smart kids. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Baker, Scholastic is interested in innovative educational partnerships with a focus on corporate resp social responsibility. Can you explain how your community partnerships promote literacy and health? Yes. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today at this symposium and on this panel. So I want to thank the Library of Congress, the Center for the Book, and Ready Nation for bringing together this group of partners. Um, I arrived yesterday, and I didn't know anybody. And thanks to the, you know, goodwill and relationship of Scholastic with great partners like Reach Out and Read and Ready Nation. I piggybacked on that goodwill and I've met a lot of great people and I've, I've learned a lot. And a lot of what I've learned in the past day and a bit um, is stuff that I think most of us already had a pretty good idea about. I, th I think there are very few of us in the room who didn't know that literacy has a great impact on outcomes, on health, on economics, and we could, we might argue and research about whether it's a direct causal relationship or a marker or, you know, how, how those relationships work, but 
what seems new in what I'm hearing today, what I'm excited about, is the increased urgency across a wide range of specters, sectors in collaborating and integrating our efforts and approaching it in new and innovative ways. So that's what I'm excited about. And what I'd like to tell you a little bit about is a little bit of background about Scholastic and our business model, what we're looking to do and how we're looking to try to break this cycle that we've all been describing. Um, some of the shifts in, in our model, and then also a couple promising pilots that we've been doing, so thank you. Um, it's, a it's interesting and unusual for me to be on a business panel because I don't associate Scholastic very closely with a business. Um, <laughs> and um, yes. <laughs> and, Probably and a I, good decision. Yes, well I, I frequently get reminded that it is <laughs> at work. But the fact is we're a very, very mission-driven business, and that mission is literacy. So there is a high correlation between the work that we all want to do here and our business model. So um, in fact, you asked me at lunch whether we were uh, for-profit or not-for-profit, and I, uh, is there sort of non-profit-y? <laughs> and I happen, um, I happen to be the Director of Community Affairs, which has like the privilege of corporate social responsibility without the burden of direct like revenue bearing. Um, but so, so that's, I'll get a little bit more into my role in community affairs. But we are a business and a successful business and this is a great time to be in the literacy business because of the imperative that I've just been describing. Um, because the, we have new tools through data, new research, neuroscience, we have all sorts of new mechanisms to look at, and education itself is ripe for a change, and, and the educational publishing business can and needs to be part of it. So, so I'm glad to be here on this business panel. Um, a little bit of background about Scholastic. Is, is everyone here pretty familiar with Scholastic? Okay, so I won't say much, but you know, Clifford, the Magic School Bus, Harry Potter, and, um, and we also um, create educational curriculum materials, professional training, and other forms of outreach. But, but we're the largest children's book publisher, um, which uh, Roby spoke to earlier. So, so the mission of Scholastic, Scholastic has had, I don't know if you know this, that they've had only two owners. Uh, Maurice Robinson and his son Dick Robinson have been the only two owners in the 90, 95 year history of Scholastic. So that's unusual sort of family business perspective right there. And it's been the entire time uh, based on a mission of teaching all children, based on equity, teaching all children to learn to read and to love to read. It's heavily focused on independent reading the joy of reading, choice in reading. So we are not so much in the educational publishing space the same way that a basal program is. Um, but we are in the schools, and in fact, we have an enormous reach. We're in 95% of the schools nationwide in one form or another. So that might be our book fairs that everyone has some sort of nostalgic memories <laughs> of, um, or or the magazines, or, or our books. So. Having that kind of reach into the schools is also, as, as I see it, an opportunity and obligation to do something. You know, we're there in the, on the ground in a lot of um, struggling regions, and we have the opportunity to try to do something more than just put books in the hands of kids. So, so that's the other thing I, I want to speak about briefly is scholastics. Um, reach in terms of access to books. So we've long known that this is critical. There are all sorts of studies about the number of books in the home and the correlation to literacy, and we've done an amazing job at that. From the corporate social responsibility point of view, we've donated more than 40 million books since 2000, and, and we have a family and community engagement department just focused on getting books into homes and our partnership with Reach Out and Read. So, so, so that's something for Scholastic and, and me and everybody to feel really good about. Um, we have a lot of knowledge about how children best learn to read, and that changes a lot. And we've swung with the pendulum from 
whole language to phonics to you know and and just we keep amassing a body of knowledge and communicating it better and better and I think we do a pretty good job in the schools of teaching kids to read and helping teachers teach kids to read. Um, nonetheless, we still have this intractable problem that we've all been describing. We have not seen reading scores improve. Uh, we haven't seen the achievement gap close, despite not just scholastics, but the whole world of education, education publishing, and all the efforts. Um, we haven't moved the needle much. And so, so the question is, with like the power of our trusted brand of Scholastic and Clifford and, and the platform that we have in all of the schools, what are we gonna do about it? You know, what, what's our contribution? That's, that's part of what I see. And you talked a little bit about not just writing a check and I feel that way also about donating books. Like I'm very pleased that we donate books. I want us to continue to do that, but it has to be beyond that. So, um, so in a minute, that's gonna bring me to my role in community affairs and how I'm hoping to help drive that debate. But first, I just wanna mention a few of the shifts that, am I okay, Tamara? You can have 30 more seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, the shifts I'm seeing in, in the uh, education space at Scholastic and in publishing are towards more towards early childhood, and by early we mean early, we mean from birth, um, and the importance of talking to and singing to and playing with your child and your grandchildren. Um, the importance of out to reach outside the school. Kids, a, a school age kid is only in school 20% of the hours that he or she is awake over the course of the year. And so what are we doing in these other channels? and times um, towards personalized <laughs> towards personalized uh, instruction instead of, you know, someone made the, the analogy that if we treated kids, or we're treating kids, if, if someone came to the hospital or a doctor and we treated all of those patients by saying, okay, you're all getting this treatment and you're gonna, it's gonna go on for this amount of time and then we're gonna discharge you, that's kind of what we're doing in the education system. We're giving everybody the same. So there needs to be a trend towards customization and individualist. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop with the- Sorry. I'll, I'll stop <laughs> with the trends. You can ask me more about trends later if you'd like to. And I'll just really quickly, just I describe the pilots? I don't, that we have going so so I guess I'll just talk about our most exciting pilot to me which is called discover together and it's a partnership we started in conjunction with Linda Mays Dr. Linda Mays of the Yale Child Study Center to test the hypothesis that um, we can use literature and literacy to build resilience in struggling communities so we we joined forces in rural Appalachia and piloted a program that we've been doing for the last several years that I think has very exciting um, potential. And what we are doing there is we are pairing literature with very place-based experiences, field trips to sources of local pride, like a warm farm or a bakery or the railroad or a nature trail, pairing those with literature and field trips and activities and helping the community come together to celebrate their own stories around the idea of literacy and the power of narrative. Um, and what we noticed in Grundy County is that that wasn't the only thing that they wanted. It was helpful, but we but just began a long process of listening to the community. And so now that program consists of a family co-op, an early, early childhood co-op from zero to five, where we bring parents and use the same type of curriculum and model reading and work with a multi-generational approach. And it just keeps expanding. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other trend I would highlight is customizing to the communities we're serving. Thank you, I apologize for okay. rushing you. Yeah, I, I wish we had about three more hours yeah. up here. Um, now I'm gonna address one question to all of you. Could you please tell us how businesses, business leaders, and business groups can more actively collaborate to help more young people have access to the programs that we're talking about? And Dana, I know your flight is first this <laughs> afternoon, so why don't you start? Yeah. You each have about two minutes and we'll just work okay. our way down the line here. It just about gives me time to get to the plane at 4.30, so I appreciate it. I'm very grateful, and please forgive me for having to rush off the 
platform here. That's why they put me <laughs> to the side. Uh, hopefully, I just push me off here. Um, the Business Community is active. I mentioned it earlier. I mean, I have found in my 20 years to get the business community involved, particularly in something that it be, that begins as a social issue, which most business see this as, is you build awareness as to what it does and why it relates to them and the economy. You've got to give them some action. We can't just talk it to death, which is characteristic of a lot of issues. And thirdly, there has to be accountability. And when I can put those three things together, I've got a secret formula. Uh, and once, once they started to become aware, and how we became aware is that we're very involved in Ready Nation. Ready Nation is a tremendous resource. A lot of our business signed up. Our law enforcement, invest in kids, fight crime, mission readiness for our military people. They're all very engaged. That in itself is a community because there are so many of them. And we have a very passionate person that represents all three in Maine, so she's, she's fantastic. We have um, a group of business leaders that took upon them, so we did this research project right here. It's called Make in Maine Work, Critical Investments for the Maine Economy. I partnership with a research entity, very well respected research entity. We put this together, it tells, it's all about early childhood, the facts, the facts drive the solution in this instance because it's more than emotion, it's more than feel good as much as it is. The facts help drive this success. That helped bring the awareness to the forefront. This group of business leaders call themselves Maine Early Learning Investment Group, MELIG, have raised over $10 million. That's a checkbook. That's putting money there, but it's not sponsorships. They take that and they've worked with Educare, which most of you are familiar with. We have one in our state. They have designated a community. They are committing, I think it's $4 million to address a number of kids with the community, with the family. The boots are on the ground. They're very involved. I can't ask for more than that on any issue. And here's an issue that at first blush they saw as social and not economic. Now they see it as economic more than social. Our challenge is what Mike said, is that we don't have enough money for K to 12 and higher ed, and we've got some to the uh, state government, but it is a race that has no finish line. It is something you gotta be constantly persistent about, and you gotta stay on message. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I appreciate it, and if <laughs> I sneak out, it's only because I have to make a plane, because I have to speak at a funeral tomorrow morning, and I can't afford to miss it, so. Thank you very much, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, I think my job got a little easier because he stole half the things I was about to say, uh, <laughs> which is great. <clears throat> um, so I, I guess I would echo a lot of that. I, I think that um, one thing I'd like to reinforce, um, repetition, uh, is, is I think for business owners, in particular business leaders, um, engagement in, in, in a partnership that kind of uh, takes them outside of their kind of core mission or core focus. Um, in, a, in, a, in an ideal scenario, you, you, you ground that in some form of self-interest for them. But I, I don't think that that is, is ultimately critical. What I do think is critical is that whatever it is that they are being asked to do is able to result in an outcome. I think business leaders are much more prone to be thinking about kind of, I do this and this happens. They want to see, you know, kind of cause and effect. And I think that too often in the world of <clears throat> nonprofit and policy and, and the worlds that most of us probably operate in, um, we do perhaps get a little bit too comfortable in the conceptual, um, in, in the ethereal. And, um, and I think business leaders, they want to see, they want to see something. There's, a, there's an, a, an instant gratification that they're seeking. Um, the other thing that I, I would just kind of bring up, and I think it is really important, and it certainly speaks to the work that I'm doing um, with my team, is, is playing the role of broker. I think that you, in order to build unconventional partnerships that are advancing um, <clears throat> mission around um, outcomes relative to early childhood or health or literacy, um, it, and you're trying to bring these disparate partners together, you have to recognize the very different languages that a community college will speak compared to a business, compared to a social service agency, compared to a governmental organization. They have different outcomes. Uh, they have 
in some cases, very different motivations, and they by all means use different terminology. And it's very difficult to put them in a room and expect them to kind of make magic happen. So whether that's through some form of formal facilitation, or it's just identifying people in a coalition who have that kind of translator capacity or capability. Um, I think it's it's really ensuring that there is kind of that 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 brokerage role uh, embedded in those types of partnerships, and I think that that's that's really important because too often you bring those <laughs> different types of uh, partners in a room, and they they're conceptually on board, but they really don't have any way of cr cr um, finding a common language or creating a common space. Okay. Um, I think in terms of getting businesses more involved in the issues of literacy and health, uh, one of the first things that we need to do is listen to the needs of a particular community, a look at the data, and before we ask a business to get involved to know exactly what will be most helpful, because I agree with you that they are not necessarily looking at ROI in the traditional way, they do want to be helpful and we need to use, show them that we're going to use their resources most effectively. Um, I've found in the work that I'm doing for our research and development lab that the combination of having a research institution like an academic or uh, university, uh, a business, and schools and CBOs all involved together is the most powerful way to have a common person purpose and effect change. I just add to that, thank you, um, that, you know, really we're in the, I, I notice it's an energy in the room because you brought me into more literacy, hopefully, in, in your program and in your talks earlier today, but you know, health is an important thing and we view it at Ready Nation with our activities of how important it is and we include that in our programs. We make sure the kids get the meals, uh, the parents understand the importance of, and they can't learn if they're hungry, and they can't learn if they don't get that early development, you'll lose them in the succeeding years as they go into their uh, K through 12. So health is a definite play into this, and I think you could be, and I'd like to solicit your support going forward and keeping in your mind the benefits of what we hopefully have helped shed on with the light for you today is the benefits of bringing those kids early on, getting the parents to understand if you can, if you know, if they're in your office and they're in for a medical reason and they're in discussing, just if you can get any kind of a direct or indirect message to them, the importance of those kids getting into an early education program. I'll bet you many of our states, I haven't researched it, have an early education program and if they don't you have many community members that do have an education program and it's often the church or a fraternal organization or somebody that's recognized it in your community if you can get together with them and cause us an energy between you to go forward for better health and for early education you know our research shows that this is going to be one of the uh, and I'm <laughs> I'm in it one of the first generations to live sh shorter lives than their parents. Well, at least the ones that are coming up. And a lot of it has to do with health and a lot of the ability to reach good health care, which is very expensive, depends on good business and early education of these kids and put them in the workforce. For we on the business side are looking for growing our future employees. We have a lot of problems, I've noticed, as in the industry. We, we have people that can't basically count back cash. They can't convey in a, in a uh, comprehensive way their ideas bringing forward. You may have people that are quite bright and do what they do, but they can't convey their ideas and their smartness, if you will, on because they can't converse. And they're not literacy, their literacy is lacking. It starts with education and good health. So being Nancy's up here going to be evil eye on me pretty soon, I'm going to seal it off at that. But I would like to recruit each of you in your own communities, in your own way, to impose on the parents and your community how early this edu early education program business is. Thanks very much. Thank you. I love being the bouncer. Yeah. <laughs>
So a couple ways that you can get involved and get some of this information, go to our website, readynation.org, sign up to get our resources and information. There, there's no cost, we won't sell your name, we're not gonna have you come to meetings, there's no obligation. One of the resources that we have available on our website is a brief that we did for businesses, talking to them about how they can talk to their employees and support their employees in high quality early education opportunities. That brief along with lots of other information and resource, resources are available there. Or just see Callie, Callie are you here? Callie or I after the event today and we can connect you with these valuable resources. Uh, we wanted to leave a minute and a half for questions. So <laughs> if a couple of you have a quick question, what are the rules? Two fast questions, I believe, <laughs> are allowed. It's a challenge. It mm. is a challenge. In the back. I, if you could, for the first time, you just mentioned quality, and I think that that mm. was missing from the discussion earlier, and I would argue or, or want you to And you're right, and much of our research does cite the, the quality. Um, they, they are familiar with it, the quality aspect of what has to be done. We did not highlight that today. It's an important distinction. Different states define quality different ways. Some states don't even define quality. All the research shows that the benefits are greatest for those who participate in a quality or a high quality program. And it's those high quality programs where parent engagement is an inherent part of the program that we also have an opportunity to affect two different generations. Thank you so much. We should have called that earlier. I appreciate you bringing that to our attention. And do you have a quick question, sir? Well, I'll try to make it, make it quick. First of all, <clears throat> excellent panel. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Very encouraging. One of the things that I found in trying to work to support various educational programs, at least dealing with governmental bodies, the state legislatures are concerned that if they invest in education, how, they say, we don't know that these young people will be here 10 years from now, so why oh. should we be training young people who will end up in California or in New Jersey, et cetera? So my question is, uh, have you come in, in contact with that kind of sentiment, and how do you counter it? And part of my question also is, with the Chamber of Commerce, do you interact with the National Chamber of Commerce so they could really help get that message to our members of Congress as well? Well, let me just share with you quickly the message that I try to give to our legislators. If we don't educate the kids and start them off early, we're going to be lacking in our workforce. And we're already lacking in our workforce. Uh, Seattle, as you know, is a high-tech community. Uh, we've got Microsoft, uh, Amazon, and, you, and Expedia, and you name it. But the, the fastest answer to that question when I get asked is if we don't educate them and give them an early opportunity, we will continue to import people from outside the United States to fill those critical positions. And it isn't only the real high-tech community, it's other things of manufacturing. Just like we had the uh, solar power came, became an issue in our state where in our nation where we need to have that increased. And a lot of our linemen and power people that are out there in our infrastructure are getting to the retirement age. We can't even find people that uh, are trained well enough or schooled well enough coming out of our school system to put those people into those programs to make it happen. So if you want to retain your intellectual power and your brain powers and your resources, start them early. It's like growing a garden. You put the seed in the ground and you culture it and take care of it all the way. And if you don't, some, yeah, in some ways it's a long range program that you're looking at, but if you don't do it, you'll end up short and you'll have to import them. Do you want to close this out here, Dominic? Sure. Just uh, one, one quick thing to that point, then also about the chamber. Um, I would say that the um, the other argument relative to, you know, why would we invest in these folks when we don't know if we're going to be able to retain them? Statistically speaking, 
um, you know, it, yes, there's, there's, there's always kind of churn in the population, but, but the, the majority of the population that's raised in a geography does in fact stay there. And so I think you can also just point to the statistics that in fact, more often than not, the, that's a good bet. Um, and I would agree with everything you else, else you said. I, I think that your, your question around, <clears throat> um, for example, our relationship to the US Chamber of Commerce or other national chamber type organizations, um, it's an important question because we often associate the chamber voice, especially nationally, with a voice that isn't always hospitable <laughs> to these types of conversations. Um, I think that, um, it's a slowly changing dynamic, but I do think that there's at least a greater awareness that these things cannot be disconnected forever. Um, I was invited to, but was not able to attend um, a, a, an event in, here in DC, um, I think in the fall, that was a, 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 a co-sponsored event between the US Chamber and the NAACP, I believe, mm -hmm. kind of talking about <coughs> where those, um, where the, their, their organizational interests might align. Um, and I thought that was a really encouraging sign. Um, so I, I think that, um, that the reality is, is that we often feel like outliers within the broader kind of chamber conversation. Um, that only underscores our need to kind of continue to kind of use our platform as best we can. Thank you all so much for having mm -hmm. us. We appreciate your interest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was a wonderful, different kind of insight for all of us. Uh, and I want to thank Ready Nation and thank our panel so much. Uh, our final panel is also going to be different and interesting, technology and other innovative solutions. As Tony brings his panel members up, let's take a brief three or four minute break uh, as they get settled up here and we will uh, conclude with technology and other innovative solutions. Thank you again. Um, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to, uh, one of the ways that we've put this together is through partnerships that already exist and through new partnerships. And uh, I want to thank Laura and Nemours for getting the, um, the last panel, helping us so much with, I think will be a new partnership for the Center for the Book. But we also are making use of some of our own board members. Laura is one and Tony Bloom, who is chairing this panel on technology and literacy is also part of our Literacy Advisory Board. He works for AIDS and has a wonderful project that is going to uh, be described as part of the program. I'll turn it over to Tony. Tony, let's give him a little applause to get them going. Wow. That's right. well, I, haven't, I haven't really done anything yet, but I appreciate it. So, All right, so it's the last panel of the day. And so you guys have been faithful to sit through a bunch of interesting conversations. But there's probably somebody in the room that you don't know. So I'd like to use five minutes of our presentation time for you to introduce your somebody in the room that you don't know and tell them about a favorite book that you read recently. You have five minutes. Please begin. <laughs> so, uh, so great. Uh, I wanted to start with that because obviously being able to meet somebody new but be able to share your experiences about a book that you've read and how important obviously the theme of today is about literacy and how important it is that we can extend the opportunities for individuals around the world to have access to literacy. I'm excited to have the three representatives of the organizations that will be speaking with us today to talk about various uses of technology that we can make access to health and general literacy available to a variety of learners um, and using some creative technology options as well. So typical with the other format, we'll start with a few uh, comments from our uh, individual panelists, but then I would really like to open it up into a dialogue for organizations here to be able to share their own experiences around the specific concept of how can we use technology cost effective and sustainably to reach these audience to promote and accelerate literacy. Um, and so we can learn as much from you about the work you're doing as you can from us. So I'm delighted that to welcome uh, to my immediate left, Judith Dixon, who's a consumer relations officer right here at the Library of Congress. Judith, did I see that you've been working here for 35 years? That's enormously exciting. And who, who you can't see is her her friend Potter, who's I guess on the other side. Oh, he's, you can see that. <clears throat> so we were going to have you invent a story about what the tale came from, but you can. <laughs> So, uh, 
And, uh, and Judith will be talking to us about the services that her office provides, including for Braille and talking books. Um, and then has brought some toys, some devices that she'll show us as well. So Judith, in just a moment, welcome you uh, to uh, walk us through that. And then next to uh, Judith is Linda Harris, who's Director of Health Communications and eHealth at the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, Linda, I know you'll be talking about designing access to information for individuals with limited literacy, and particularly in terms of health literacy. And then finally, to my far left is a good friend and colleague of mine, Rebecca Leagy, who's the project director of an initiative called the All Children Reading Grand Challenge for Development, which specifically is looking at the use of technology to advance early grade reading in developing countries around the world. And Rebecca, I know that you've been at organizations like World Vision, but also World Relief in a variety of capacities, exploring how to bring education to marginalized populations around the world. So without further ado, Judith, could I turn it over to you just to walk through, tell us about some of the toys that you have. It's right you got it. Ah, there, okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am from the National Library Service, as Tony indicated, and the National Library Service for Blind and Physically Handicapped. We're part of the Library of Congress. We've been in existence since 1931. And our role is to create talking books and braille books. What we do is select them and produce them, and then we give them out to libraries around the country who actually circulate them to individuals. So the idea here is people who don't read print, either because of a visual or a physical disability, are literate? Yes, no? We have this debate all the time in my office. If somebody doesn't read print, but they access information by listening, are they literate? I would say yes. There are people who actually would say no. But literacy is a challenge because the world is designed for print readers. <clears throat> so this is health literacy in a different way. It's not just people who can't communicate. Um, most blind people can communicate just fine. It's a matter of not being access, able to access print. So we do braille and talking books, and we do have books about health. As a matter of fact, I did a search this morning, and in our national collection we have 1,168 audio books and 381 braille books specifically on the topic of health. <coughs> we have a player. <coughs> Our talking books are, I'm going to hold this up, and uh, they are um, recorded on a cartridge, which that actually is just a USB flash drive. Um, most of them have labels. This one isn't because I created it this morning. <laughs> Health and Nutrition Newsletters, February 2016. Current position. Jogging and health. Easier than you may think. Jogging and health. Easier than you may think. Now we can actually skip. Reading time, six minutes. We can skip. Second through. opinion. Special report. Supplement to Mayo Clinic health letter. Vision. Article, jump, eye health, section, jump, phrase, bookmark, jump, unit, jump, as, end of book, within, jump. Mayo Clinic Health Letter, Scientific American Health After 50. So what this is is a monthly uh, compilation of health newsletters. <coughs> One of the reasons we don't have more health books than we do is because health topics come and go, and our librarians are very concerned about the books being up to date and accurate and current. So magazines and current health newsletter type items are a good way to do that, to give people up to date information. So that's one way that a blind person can access print. Another way, uh, there are many other ways, there are actually lots of ways. And it's a matter of what is this information available in. So people can use computers to access material that's online. Smartphones. We actually have an app for our talking books called Bard Mobile. 
And people can download our books also through a service called BARD. And I normally make this presentation in about two hours, so I'm <laughs> trying to sum summarize the, the, I could tell you so much more about any one of these things, but um, I did bring some handouts. There are fact sheets about our program, applications for service and things like that back on your handout table. So the uh, program, there's lots of ways that a, that a blind person can access information. Now, what you may not know is, this is an iPhone, a regular old iPhone that you get at the Apple store. And every single iPhone has on it a screen reader called VoiceOver. And every iPhone can talk. Messages. Well, Contacts. Fortunately, I hope I don't Double have Double tap that. to open. <laughs> Messages. Bye. Double tap to open. App switcher. Blindfold solid. Messages. Act digitized. Mail. Active. Hiku. WebMD. Active. So. Medicine. Button. WebMD. I come nav button. I know you can't see the screen of this iPhone, so we can just listen. This is probably a little fast. Actually, let me. Language. I can even slow Vertical it down. Nav. Headings. Audio ducking. Volume. Speech rate. Words. Speech. Fifty-one per forty-six percent. There. That might be. I come nav button. Search web and symptom checker button. Medication reminders button. Conditions button. Medicine button. Refill and transfer prescriptions by Walg. First aid information. Button. So this is WebMD, a regular mainstream off-the-shelf app. BTN back arrow. I can double tap on it. First aid. Button. Search first aid. Table index. Adjust abdominal pain in adults. Abdominal pain in children. Acetaminophen. Tylenol. Poisoning. Alcohol intoxication. Allergic reaction. Amputation. Accidental. Oh. I was reading this this morning and said, amputation, accidental. Like, oh my, <laughs> that sounds rather major. You know, BTN, back arrow. I'm going to go to my iPhone if I've accidentally amputated something. You know, <laughs> so. 41%. Walk, have the injured person lie down. If possible, don't reposition the person if you suspect a head, neck, back, or leg injury. If they haven't fallen down, yes. Um, so, but that's an incredible tool for accessibility of information. Um, finding, it, it can do tons of other things too, but, but uh, just a mainstream app like WebMD that has, has good health information. Hush, now you're done. <laughs> so, that's another. Um, accessing printed material is one thing, but another major issue for people who don't see is identification of things. Labels, all this print, it's, everything's labeled in print. One way to identify kind of mainstream items, this. My teammates on it. My team mode. This is a barcode reader, but it's a special barcode reader. So I have this box. What is this box? Who knows? I just <laughs> have no idea. It's just a box. And so I can I'm try to do this. I should be able to hear what it says. Product. Peptobismol upset stomach reliever and said I are two adult tablets. Continue. Now that, that speech might be slightly off-putting for people who don't listen to synthetic speech all the time, but um, for someone who does, it's actually pretty understandable. Um, there's a lot of information in a barcode. Manufacturer's phone 800, Pro package size, 48 tablets, product description, bismuth subsalicylate, five symptom relief, nausea, heartburn, indigestion, instructions, cure dissolve in mouth, Adults and children 12 years and over, two tablets every one half to one hour. So it tells you how to take it, how often, all the, all the things about it. And this, you're, you're done too. Um, <laughs> the, these things don't know when to shut up. They, um, there are barcodes on tons of things. I mean, there's, I, I actually take this little device to the grocery store and uh, use it on items and just regular items in the grocery store. And there's also apps on my iPhone that can do the same thing. 
they're a little bit more difficult to use because they're a little bit more difficult to find the barcode. But the, the process is the same. So now we have, um, this is a device called the Script Talk. Um, coincidentally, made by the same company that the barcode reader was made by, Envision America. Uh, but it, uh, this is a device for reading the labels on prescription bottles. It has to be uh, created. Every Rite Aid pharmacy in the United States can now provide this to their, their subscribers, their customers. And uh, the way this works is with RFID tags. Script talk station ready. Right. So all you have to do is put the bottle on the device. Patient. John J. Smith, medication. Amoxicillin, 250 milligram capsule. Instructions. Take one capsule three times daily. And Quanti again, you can quantity. step through. Prescription date. Use by March 1st, 2017. Refills remaining. Prescriber. <clears throat> Scriptability Pharmacy. To reorder this prescription, Prescription number. Warning. Important. Finish all this medication. So, they also have uh, other kinds of pill bottles with large print. This, this bottle has a large print and a braille label. Um, braille label only says the name of the person. I hope they actually put more on it than that because the person probably knows who they are. <laughs> it's the name of the medication that would be useful. But <coughs> these Rite Aids now can, can do either large print Braille labels or um, use, uh, provide the person with a, with a script talk. And the last item, there are lots of talking devices these days. There are talking glucose monitors, there are talking thermometers, talking scales, talking everything out of the sun. This happens to be a talking um, Your body temperature is 98.1 degrees Fahrenheit. That's close enough. <laughs> Again, this speech. Where's the speaker in this foolish thing? Let's not going to do it again. Come on, you can do it. Your body temperature is 90 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> <laughs> but if you use it right, it probably will work. <laughs> so this is just, again, there's talking blood pressure monitors and talking, you name it. There's talking almost everything. A lot of this stuff, um, one of the challenges is for people who are deafblind, because there is a bazillion things that talk, but it's a lot harder for people who also don't hear. So there are devices like that have, that are, this is a refreshable braille display. And the pins raise and lower uh, depending on what's on the um, screen. <clears throat> and the downside of these is they are very, very expensive, mm -hmm. but it is a device that's really useful and can be paired <clears throat> via Bluetooth with a smartphone or um, with some of these other devices, not our, not our talking book machine, but the, the best example of the things I have here is that it can be paired with a smartphone and anything that's displayed on the smartphone or anything that's displayed on a computer screen can also be read in Braille. So this is a way that uh, people who are deafblind have of accessing information that's typically in print. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Judith, for bringing a bunch of toys to be able to share with us, important 
And I wonder if you're ever in your office, do they start having an exchange with each other? <laughs> no, but they do, they do at yeah. home. <laughs> you, have to, you have to tell them to all be quiet. And so um, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers afterwards. Or, so I would hope that you would have some specific questions for Judy. I know I have several as well. Judy, thanks for uh, kicking us off with really important discussion about a range of technologies that can make literacy materials more accessible by a variety of learners. <clears throat> Linda, could I turn it over to you? I know you have some slides as well to talk to us about yeah. access to health literacy and other resources. Yeah, I think I can, if I, I will see if I can see the screen. Is that the title of my presentation? Okay, good. I'm gonna talk about what we can learn from people with limited literacy about designing the interface for the technologies that we use to um, access health information. And it turns out we can learn a lot I'm from the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, and so the consumer is really an important part of being able to prevent disease and promote their own health. So that's why we pay a lot of attention to the consumer. And so what I'm gonna talk with you about real quickly is um, that some of the research that we've done on people with limited literacy and limited health literacy. So the first thing I thought I would uh, just kind of share with you is the difference. <clears throat> uh, you'll see that uh, you've probably heard that um, half the population struggles with um, reading. But, um, oops, I'm sorry, I can't see what I'm showing you. Uh, can you, see, hold on. Okay, so this is the slide. Oh, oh, great, thank you. Yeah, so this is half the population struggles with reading. But 90% of the population struggles with health literacy. That is that only about 90% of us, 90% um, of us struggle at some time 10%, about 10 to 12% of us are always proficient at understanding the complexity of health information. And so uh, we have a lot to work with because of this challenge that almost all of us have. Health information is a little bit different from other kinds of information is that it's inherently complex. It comes from the medical kind of language. Uh, and it's also inherently stressful. So when we're trying to understand health information, we, even if we have, those of us who have advanced degrees and we think that we're really very literate, when the time comes to get that diagnosis and it's really um, personal and uh, eventful for us, then our ability to process information kind of goes off the window. So we design for everybody, and what I'm gonna talk with you about is how we, uh, uh, how our understanding of people with limited literacy and lim limited health literacy is helping us create that sort of that cyber uh, curb cut uh, for all of us. I'm gonna show you just a couple of screenshots. This is in our research, our usability research, and this is a picture, a graph, of what it looks like when you're tracking, doing eye tracking of just a regular person who's fully literate. So you can see how they're moving their eyes along the page. And now I'm gonna show you uh, eye tracking of somebody who ch is challenged um, with uh, reading. So you see how inefficient they are how they're struggling to try to find the point. Um, and so this is accompanied with, usually with limited memory. Um, and so what am I reading and um, how am I to understand this information? And then once I think I've got it, how do I remember what I've read? This is a question that lots of people with limited literacy and limited health literacy are asking themselves uh, all the time. So we know that we have an enormous challenge to work with people with limited, uh, to provide meaningful access to health information um, among those who are 
uh, limited in their reading and limited in their health literacy. But we've learned some really interesting things about those folks because we've really started paying a lot of attention to them. We have been interviewing and, and working one-to-one -one with over 800 folks. Most of them have either limited health literacy or limited uh, literacy. And so here's some, a few things that we've learned. People with limited literacy are willing to use the web uh, and it's important to them to use uh, the web for health information. They're able to accomplish tasks when the websites are designed well, and this is really key. We can make this accessible to people if we really make the effort. And then the third thing that I'm gonna drill down on a little bit is that people with limited li literacy seem to prefer mobile. So I'm gonna just go into that a little bit more and uh, tell you a little bit about why we think that's true. Um, people with limited literacy uh, usually prefer mobile. Uh, it seems that the reading is easier for them. We think that that may be because the sentences are short. And there is some evidence that the tactile experience also helps process that information uh, when you're using, uh, using a mobile app or, or a phone. So I'm gonna quickly um, share with you what we think is the definition of, of health literacy. Once, now that I've kind of told you what we are learning about people with limited literacy and limited um, health literacy. We do not think that it is all that useful to define health literacy as a deficit that those of us who are struggling have with reading or with health information. We prefer, we at HHS, and that includes Rob and, and Logan and those of us who are uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, we prefer to think of health literacy as defined as that match between what the health organization or the publisher or the source of health information provides and the way they provide it and our ability to find, understand, and use that information. So what that means for us is, the, is that the responsibility is really on those of us who publish information to, to design it well. And that's why we have started with people with limited literacy and limited health literacy to, to develop a guide. We call it Health Literacy Online, a guide for simplifying the user experience. And that's where we brought these 800 folks together, not together, but individually. These are not surveys. These are actually working with people, watching them uh, use uh, the technology and the interfaces for websites. And this guide, um, is, was just published in October, the second version of it. Um, and it offers uh, those folks who are developing uh, any interface, whether it's a web or um, a mobile app, um, ways that um, we can design that interface in, uh, in ways that almost everybody who can read, who can understand, who can process information at a simple level, uh, can find meaningful access to the information on that technology. Um, so it, we, um, it comes with a checklist, and I, have, I brought the checklist with me, so if you all wanna take a look at it. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that right now, but you'll see that it's, ba it's an evidence-based uh, guide um, based not only on the folks that we've been um, telling you, that I've been telling you about, but also on the literature that we've been uh, referred to, uh, people with limited literacy, people with uh, disabilities, and people with limited health literacy. So I'm gonna just finally uh, close with giving you an example <clears throat> of the kind of interface that we're working with, and Judy, we should talk because we'd love to have this uh, at the Library of Congress. Uh, our, um, as I mentioned to you, we're in the Office for Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. One of the websites we have uh, for the public is called healthfinder.gov. And so we've used these guides, uh, these criteria, to develop health literacy, uh, healthfinder.gov. That website is really the department's face to the public for the preventive services that we all need that are covered by the ACA. So it's really important that we get that right and so that everybody needs to have the preventive services and because they're free, it's really been important for us to make it so easy to use that anyone who can use uh, the web or can use an app uh, will find this um, 
very easy to, to access. So as I will, I will close by saying there's a lot more work to do. We would love to work with the disability community as well, uh, work with the children who are uh, actually helping us understand about design. Uh, because what we really believe is that we, if you design with, forget about grade level, you really design by engaging people who have, who are challenged with reading and with, with uh, health literacy, ask them to help you design the interface. That's the, really the most important thing you can do. So all of those of you who are working with people with limited literacy, with limited <coughs> health literacy, and, and with uh, disabilities, we hope that you all encourage them to be a part of the design process in the information, uh, health information that's important to them. Thank you, uh, Linda. Um, and then a really nice segue from talking about devices that can make information accessible that Judy was talking about to those who are creating the content, Linda, to make sure that it's also accessible. So obviously the connection, as you've mentioned, in terms of the types of audiences. So Rebecca, let's just sure. let's go overseas and talk about sort of some of the challenges we face as part of the All Children Reading Grand Challenge and our literacy efforts that are involving technology for early grade learners. Great, I'm gonna take a pulse check. Who has worked in an office overseas in the room? One person, great. Have anybody visited programs overseas that work on literacy projects? Okay, thank you. So as Tony mentioned, I'm Rebecca Lige, work with World Vision. For those that may not be familiar with World Vision, we are an international relief and development organization and focused on multi-sectors, education being a key component of ours. We joined the All Children Reading Grand Challenge five years ago. It's a partnership between USAID, World Vision, and the Australian government. And it was really premised on the notion of, can we use science and technology to offer some breakthroughs for early grade reading in developing countries? We, as three agencies with very similar strategies, weren't cracking the code. Um, there were still 250 million children, as we know, without reading. There are one in, um, or 80% of children with disabilities are in developing countries. 3% of those um, have access to school. So many opportunities for trying to make breakthrough um, advancements in that space. So as I just mentioned, we've been around for five years, um, and we have started to see some very interesting um, application of technologies in various um, sectors, and I just thought I'd highlight three of those. There are three areas that we wanted to focus on um, to help improve, because we know as listening even to the business panel, I apologize that I couldn't be here all day, but um, it is about parent and community engagement. It's about having the right quality materials, and it's also ensuring that we have inclusion of all um, children in that process, that no one is excluded. And we all know it's our human right to have literacy. We also know it unlocks our potential. And listening to the business, we're constantly trying to make that case overseas as well to those um, companies in developing countries that say we don't have the workforce talent and we say to ministries well you're also not investing in the education system to build that next generation. So these are three focus areas. Uh, for those of you who have grown up in the States, we have, we're quite familiar with Sesame Street, right? <laughs> and they have done a great job in helping educate many children in this country. They have taken their model in many countries, but primarily in India, where they have developed recognizing, one, the population need um, to improve reading in that um, country. They have taken and developed and contextualized the whole Sesame Street messaging called Gali Gali Sim Sim. It rolls off the tongue very nicely, too. <laughs> they have done everything from um, creating e reader, I mean, e published books for e readers to just simple games. We had asked for their um, high tech version of a phone, one of those phonics phones, and they sent us PVC piping. And I thought, w w oh, this was not what I was expecting to see, but how clever, something that is very low tech, affordable, that can be sourced in a community so that children can start to hear themselves practice their reading. They're currently working on a mobile app, which is designed to be um, 
utilized at the home. They're working with self-help groups, primarily women that are focused on health issues or livelihoods issues, and introducing it, their engagement in the reading process with their child and then giving them tools through an application on a very low-end smartphone to begin practice their reading. We're really excited to see how that um, will roll out. With any of these projects, one thing that is lacking, at least in the developing countries, is research. Research to say, does this app really make any difference? Um, or is it, I mean, we know it's great that kids like to play on games and that has value, but can it demonstrate any um, improvement in their reading outcomes? And so we are tagging all of our grant programming to um, some robust research on that. And we, we hope the findings are positive, but you know, it's a good thing to uh, at least start to define what that process is, the contextualization of the um, assessment process um, and so forth. The second one I wanted to highlight is related to our children with disabilities. This is a group, IDRT, Institute for D Disabilities Research and Training. They're based out of Wheaton, Maryland. It's a women-owned business that has worked with um, the National Science Foundation and others. But they have partnered with a group in Morocco, and they feel very passionate that their um, software application that was really trying to articulate a way to document sign language of a language to be utilized to create materials for deaf um, and uh, low hearing in various countries. So they're partnering with an institute in Morocco. The next slide kind of shows you what it will be. So you get um, an idea of just defining what it is, how it can be used in the marketplace, and then they actually have a video of someone signing it. And then they're training teachers and deaf associations on how to create their own stories and begin to allow written begin to allow material for deaf. Um, it's also a way for them to teach many parents um, sign language because many of them don't actually know sign and even how to teach their children, right? So it serves multiple purposes. Um, USAID Morocco is highly engaged in this and funding, and it's been um, really supported by the Ministry of Education there as they're seeing it as a potential model to roll out throughout the whole country. We also see it as an opportunity to replicate because it's also based off of um, modern standard Arabic, which is used throughout the whole North Africa and Middle East world. My last example is really on how do you source a new technology, and I really appreciate Linda's um, focus and attention on user experience and um, simplifying uh, tools for those that have low literacy levels. We put a challenge out um, 18 months ago, almost two years ago, to say, can someone source an authoring tool that could be used in developing countries by individuals with 20 hours of training, but embedded in that technology is the decoding and leveling framework of books. There are a lot of authoring tools out there. Some are very fancy, but when you're in the middle of South Sudan working with an elementary school teacher, it's unlikely that she's going to navigate uh, a device that requires connectivity um, as well as something that is highly, um, I'm going to say fancy, right? It has all the bells and whistles, and it's almost overwhelming. So we put this challenge out. We had nine different teams around the globe that competed, and we ended up, ah, oh, we have a demonstration to hand out. <laughs> Thank you. We'll do that in a second. We awarded it to a group called, um, called SIL. For those that may be familiar with SIL, they are a linguist organization that's been around over 60 years, they probably are the ones that have documented language, documented the most languages. Um, they have also worked at that very grassroots level to know what could be achievable in a software system. And so what we do like about it, though it looks kind of low tech in some ways, is that it is easy to adapt. I mean, it's easy to um, learn. We ran our first uh, training on it in Ethiopia at the end of uh, January. And we did a usability uh, study and um, assessment process. And it scored quite high because they said it's simple. We can master it. We understand what we're supposed to do. And it, it already 
identifies the decoding and leveled elements for us. So we're not questioning, is this book appropriate for grade one or grade three? It's defined in that space. So we're very excited about this tool. We're beginning the rollout process. We think it has multiple uh, usages, one even here in D.C. We know that there's, like, if we look at diaspora here in D.C., we, in, we can envision engaging the Ethiopian community to contribute back um, reading materials. Basically, as we look at the vast materials, and I don't think Scholastic's still in the room, but great to hear from Nancy. I know they do a lot of work overseas and partner with many of us as organizations. But even with large publishing her firms, um, there are no resources and enough or little resources in local languages, and we need to ensure that children actually have something that they can hold and read and practice in a language that they understand. I think that's it. Tony has a thumb drive here. We've been passing these out, and I didn't, I didn't think to bring. So if anybody wants it, the software is free. If anybody wants to, it's um, online. Um, let's see if I put it in here. I didn't put it in here. Sorry, Bloom. I can give it to you, but it's uh, you know if you're interested in downloading it, it's very simple to open and start to create your own book. Might be kind of fun to do with any children that you might have, or some youth that you want to give them a task to write a book for um, a child. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. And maybe just a round of applause for our three presenters. <clears throat> so I'm going to put the onus on you guys. We've heard about some really interesting examples of uh, assistive technologies, designing content that it could be accessible, particularly for low literacy audiences, and international projects that are looking at the use of technology to accelerate early grade reading. Do you have any questions for our panelists in regards to what you've just heard? Yes. And if you could please uh, introduce yourself uh, and your organization again for our benefit, that'd be terrific. So, Laura? Thank you. Thank you. Those were all really, really informative and great. Um, I'm Laura Baylett. I direct the Nemours Bright Start program. I'm also on the Literacy Awards Board with Tony. And, um, you know, the, the winner of the Rubenstein Prize in our second year was uh, Room to Read. And I don't know if your organization works with Room to Read at all, but I know one component of their program is they train, um, they work in third world countries, mainly Southeast Asia, I think, and they train local people to write children's books in the mother tongue. It seems like there might be, and they're, they're pretty tech mm -hmm. savvy too. So I didn't, that's just a connection point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you guys are working We do together connect with them and we do <laughs> greatly value their expertise and what they're producing, yes. Oh good, yeah. that's great to hear. And They'll then, be working with us on a writer's workshop um, this summer in Cambodia. And then um, I just had a question that, that's kind of been percolating through several of the sessions. The uh, woman who spoke about the response to the Ebola crisis earlier today, and some of you may not have been here for that, but she talked about the importance of public messaging through radio. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that audio for people with visual impairment or low literacy, audio I think is such a, a great and readily available way to message to large numbers of people but I don't know that we're using that in the US very much anymore it seems like everything has gone to texting and visual on devices so I, I don't know if anyone in the audience has a perspective on the value of audio for public health kinds of things or other international examples of that Laura that's terrific and just noting relations and partners the importance and then maybe, a, Judy, a question for you in regards to uh, audio as well as others in the audience. Let's take a few questions and then ask the panelists. It looked like there was somebody else who had, if you could introduce yourself, that'd be terrific. Sure, actually it was a comment and um, an invitation. I'm Dr. Sandra Charles, physician here at the Library of Congress running the Occupational Health Services Office. And in fact, we each may have a wellness fair in which we invite a number of different uh, organizations, vendors to partner with us and have a, an exposition where they off show their services. And I'm thinking the Office of Disease Prevention uh, would be an excellent partner in, in helping people and spreading the word about uh, what's available for people to use in terms of literacy and health literacy in particular, because that's one of our main thrusts, wellness and health promotion. 
and um, we are constantly promoting health literacy. And in fact, in addition to that wellness fair in August, we do a family health and wellness day where we ask employees to bring in their family members to also be exposed to the different uh, things available in terms of health. And I think both of those would be excellent for, uh, for expounding on health literacy and improving it. And we certainly would like to have Judy bring over so the rest of the library, because we know <laughs> she exists. We go out there to National Library, but I really think the rest of the library ought to be aware of those things too. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Charles. Great. Rob Logan, National Library of Medicine. Um, I think this one is more for Linda, but anybody can answer it. Um, one of the challenges that I think that we have when we do Medline Plus, and I think it's similar to what challenge you have in Health Finder, is it would be a much better website if we knew the role in which people were using it were in. Are you here as a caregiver, for example, okay? Are you here as a patient, okay? Are you here as a parent, okay? And I believe if we could provide a totally different website with different <coughs> orientation based on the role and the reason why people were there in the first place, okay? Uh, I believe our materials would even be better utilized than they are now. I think that's beyond our technical capacity at the, at the time, but it occurs to me that I still haven't seen anyone you know, take advantage of the fact that our needs for health information and our requirements differ depending on the role that we're in when we're, when, when we're seeking it. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Okay, so I heard a few different, first of all, great recommendations and then suggestions. Thank you. So I heard three questions maybe I'll address to each of the panelists. Uh, Linda, clearly in terms of the role of the audience that's coming to the websites. Judy, if you wanted to elaborate on perhaps some other uh, radio or audio laced related uh, technologies, <laughs> I heard you mention, was it Bard Mobile? So it'd be interesting maybe to mention a little bit more about. And then Rebecca, just on the subject of partnerships, we heard an example of a partner, but what role partnerships have in regards to the activity of all children reading? So maybe let's start with uh, Judy. Yes, thank you. Audio is certainly an important way to communicate to everyone, including people with visual impairments. You're right in that radio, as, uh, certainly in commercial radio, is not used as much as it once was. I don't think people listen to radio as much as they once did. But there is also a network of radio reading services throughout the United States that is used to communicate various things to the visually impaired audience. But these are primarily people who are um, long-time, well-established visually impaired people, um, not so much reaching people who just have a little difficulty seeing. That's the population that's very difficult to reach, and that's a population that really needs that kind of information. I, I was also giving you a plug oh, for Bard, Bard Mobile. Mobile. Yes, it's, it's, it's a mobile app. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, I had a question for Linda. As far as mobile apps, um, it's, there are mobile apps that, that are not possible for me to use on my iPhone. So I'm hoping that when you uh, provide advice about developing mobile apps, you also make sure to uh, point out that they need to be made accessible with VoiceOver because not all apps are. So that's an important thing. But we have an app um, for playing our talking books and braille books uh, on smartphones. And all of our audio books and braille books can be, can be played on that. So it's possible. We have a, we've had the iOS version of that's been out for about two years. And we just released an Android version. Thank you, Judy. Linda? Yeah, I would just, uh, to Judy's point, you know, we are um, really committed to um, complying with the 508 uh, kind of regulations and rules. And so I, I, that is a part of everything that we design and recommend. And um, I only wish that um, everybody was um, willing to um, step up to that, those kinds of uh, um, standards. To, uh, to Rob, to your question, actually, Rob and I 
um, together, um, I guess, uh, represent um, two of the library sources, uh, sources of information um, to the public. Our Health Finder is really about prevention, and uh, of course, uh, the Medline Plus at the Library of Medicine is for kind of managing uh, chronic conditions and, and understanding um, uh, kind of the, the rest of the, of the health span. Um, so we're often in conversations about how do we do better at understanding our audience. And I think what we've kind of come to the conclusion, we in, uh, in our part of the department, is that um, that is, you really want to have a, a trusting relationship between the source and the audience. And that's probably not the best role for the government to try to fulfill. And so as a result, we have really been focusing on partnering with others who have websites. And we have content, we've syndicated our content so that other websites can take it into their websites. They are the ones who are on the ground. They are the ones who have uh, customers, constituents who already trust them. And so I'm, you know, we're kind of thinking if you can, uh, we, we, the government with the, uh, you know, the NIHs of, of the uh, department, who have the science backing that information can make it available and, and syndicated to those folks who have the personal relationships with those folks, then that smart interface could really be useful so that you get to know the, the people that you're talking with. Uh, we do that in partnership with CVS, for example. If you go to the Minute Clinic, you'll see my health finder on the Minute Clinic. You will, you know, uh, it'll be as easy to use there as it is here. So I appreciate your question, Rob. I think um, it's a really important uh, path to go down, but we've chosen to take that partnership path rather than trying to uh, do the whole, uh, uh, make, create those trusting relationships um, between the federal government and the individual. In partnership, partnership is key, and it's kind of the premise of a grand challenge. It's that we must work together collaboratively. We must seek new problem solvers. Um, we've used prize competitions really because it attracts um, the private sector, attracts entrepreneurs, attracts those not typically in the space to help us create a solution. Um, and I really appreciate recommendations. That's part of our um, goal as an entity, as an initiative, is really just to start um, creating the voice and starting to understand where we can be at a catalyst for new partnerships and collaboration, as well as start to replicate and adapt promising practices here in the U.S. or in other places that can be replicated in developing countries. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, so I wanted to ask a question of each of the panelists as well. We're in this Center of Knowledge at the Library of Congress. We've just created a Library of Congress magic wand. Right, John, this be a question of another prize. So what would you like to see as a breakthrough activity or innovation in your respective areas that could help you accelerate your own initiatives? I know I, I had it asked them this at the time, so it will be interesting <laughs> what they come up with. But what would you like to see just as something, start. Yeah, something transformative? Maybe it's a technology, maybe it's a user, uh, Linda, or, and Rebecca, maybe it's a new partner. Just mm -hmm. what is an example of something you'd like to see once we've made wave the uh, magic wand for Library of Congress. So, you Linda, you got something? First? I'll go first. Um, I think in this, we were just talking about accessibility, and Linda mentions that they use 508, but the current 508 guidelines were developed in 1998, and uh, they've been working on a refresh for the last 18 years. And uh, they're supposedly close, but who knows? I. Accessibility is a very complex and very thorny issue and extremely frustrating. It's frequent that I can go to websites that I can't use. It's frequent that I can download a mobile app that I can't use. So if I was going to wave a magic wand, I would just get rid of all the accessibility barriers, get rid of Flash, and get rid of uh, Java, and all these other technological barriers that are used to make websites all whiz bang and pretty and exciting and fun and, and are, for the most part, barriers to blind people. Great. Thank you. Judy? Linda? Well, I think that the uh, the reach of the the Library of, of Congress is just uh, remarkable, and I've been trying to think about how could we better um, make our information available through the 
Library of Congress, um, I mean, we have uh, the websites uh, and the sources of health information in the department is really precious, I think. Um, it's updated constantly. It's the, it's the best of the science that we have. Translating that into um, understandable and actionable information is what we try to do. But our real uh, limitation is really reaching people who are, you know, where, where they live. And if I had a magic wand, I would d distribute the Library of Congress's reach, I mean, um, facilities, um, and capabilities for making that information uh, more accessible to people where they are in their homes, not just in their, not just here, not just in their library, but but in their homes. Great, thank you. Great. <laughs> Maybe a little bit on that line of accessibility. Just what you were saying, Linda is. I think I would love for there to be some approach or breakthrough for urgencies, creating that urgency that we need to be educating um, our next generation in a, a way. And I struggle with kind trying to articulate that message. We know reading is a long process. It doesn't happen, you don't take a pill and we all read. We wish it were that simple. Um, but really creating that sense of um, urgency for our future because if the trend is that we have more and more countries with children that cannot read, our world is not going to become a more stable place and we need to figure out ways fast in which we can make that breakthrough and really start to change um, generations um, that are gonna move forward and be our leaders. Is it, is it okay to have an audience member? To answer that question, yeah. okay? Because oh, yeah. okay. I got a totally Rob Logan National Medicine, totally different answer, okay? And I think there is something that could be done that would be, I think, transformative. Um, the one of the most impressive healthcare organizations in the U.S., in my opinion, is the South Central Foundation in Anchorage, Alaska. And I won't go into detail of why they're impressive, but one of the things that they do is they. They serve a medically underserved population, mostly Native Alaskans. And what they've gone out to do in order to improve health care there is to first give the people who live there a sense of pride in who they are and their own heritage, their own background. They have begun to realize that a sense of pride in who you are, a sense of your own history, a sense of your, your, of their own, of your own of, of your own community, a sense of uh, what what their challenges are. Uh, and I'm not going to go more detail about it. It's fundamental to giving people interest in their own health, taking care of themselves, taking care of their families. You can't put the cart before the horse is what they've argued for years. Now translate that into something that the Library of Congress could uniquely do. Why should you be proud if you're from a low income area in Philadelphia? Why should you be proud if you were an Intuit? Why should you be proud if you're this, providing a, on a, a place where people could go? The story of various different demographic breakdowns and groups, people in this country. Something they could look at and really develop some pride, some ownership in, some interest, tell people how to, uh, where they where you can go from there to learn more. Um, I'm not gonna go in more detail about it, but there, I don't know a resource like that, okay, anywhere. I don't know any organization in this country, or Frank, for that matter, any country, that has the kind of resources that this place had that could do something like that. Wow, thank you, Rob. So John, all these people are waving their magic wands. <laughs> we, our session's done, but I would say in the spirit of partnership, you know, we found, particularly with the All Children Reading Grand Challenge model, if you have a problem, there's goodwill and there's people out there that probably have some ideas to help you achieve a solution. So I wanna thank once again and ask you to please join me in a round of applause for our three panelists. And invite John to come back up, thank you. Well, first, a couple of thank yous to everybody for sticking it out with us. Gosh, we've had quite a day. It's been a wonderful day. I am going to respond, but first I'd like, uh, Dr. Sullivan said he has been with us all day. When I'm looking around and I just asked 
want to ask him. He's willing to make some comments on what he's heard and maybe present another challenge for the Library of Congress to which I will attempt to respond. <laughs> would, you, would you mind? Would you like? Yes, let's get a microphone. Well, let me say again, for me, this has been a very exciting, very rewarding day. And I think I've learned a lot from all of the presenters here. I was thinking, it was back in 1979 that Julius Richmond, when he was Surgeon General and Assistant Secretary of Health, issued a report called Healthy People. Mm -hmm. That was a prescription for, indeed, people taking responsibility for their own health and setting goals uh, for them. And it's then my pleasure uh, and opportunity as Secretary to issue an update, Healthy People 2000, which we issued in September of 1990. It had grown uh, then. We had some 298 objectives for people really taking responsibility for their health and showing people the power that they had uh, to indeed uh, pr protect their health and, and, and project their health forward. That has really uh, now, it's now in its, uh, its current iteration is now Healthy People 2020. So this has been a growing uh, effort. It has become much, the public has become much more aware of this. Uh, individual citizens, companies promoting uh, health uh, behavior in their employees and the recognition uh, of the business community that a healthy workforce is a positive for them. I was pleased to see the business representation here uh, today. So I think that with the uh, growing uh, uh, interest uh, and focus on this, as well as the fact that with the Affordable Care Act, we've now pr provided added resources uh, for this, this is a great opportunity. So I think we have a lot yet to do, a lot of challenges, but I think the environment is much more positive. 20 or 30 years ago, much of what the, today's discussion was about, people would have interpreted as well, kind of feel good activity, something that makes you feel better, but we don't really know whether it works. But then now have been enough studies showing that physical activity reduces uh, death rates, reduces heart disease, diabetes, may uh, slow the progression of development of Alzheimer's. So I think we have enough now that uh, the kinds of activities that have been described today really should go forward. And, and as we heard from our business colleagues, return on investment is now very much uh, documented. So I think this, for me, has been a very uh, enlightening day, a very encouraging day. And I certainly think the Library of Congress is a great place to really help uh, get this movement further around the country. So. Th those are my comments. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining us today. It's really been a joy, and a, you've made a major contribution. I see a couple of other people before I present. We're not going on much longer. It's been a wonderful day, but uh, Laura Baylett has been with me for this. We have done the planning with help from many others for this. I'm wondering if you might want to say a few things about today. Uh, and. Roby, would you like to say a few things in a minute, and then I'll try to wind us up and get us out of here with promises for the future that I hope we can follow up on. Go well, ahead. I would also like to thank John and, and all of his um, helpers at the Library of Congress. Um, I, I was kind of saying to John and others at a meeting in February here that I don't think you always realize the power of your brand. And, in, and the Library of Congress is a brand like no other. And I think when you put your name behind a cause, really great things can happen. And um, I so appreciate everyone who's been here all day, all the speakers, all the planning that went into your comments. Um, and I hope it was a good day for everyone. I certainly learned a lot. I, I do think the, the theme of urgency came up a couple of times. Jeff, Jeff and I talked about that at lunch, and then Rebecca mentioned the urgency as, as her magic wand. How do we keep this issue um, present and, and have that sense of urgency? We really do know enough to, to certainly make things much better than they are. And so where do we find that urgency and will to work together in some new ways to get this done? So thank you, well, and I'll pass you. it to Roby. Very much.
It's a privilege right now to say a few words, just a few, uh, to, and to be here. Um, I'm just sitting thinking about the fact that as authors and illustrators, as I mentioned this morning, we're in our own rooms working away and then with our, our publishers and editors and wonderful people. But we're not out there doing the work that all of you are doing. So what, what I hope and what I learned from today is that I want to go back to my friends and colleagues uh, and, and everybody in the field of children's books and all, even, even apps, people are creating apps, uh, what's going online and say, you know, there's something about health out there that all of us can do and continue to do if we really, really care deeply about the children in our family. And certainly, um, thank you all who've talked about our most vulnerable families and um, ways that hopefully one can help those families move out of poverty. And I think this is certainly, that's the chord, that struck a chord in me. So many people talked about it. So thank you for all that all of you do. And finally, Jeff, would you like to say something at the end today? And this will be the last person I'll call oh, on. Oh, that's the... pressure, John. <laughs> no, no. I'm putting the pressure on myself, Jeff. I just, um, well, I just I, want I, you folks I, to get a chance to say well, something. Well, I just want to thank, again, everybody for participating today. And as I've said to several people during the day, this is really one of the few opportunities, unfortunately, one of the few opportunities we have for so many people from who, who look at this problem from so many different places, whether it's working with adults, as I do, whether it's working with government, private sector, business, children's literacy, um, uh, and then health. And, and it doesn't happen often enough. And I think, you know, when we, when we saw the connections being made and the recommendations that you were talking about, Tony, you can see how much value these kind of discussions have. And I guess I would just end with, you know, I, I hope we leave with that spirit that this is a collective issue. Um, there's a lot of energy, and it's incredibly important. We talked a lot about um, early childhood and, the, and how crucial that is, but it goes beyond that. It goes, it goes also to older children, teenagers, and, and of course, adults. And, um, and we've got to look at this problem from the pers all those pers perspectives, I think, for us to make significant progress. So again, thank you to everyone who put this day together. It was wonderful, and thank you, John, and I look forward to your closing remarks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna promise things, right, that, uh, who knows? Uh, also, however, Tony, thank you. I mean, we've got, it's been a wonderful experience inside the library to do this, and I'll just share that with you a little bit. First, we have uh, three or four board members from the Literacy Board, which is, I'm gonna say a little bit about the Literacy Project and how we might literacy awards program and how we might carry forward. But even within the Library of Congress today, and I was so pleased that we had our own Dr. Charles was here, uh, the people from health services. I learned a lot about what the Library of Congress, we are a big organization, 3,800 people, uh, spread all over this area and in other places. And I was so pleased in their interest in this, and I learned and that's another example of, you know, we need to get a talk more and learn about our own organizations and see which way they're headed. Now, uh, the Library of Congress has an, ex is where it's an exciting part of our history right now because the new Librarian of Congress has been nominated. Uh, we are hoping that there will be hearings soon. Uh, and I was so pleased that the Department of Education had a hearing on a new leader and nobody stopped that and it sailed through and we are hoping for new leadership. Uh, it, it also has to be confirmed by the Senate, which is why I'm pausing a little bit here, but we have great hopes. Uh, with regard, so here are some of the opportunities and I appreciate what people said. I see them through my job, my twofold job for which I'm paid and my other job for which I'm not paid, which is as a historian of the Library of Congress, I can see an opportunity coming historically for this institution with new leadership uh, because a lot has happened in terms of outreach. 
And those of you who were able to join us last night met the person uh, uh, who introduced Dr. Bailey Jane, who is the new director of national and international outreach. And this is a new department, comes out of a larger department, but it indicates a new interest in outreach for the Library of Congress that is above board. It's and the name of the organization is outreach. And the Library of Congress has had a lot of outreach going on, but it's been segmented and it's not really been upfront in the way that it needs to be now because as an institution, as we've developed, uh, we had 5,200 employees in the Library of Congress in 1992. We now have 3,800. We have not given up a single function. We still have strong prestige. We still have dedicated people who are working in each of these areas. The reason, one of the reasons that number has gone down is a good reason. It's cataloging has been centralized. They, our automation has helped us, but we're also doing a lot of outsourcing. Uh, so we haven't lost any functions, and in the meantime, uh, outreach has grown, and part of it is our presence on the website. When we first developed uh, the National Digital Library, uh, and then eventually the World Wide Web came along, the Library of Congress did some testing for the digitization that we'd been doing, uh, and had struck a bargain with Congress about funding yet another new office. And the bargain that was struck was, if we paid with private money, with the Madison Council Group that supports us, uh, to get started with the National Digital Library, and then did some testing about who was using our digitized, digitized product, which turned out to be American history, American memory, would Congress go along and help fund the development of this National Digital Library? Well, we succeeded in that, but guess what the new survey did after two years? It showed us we had a whole new class of users. Students and teachers were using American memory and some of our digital, digitized pr products and one of the results was the creation of something called educational outreach. So for the first time, we have a major outreach function funded by Congress to reach out to teachers and students and to bring students here to learn how to use online resources. I'm going towards this idea of reaching out internationally because our international role has grown since World War II the same time the World Wide Web and this new educational outreach has started. And our new emphasis has got to be, and I'm sure the new librarian will recognize this, uh, on the education side. And in the areas, and this is actually in part why the Center for the Book was created with Dr. Uh, Borston, where he was looking ahead, we were reaching out to promote books and reading. And one of the answers actually, when I'm thinking of Rob in a way, is that we have established centers in every state, we don't pay for them, they're partnership organizations, that have the job of promoting locally books, reading, literacy, and libraries in that area. And that's closely associated with state pride. And each state wants to have and keep a state center, but they have to do something. They have to be reevaluate after every three years. And it's the installation of the pride in the state uh, and put it together in our country, but it's the state pride issue which uh, we also are capitalizing on in such a way that we have an Alaska Center for the book. They tell you what, what do they do. They promote reading and literacy in Alaska, but they use it with the state library and they do databases about Alaska writers. Each state and we have helped develop through our National Book Festival a whole system of state and regional book festivals. We don't run them, they're locally done, but it's along this idea of a rebirth at the state level of activities that are related to education, books, reading, literacy, and libraries. And I think that if I you know, have much to say about it, and I'm working hard at it, uh, is the area of with this, um, where we are headed. Uh, David Rubenstein has helped us immensely. He, the benefactor I talked about earlier today, by doing the funding for the National Book Festival, I mean, for the Library of Congress to have 
a national book festival, free, that celebrates readers and writers, and now has moved to the convention center. And last year, the convention center put out a news release. We moved from the mall onto the convention center. It said that one day crowd was the largest crowd in the history of the Washington Convention Center. They estimated 125 to 150,000 people came to that program, which now, Mr. Rubenstein, with the development of the program you're part of today, uh, also is helping with the Literacy Corner at the Book Festival and with the, out, the outreach that we are doing with the Literacy Awards Program is being tied in institutionally in ways that I think give me hope uh, for just some of the suggestions that were here. I didn't mention uh, Judy is still here, but having, I mentioned, should have mentioned, but having NLS as part of this along with Health Services, the Center for the Book, uh, we're able to pull the library together in this area of reading and literacy promotion in ways that we've not done. Now, this isn't a complete answer, but it is an answer, I think, to the hopefulness of carrying on with some of the ideas that we've talked about today, uh, because uh, Mr. Rubenstein is quite interested in helping support uh, this kind of activity. And with the help from our partners and our board advisory board members who are here today, uh, we continue to stretch literacy and the Library of Congress in new ways. Last year's symposium was p literacy and poetry. This year it's poetry, it's literacy and health, and we've made new friends and new partners. There'll be another one next year. Two people at our meeting on the day before yesterday said it's got to be on literacy and technology, and we have another board member who really thinks it should be on literacy and indigenous cultures, which would bring us into a whole other range of partners. Uh, plus, we have picked up partners along the way. Uh, Reach Out and Read uh, was here today, and you know the fact that it not only uh, you know was a winner. It isn't here because it was a winner of the Rubenstein Award. It's here because its work is so important to what we're doing, and so we're going to be using the Literacy Awards Program also funded by Mr. Rubenstein as part of this outreach effort. Uh, and I explained, I will, other, some of the people weren't here, and I'll slow down in a second, but we're expanding the number of awards that are organizations that are recognized for their work in literacy in this program. I talked about that a little bit last night. And uh, we are, would be able to expand it to include the range of organizations that are here. And we also want to look back to past winners who are part of the network now. And even though Reach Out and Reach has always been a reading and literacy promotion partner uh, to uh, help with this new uh, outreach. So I end up, I'm sorry I'm going on a bit, but I'm optimistic and this kind of meeting uh, has, keeps me optimistic because I can see uh, partners and interests and I also, as a historian of the Library of Congress, know its potential in terms of international outreach. I know its potential in terms of uh, technology, and uh, part of this is, and I also know the potential of having new leadership in an organization like this. We were, Library of Congress was created in 1800. We've had 13 librarians of Congress. That's a long term of office, especially when one of them only lasted a year and a half. He died in office. So you're talking about now there is a limitation, which I think is a good thing, on the term of the Librarian of Congress to a total of 20 years with one ten, a 10 year and a 10 year renewal. But it is a period historically that is, will be a revitalization for the library and uh, your presence and the planning that's been done uh, in making, bringing us all together, I consider to be uh, an important part of it, and I would challenge myself and I challenge the rest of you to keep us uh, on the track that you've helped us uh, step on today and, and move ahead. So I'm gonna end. Thank you all for participating, especially to Laura and the board members. The Nemours was, we couldn't have done this without Nemours, and uh, uh, 
we're just very pleased with everything that's gone on. And I think we have a number of our participants here, and let's give them a hand. And thank you very much for being with us. We'll be back in touch. But let's. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.